Hello everybody and welcome to the square here in Compiègne, the scene of the start of the 103rd running of Paris-Roubaix. I'm Phil Liggett, joined of course by Paul Schoen, but also this time the eloquent prose from Bobby Roll. Welcome along to see us, Bob. It's an honour and a privilege to be here commentating on Paris-Roubaix with the two kings, Phil and Paul. Bob, you rode this race six times. Worst memories, good memories? They're all bad. <laughs> I think they're, the first time I did it, I couldn't make a fist for a few days afterwards because I had been gripping the bar so hard. The second time it was dusty and there was a film layer on my eyeballs afterwards and nothing would come in focus. And I thought I had gotten a disease, an eye disease, during the race. And in 200 Ks to get glaucoma is pretty hard to do, but this race can do it to you. I tell you what, everybody, even the best pros in the world, fear Perio Bay. Paul, it strikes fear in the heart because of the route. And this year, although we're without the Forest of Arnberg, I think they've found a route even more difficult. Yeah, they have, but I've just figured something out. Now I know why Bob, when he talks, he has to talk with his hands. It's all because of... Harry Roubaix. <laughs> but seriously, now the cobbles this year are going to be very treacherous. A lot of riders have been out to look. We have taken out the Forest of Arenberg, but there's still 26 sections of cobblestones. And around Valenciennes, there's one section over a 13 kilometre part of the race. There's eight kilometres of cobbles. It's going to be a beast. All right, well, Bob and I will go to the commentary box. We'll send Paul down to meet some of the riders and we'll find out what they think about this year's Paris Roubaix. You have to have a lot of motivation for a race like Paris Roubaix, and you, over the last few years, have become a bit of a specialist. Well, I'm always motivated for uh, this week. Uh, Tour de Flandre Paris Roubaix is for me the most important race, and uh, the condition is okay, so um, I'm okay. You showed the condition was good last week. You couldn't respond to Tom Boonen. Maybe this week a little bit of revenge? What revenge? Uh, for me the most important is uh, I'm, I'm there for, uh, to play for the victory and uh, sometimes you, have, you must have a little bit lucky. So I hope tomorrow is on my side. Okay, thank you. Yeah, obviously I'm really excited to be here and uh, I'm feeling better every day. Uh, and I expect to be amongst uh, the leaders tomorrow. There's a new climb out on the course. Did you guys preview that beforehand? And what do you think about it? Yeah, there's actually a lot of uh, new, not a lot of new climbs, but a lot more rolly, uh, rolling than the past years. Um, not doing the, the forest this year is probably a good thing, but the sections that they added are as hard or harder than the, the Ehrenberg. So I think it's going to be uh, even tougher at Paris Bay. You've been fourth twice. You've been in the top ten a number of times. Do you think this is finally your year to get to the top step of the podium here? That's what I'm hoping. <laughs> Every day I, I dream about this race all winter long and I try to work as hard as possible. So I hope that um, this year could be it. All right, George, good luck. Thanks. George, just a couple of questions. Uh, last week, maybe the team tactics uh, based everything on the, the Mur de Grammont, but in Paris Bay, it's a little bit different because it's a question of survival. Yeah, last, last week we, uh, we, we definitely made a bit of a mistake there, uh, but this, uh, this week, tomorrow is a, a totally different race. Uh, we have, we have uh, Life and Eki that are riding really well, uh, so we don't, we don't really want to wait for anything tomorrow. Maybe, you know, maybe we'll try to make the race uh, when it gets hard. I think the advantage the team had last week was towards the end, uh, even though tactically maybe there was a mistake, you were a lot of riders in numbers. Yeah, we were. Last week we had uh, uh, six guys and I think and I believe it was a group of 60 or 50, which we haven't had in the past. And if we, if we have that this year or this week, tomorrow, uh, we hopefully we can take advantage of that situation. Okay, good luck. Okay, thanks. Good luck, George. Thanks, guys. Roger, you were third in Perry roubaix last year, probably one of your best results ever. What is it going to take to climb two steps on the podium tomorrow? Um, I think the, the most thing is a little bit of luck, but um, look, I've had a bit of bad luck already this week, uh, crashing in three in Gent Wevelgem, and I've broken my thumb, so uh, it's a little bit of bad luck, so now I need an even bigger bit of luck tomorrow, so I just have to see how it goes. I mean, uh, Hopefully it won't be too much of a problem uh, on the on the cobblestones, but uh, I haven't I haven't been out on the cobbles since Gen Wavelgum just because I want to give it every chance to recover as much as possible and just going to risk everything on tomorrow, you know.
We've just had lunch with your folks, and they said that you're in good form and very excited for this race. Really serious about it. Yeah, I'm, I am. I mean, this this is this is my race. You know, this is what I this is what I think about when I'm out training in the rain in October. So, it's um it's my big motivation. I was I felt good in Tour of Flanders, um, but I wor I worked for the team in Tour of Flanders because it's not not quite my race. You know, not there, we have guys in the team that are much better at Tour of Flanders than I am. So, um, you know, but I, I felt the legs were good, and then Gent Wevelgem, I felt strong again. So everything seemed to be coming right and just uh, just a traffic sign got in the way so uh, well I just hope that you know when your legs are good and your mind is good then you can overcome a lot of things so uh, I have those two things and just a, a little bit of a pain in my thumb. Uh, the classics come down a lot of times to a numbers game and whichever team has more than one guy in the finale do you see a scenario like that with yourself and George Hincap even being played out tomorrow? Yeah, I mean, it's. I think that was the idea with the team in, in signing me uh, over the winter for for Paris Roubaix. I mean, they have a very good rider in George for Paris Roubaix, but um, it's very difficult to win a World Cup on your own, however strong you are. And I think you see it numerous times with George, where he's chasing down a lot of breaks that, um, you know, using energy. And and every every time you chase a break, that's energy that you're wasting uh, for later on in the final. So, if we have three or four guys, then we can take it in turns to cover the moves, and um, hopefully George, myself, and Life, and Eki it will. You know, we have guys that will be there and we'll come to the finish fresher because we won't have to chase so much. I mean, I was in the same position as George last year. The last 100Ks, I didn't have any teammates left. And I was lucky. I, I guessed. I guessed at which breaks would go and which ones wouldn't. And um, I guessed the right one. Whereas, you know, George was unfortunate and guessed the wrong one. But if you have five or six guys, then the guessing work is a lot less. All right. Good luck, Roger. Good luck. Give them hell out there. We'll, we'll try. OK, cheers. Cheers. Good luck, mate. All right. Yeah, Maggie. This is the race you've been waiting for, Paris-Roubaix. Everything's good apart from falling off on Wednesday. Yeah, form is great. I mean, I'm, I've been absolutely flying the last couple of weeks, but uh, I came off on Wednesday and uh, I hurt my wrist quite badly, so uh, I'm still having some problems with that. But, uh, you know, we'll see tomorrow, you know, just get out there and uh, give it my best shot and see what happens. What about the change in the route, the addition of that little climb? You said it's not so bad, you can ride up it on the big ring, but you've got to be well placed there. Yeah, you definitely got to be well placed, like you have done on all cobblestone sections. If you if you take a section too far back in the peloton, you're going to end up in trouble and, you know, you might get some split in front of you and um, you know I'm just going to ride the race like I did last year try and stay in the front all the time and stay out of trouble and then uh, see what happens when we get into the final you know this is a crazy race why do you get so motivated why do some riders just think there's something special about Paris-Roubaix it's mad I'm a crazy guy <laughs> no I just I, I, I don't know why I just love the race it's uh, it's the only race in the, in, in the calendar that's that, that looks like this and uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know why. I just love it. I just absolutely love it. No worries. Thanks. Uh, Dirk Demol, how has the season been going so far for the Discovery Team? A new sponsor, a lot of expectations, and how, how has it been going? I think uh, we have seen this year in, in our team uh, good performance in uh, the races so far, except of uh, Gent Wevelgem. Um, we have uh, we have won already Kuhn versus Kuhn. We have won the Trees of the Panne. And uh, I saw last Sunday in Flanders that uh, the boys are really ready for tomorrow. So I'm, I'm um, so far I'm I'm happy. If uh, in the finale of the bike race you have a lot of great athletes that have been on the podium before, and George Hincap, the American on the team, uh, might there be a situation where decisions have to be made to uh, determine which rider the team will race for and uh, and uh, might that be George compared to the other guys? No, George is our leader, it's, that's clear. Uh, he's our leader, our leader already uh, years uh, and um, but we have a better team than ever before for tomorrow and uh, but um, George is the leader and uh, protected rider will be live hosta and uh, we will see in the final. Uh, also communication is important, uh, they have to be honest with each other and uh, the race will show who's the strongest because uh, we, s we went to see the course and uh, with the change in the course it's going to be harder I think uh, an earlier selection and um, it will be it will be more it will be a hard race tomorrow looking forward a little bit the classics oftentimes you need a little bit of luck to win and uh, you have Amstel Gold Race Liege best on Liege coming up the Hillier classics what is the team looking forward to after tomorrow no, it's going to be a different team. Uh, Popovic will be uh, will be our leader for for Amstel, uh, for Flesh, and uh, for Liège. And uh, it's going to be al almost a complete different team, except of uh, Stein de Voller. He's doing everything, but uh, Popovic is our leader for the classics and your dance. Okay, good luck. Thank you. Form's pretty good. Um, uh, we'll have to see. I mean, tomorrow's a race of a lot of luck and. Uh, 
race has changed a bit with obviously the Arenberg out, a couple other hard sections in, so it's going to make for a really different race compared to what everyone's used to. It's also a race where a lot of courage is required too. You've got to really fight back all of the time. Everybody has bad luck, but it's the man who keeps coming back ends up winning the race. Yeah, I think you're right. It is uh, a lot of bad luck goes out, uh, gets dished out to everybody actually. And uh, the man who's got the, I think the, the most fight in him who comes back and continues to fight is and ends up uh, the winner on the day. And I think it's going to be exactly the same for tomorrow. Like I say, the harder sections, uh, Arenberg out, but harder sections in. So it's going to be, like you say, the hardest man who's going to win tomorrow again. And four hours live on South African television. Uh, maybe the folks at home will get a chance to see just how well you can race. Let's hope so. It's always good for the name back home. But um, yeah, I mean, uh, I'm definitely motivated and obviously love, love coverage back in South Africa, but more motivation. Uh, so we'll see. Thanks very much. Well, you said at the start again, Wevel again, that the form was starting to come in, but now Paris Bay is a bit different. And with a team manager like Mark Maddio, you must be a bit more motivated. Yeah, well, this is my first Roubaix. I've always been injured or sick this time of year, but uh, there's definitely a lot of pressure being in the team with the, you know, a double winner of the race. So, um, you know, but there's also the, you know, the plus side. Is the, the, he's got a lot of advice for you and that sort of stuff. We did a, a big reconnaissance mission over the all the new sectors on uh, Thursday, and he had a lot of advice how to sit on the bike, you know, how to take the shock of the cobbles. But um, I think everyone in the team's going really well. And I think we've got a good chance. What about that new climb on the course? Uh, it's not difficult in itself, but it's actually the approach that makes it more difficult. Yeah, there's a few um, new false flats. Well, it's all new to me. I haven't done it before, so. I don't really know what to go on, but uh, in training it wasn't so bad. But you know, it's just it's when you put 200 k's in front of the hitting those things, it's just going to be a nightmare. We, we had a, a headwind out training the other day, and towards the end, like obviously we're done getting wobbled the day before, so we're tired. But um, we're you know at the end there, I was doing 15 k's an hour going on the flat <laughs> in this headwind, so um, it's going to be just uh, treacherous. Pretty motivated for this race, though. Yeah, very motivated. Motivated. I was just a bit sick before um, through over Flanders so um, I still think I was missing a little bit in Wevelgem so I think I feel like I'm back to normal now and I think maybe I can be another 5% better than uh, Wednesday. Good luck. Thanks. Good luck mate. Enjoy it. Well Brad, Paris-Roubaix is what the classics are all about. You've been here before but uh, now a little bit of pressure on the shoulders with Tor Hushoft. Yeah we've got a really good team this year. Obviously Tor has been up there in uh, some of the big classics already this year. Young Kersipu is just coming into good form as well so we certainly got the leaders in the team. Um, personally myself, I finished Flanders last week which is always good. Shows you've got the legs to get around Roubaix. Uh, and an added sort of bonus this year is I've crashed the last two years in Arenberg and it's not in the race this year so it's always a, a bonne nouvelle as they say in French. Yeah, the British team have done very well on the track just recently. A little bit of a, a hint of uh, regret for you because you've decided not to ride on the track until the next Olympics? No, not at all because I'm still undefeated so it just uh, makes that be better. No, I it's, uh, when you come to a race like this you sort of realise where where it's at really uh, apart from the Olympics anyway and um, sort of it increases my my want to do this if you like so this kind of race is the kind of race that suits a man who has been a pursuiter there's been great rides in the past by men like Alain Bondu Gregor Braun the suppleness that you have in pursuiting should be able to translate to riding well on the cobbles it seems that way yeah I mean I sort of feel good on the pave during the week in training and, and, and keeping keeping pace with guys like Tour and Kersipu and the guys like that on the pave so it still comes down to experience you know it's uh, whatever how many have sex it is 20 odd sex is a pave it's maybe okay for three or four but it's such a long race and it, it, it takes a lot to appreciate I mean I've got to 200k last year to the second feed and there's still 50k to go at that point and you haven't even begun the hard sector so it, it is such a tough race people say you know I, I ride great on pave you know and I can, I'm feel good on the pave but you know three sectors is, is nothing really it's off up here isn't it it is yeah and uh, you know the experience counts in this race as has shown in the past um, I think Boonen being the exception when he ran third as first year pro um, you know that 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 tends to be the trend you know the older guys do well in this race and uh, I've had two goes at it now so hopefully this will be my first year and I get actually get round to the finish so yeah thanks well, Stefan, we were looking for you in the Tour of Flanders, but unfortunately you had a little bit of a stomach problem, but now uh, Paris-Roubaix is a different game. 
yeah, I hope uh, everything is gone now. So uh, two days rest after this uh, stomach uh, problems was too less. But uh, I'm uh, the whole winter uh, looking forward for two of Flanders and Rubens. So I want to start, but it wasn't possible to finish. It's a pity to lose uh, Andreas Clear with that nasty crash just a couple of days ago. It puts a lot more pressure on your shoulders. Yeah, okay. I, I have to live with the pressure in Ruby and Flanders. It's not a problem for me. For me, it's uh, important that uh, Andreas don't have uh, really injuries. So uh, I heard about this crash and it was really, really bad. So I hope the best for him. He didn't broke anything. So I hope he comes back for the for the Amstel. You should be able to get a lot of help from Eric Zabel, who last week in Tour of Flanders, I think, rode one of his best races. Yeah, I think so. It was a, uh, good to see the race. Uh, I watched it on TV, the final, and I see that my teammates and I'm uh, really, really happy for them. And if Eric is in the same condition, we will be a good team. Thank you. A lot of people say that when you get one big victory under the belt, it makes you a little bit more relaxed. Are you relaxed before Paris-Roubaix? I can't say I'm relaxed because tomorrow it's it's Paris Roubaix and it's it's a big classic. So you always I'm always a little bit nervous, but it's true when you win a, a semi classic like Gand Bevergem, I'm a little bit more relaxed. But we have we have Peter from Peterham in the team, so I think he had much more pressure than I have. This season it really seems to have been the season for the Belgian cyclists. The Belgians have very much dominated most of the classics so far this year. Yeah, it's true in all the Belgian races. Races, maybe it's all every race it's a Belgian rider who wins so but I think it's going going to be changed when the the Ardennes coming so I don't think we are a, a country with riders for the flat but not in the Ardennes I think so to, there is still some one race tomorrow and I think we had a big chance with Peter and do you think that as the rest of Belgium thinks that Tom Boonen can make the double Tour of Flanders and Paris-Roubaix he's a bit young I think it also he had also he had also even in Paris he was strong, he is but Milan Sanremo, he was strong, he won Arlbeke. I think it's going, going to be difficult. I think he can do top three, but to win, I'm not sure. Okay, thank you. How are you, mate? Good. I've been looking for you for the last few weeks. I seem to miss you all the big races. I haven't quite been on the podium yet. This is a race that you have a special motivation for. It's a race where you have to ride at the front, and you have the knack of being able to stick in the first 10, 15 places. Yeah, hopefully tomorrow experience will pay off because uh, I think it's really going to be the, the case tomorrow. The, the race seems a lot harder. I've taken out Durham Road, but I think the the course in general is going to be a lot tougher, a lot more difficult, and especially if it rains, it's going to be absolutely chaos. So I'm sure to make good TV. Why are you smiling? Every, a lot of bike riders who get motivated by Paris-Roubaix think about the wet versions because it's always dramatic. Yeah, well, it's, it's crazy, but you kind of like to hate it, I guess. It's a, it's a crazy kind of um, objective, you know. You know it's going to be, you know, you know you're going to finish the race wrecked. Um, but at the same time, you know, if you're on a good day and you win it, you know, it'll be the biggest day of your life. Looks like you had a special haircut, just like Maggie Baxter for tomorrow. <laughs> no, he's copying me. <laughs> I'll be wearing the beanie at the start, though. I tell you. Yeah. <clears throat> Thanks. That's cool. All right. Ludo, it's hard to believe that you're 41 years of age and you're still here at Paris Roubaix. Yeah, but uh, the condition uh, is is good, uh, and I hope to do tomorrow a good race. We've seen that the condition is good, and we hear you're going to retire. But when you're riding so well, why not do another year? No, no, no. This is the last year. It's uh, I'm 40 years old, almost uh, 41, and uh, and then it's time to think uh, of other things. I think <laughs> my family and my children. Yeah. A little bit sad though, because Paris Roubaix is uh, one of those special races, and for the last time you'll be lining up tomorrow. Yeah, for me Paris Roubaix is a special race, and uh, it's a race for for. Uh, Flandrians. Yeah, for Flandrians, uh, and I, I love it. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Hello, Hello Radio. Radio. Tavissimo. Uh, <laughs> uh, this is going to be your last Paris-Roubaix you've announced. Is there any sadness in uh, approaching the race for the very last time after an incredible career here? Y yes, this, uh, this race for me uh, is the big race, is uh, the last. But after the race, I go to USA, to Georgia, and after this race, uh, no, maybe I'm stopping. It's the career for me is very, very good, and I'm very happy. But uh, 
I want to go tomorrow very, very fast. And this is important for me, it's important for my team, and I try for to win now. It seems Peru Bay, more than any other race, you need courage, and if you have bad luck, which is inevitable, to fight back to the front. Is a, do you think that'll be a, a possibility tomorrow also? Yes, I, tomorrow I fall uh, all team uh, Discovery Channel and I go in front because Discovery Channel, I'm sure, is stay in front and also I see Incapi and uh, another guys uh, when you stay in front because see you, see you is in front is uh, no matter to, to work for, for my team. Can I buy you a glass of wine in Georgia? What? Est-ce qu'il peut vous acheter une bouteille de vin en Georgia? Oui, euh, possible deux ou trois, hein? ça va pas de problème. Dopo la gara. Dopo la gara. Ok, okay. do it. Ok, no problem, no okay. problem. I'll go to pay the money, good okay. luck for tomorrow. Thank you, thank you, and bye bye and see you later. Bye. Good luck. Ciao. You start the season very well, and the team seem to be very motivated to look after you in Paris-Roubaix this year. Yeah, yeah, I started uh, the season good with our third place in Milan San Remo and uh, going good in Ghent Wilgen. And uh, now I have a team who will, who will help me a lot and uh, hopefully on a good day I can be up there. It's going to be a different race without the Forest of Arenberg that everybody used to worry about, but the addition of more cobblestones is probably going to make the selection more decisive. Yeah, you know, without uh, if it was a hard arm, it's a, it was a hard section. But uh, I don't think I don't think it would change that much because anyway, in the end, everybody will be tired. Uh, and this year, it's even more cobblestones, and the couple of new sections is really hard. So I think uh, the same guys will be in the end if uh, Armberg will stay or not. So, what do you think about the addition of this small new climb at Le Bois? Nah, that's uh, that's okay. It's uh, I don't think that would make that much different either. But uh, yeah, it's getting us more like uh, two of Flanders. <laughs> Thanks. Just a few years ago, you left the U.S. Postal Team to uh, learn from perhaps the greatest classics rider ever, Johan Museu. Any special instructions from Johan for tomorrow's race? Uh, not yet. <laughs> he still has to come to the hotel. Uh, we checked it out yesterday oh, for the bikes and everything uh, to get the feeling back. Um, but I don't think Johan will give any special tips. Uh, you know how I race, and I know how his racing was, and uh, I learned a lot from him. So, but he uh, helps me to relax, and uh, that's the most important. There's two races throughout the year that the Flemish riders dream about: Tour of Flanders that you won last weekend. Does that give you some special motivation for Paris Roubaix tomorrow? Yeah, I, I still had to prove myself in, uh, in that kind of racing. I was on the podium already in Roubaix, but uh, winning Tour of Flanders uh, it was a dream for me. Uh, it came. To through uh, pretty early in my career, so now the next objective is uh, to win Roubaix and then see where it ends, but uh, it gives a good motivation. Yeah. After winning Flanders last weekend, maybe a, a little bit extra pressure for Ghent Wevelgem early in the week. How do you feel for tomorrow's stage that way? Tomorrow's race, excuse me. Um, oh, tomorrow is a different race. Uh, for me, Flanders and Roubaix were the most important races. And uh, in Wevelgem, I had a little bit of problems with my hand. Uh, I crashed in the Pana, and uh, I think after Flanders, it got a little bit infected. And uh, well, I was a little bit worried about it. And I wanted to stop in the feed zone, but then I continued. And it wasn't ready in my head. But then uh, yesterday, I checked it out on the cobblestones, and it was okay. So normally, that will be no problem for tomorrow. After winning Flanders, you said that perhaps you were even better suited for Perry Roubaix, so uh, maybe even a little extra motivation. Yeah, but I was I always been better in Roubaix than in Flanders. Uh, for me, Flanders was a difficult race to win, uh, especially at a young age. You have to have a lot of experience and uh, have to have the confidence of waiting as long as possible, and then have to be in the final. Uh, especially in my case, when you're fast, nobody wants to go to the finish line with you. So I had to think a lot. And Roubaix is a different kind of race. You had to wait. Uh, if you're strong, you're in front, and the guys get dropped behind you. So it's a different kind of racing. Okay, Tom. Good luck for tomorrow. Thanks. And as we look down on what is the main peloton here, they're going to find eight riders have already made a very early attack, forming in a group of four, followed by another group of four, and we now have eight leaders. And quite a big time gap, too, considering nine minutes and 15 seconds, the last time gap. 
Well, that leading group now is actually at 165 kilometers to go to the finish, and they're actually only four kilometers away from the start of the first cobblestone section. But you can see the movement here in the main peloton. Everybody's getting nervous. There's Cancellara in the white and blue jersey of Fassa Borta over to the left. There's Roger Hammond as well, the British national see. champion. And let's not forget that man is riding with a, a crack in his left thumb and that has obviously got to be very painful indeed but he's motivated i think he's given a, a little bit of a free ticket this afternoon but down towards the end it'll be interesting to see how team tactics are with discovery channel and whether or not he has to uh, sacrifice his chances for those of george hincapi these are important moments now see the faces of these riders they're driving hard at the front now because they're trying to keep their team leaders in a position to see the cobblestones first these are the riders we call the domestiques the helpers they're expendable as the race goes on but they try to put their team leaders in the right position and the leaders here now at 11 minute advantage are very very close to entering the first sector of cobblestone they will obviously not be under the same pressure this is now the town of Troisville and this is where the first sector is of 2.2 kilometers and this breakaway group has been away for much of the day now having built this 11 minutes and 17 seconds advantage the thing about Roger Hammond is he's had this special cast made on, he's got his hand well strapped up, um, riding very well because he has good form and he was third in this race last year. The ironical thing is he can't open the hotel room with a key, yet he can hold the handlebars. It's just the different action to the thumb and uh, he simply can't open the door with the hand. But he's really motivated for this event. You know, it takes a special kind of rider, Paris Roubaix, because it's a crazy race. You're going to go over around about 34 miles of cobblestones before you get to the finish line in Roubaix, and you really have to be psyched up and motivated to come to this event. A lot of riders, and in the past, the French, uh, we always used to have a joke about the French riders. They would uh, ride Paris Valenciennes because that was the first place you could actually abandon. That's right, and very often the riders will choose the second feeding station to call it a day. Well, they'll know exactly where they sit in the race uh, by the time they get down to the second feed. We saw the gap briefly there, it's come inside 11 minutes now, and that's because the main field here now are protecting their positions, riding at the front. Eric Putzep is up near his camera as well, and uh, the Latvian champion, and they're riding very, very fast now to try and stop anybody progressing up the peloton. And it's now when we should be seeing the big names who hope to contend moving towards the front here. Riders like uh, Hinkapi of the United States, Hammond we've seen is there. Also Tom Bonin, Peter Van Petergen, riders who love cobblestone races and always seem to excel in them. These boys don't have to worry about e entering the cobblestones uh, first because they're in the leading group of eight. And 10.59 now the gap and are very close to the first stretch. Not too far away, it's a long section of cobblestones at Troisville. It's 2.2 kilometres in length, and in fact, it uh, looks very much as if this is it. This is the start of the Hell of the North. These little narrow farm roads, very rarely used by vehicular traffic all year, except the odd farm vehicle. Uh, but at this time of the year, the organisers seek out some of the roughest roads in France and put the cycle race through. Many of the bike riders say it's inhuman. Many of them say that they shouldn't uh, take part in this race. But I'll tell you what, they all want to say they've won it. And these eight riders get there just on 11 minutes ahead of the field. They're very lucky. They haven't got the chaos that we'll see when the main field comes in here in around about 10 minutes' time because they didn't have to battle for position to get onto these cobblestones. These cobblestones are nice and dry, but I have to say that is a very threatening sky up there. It is bitterly cold. It was just over freezing this morning at zero degrees Celsius, but it has popped up just a fraction to around about eight degrees Celsius. Still not very warm. This is the man at the back who's been doing an awful Burrito. lot of work. Burrito has been in great form over this last week. And it's good to see that Liberty Seguros, who in the past, uh, when it was the former Onse squad, didn't really support these top races at all. And maybe now with the Pro Tour, there's an obligation that they have to come and participate. Therefore, uh, they're actually, for a lot of these Spanish riders, discovering Paris-Roubaix for the first time. Well, this man rode a brilliant uh, Grand Prix Pinot Cherami down in the Ardennes area of Belgium. On Thursday, he broke away just after the start of the 185-kilometer race. He was caught, and he still hung on to the leaders. He was only caught in the last five or six kilometers. He held on to cross the line in third place. It was an outstanding performance, uh, but he can't uh, really have recovered from that on uh, just a couple of days out. So I think he's been told to see what he can do early on and then uh, sit up, and that's what he's doing, I think. But he's in that group, and he's in trouble on the first stretch of college. So... Looks, I'm just looking to see if the rider from Liberty Seguros has managed to get across there. 
and uh, I think he has. We're at 161 kilometres to go to the finish, and in fact, the time gap is slowly starting to come down again. 10 minutes and 44 seconds, but it'll be completely different the speed that the main field comes to uh, this section of cobblestones. You can see and feel the nervousness now. Everybody wants to get into this cobblestone section in the first 15 or 20 places, but unfortunately, there's only enough room for about three or four bike riders. Cancellara in the blue and white there, he's not too far away. Very nervous. Tom Boonen's not too far away. I haven't spotted him just yet, but Cerves Carnarvon's over to the left, so you can bet your bottom dollar that right on his wheel is going to be Tom Boonen, and there he is. There he is, just behind him. He, li he likes Cerves Carnarvon as his main helper. Cerves will destroy himself to keep him in the right position here. And he won the race himself, uh, Cerves Carnarvon, back in 2001. He was the last Dutch winner of this event, and uh, it's interesting that Fasa Bortolo are pushing on here. Cancelo is on that squad as well. Very difficult now to move up. They're more or less going to go like this to the first stretch of cobblestones. Well, at the velodrome where we're commentating, the rain has started. So these boys, I think, as they race north, we're heading towards the Belgian borders, by the way. So that's why there's a lot of Belgian spectators at this event. Uh, they are, in fact, going to head into the rain. And those cobblestones will really become skating rinks. Well, the big problem is, Phil, that it's not going to be a massive rainstorm either. I think it's just going to be a little misty rain, and that makes the cobblestones even worse. When you've got a thin film of humidity on the top of the cobblestones which are made out of granite it really does become like a skating rink and I've seen sections of cobblestones in the past where riders have, have found it almost impossible to keep the bike upright Magnus Bags it's the second line green jersey here indicating to the riders just keep it uh, fast and keep circling here try and uh, look he's doing it again now to try and can command the head of the field this first stretch, it's rather like a horse race, like the British Grand National, you know, because there's 26 sectors, they can be construed as fences. These riders race flat out for them, fall off or puncture, and then continue. It is amazing uh, just how these boys can take the knocks and continue. It's a crazy race. It's a race that I've always got very motivated for myself. There's the town of Troisville, the church. The riders would have been looking over the last few kilometres to see if they could see that spire because they would then know the cobblestone section of Troisville is just around the corner. That's why you can see the main field stretching out into that big long line. Even not participating in the event anymore, I still get nervous the morning of Paris-Roubaix because I know we are in for a huge battle, a battle right between all of the top men in the world, the big specialists. The men who come to this race really do want to do something rather good here this afternoon and they only really get two chances in the year to have a good crack at a cobblestone classic. Telecom, the boys in Mauve, unbelievably without a race victory this year when normally they are the boys on the block and uh, this will be a great way to start for them. They have the firepower, it's Stefan Wesselman, Eric Zabel but they've got to look after them now and get them safely over these first of the 26 sectors of cobblestones. The leaders are through now, they're heading out towards sector number two which will take them on to Vili and that's a 1.8 sector but our camera's staying with the main field because I think this is where the excitement will be uh, once the riders race uh, through the village of Troisville and out onto that sector of cobblestones. You can just see the speed there at the moment by these riders as they try to pick their way through. Here they are. So we look down now on the field as they enter the first of 26 sectors of cobblestones. Eight riders have gone through with a lead of 11 minutes. None of them we will talk about as a likely winner of this race. This is the crucial part. The only rider of note, Victor Hugo Pena, seems to have retired, a former teammate of Lance Armstrong, but everybody else is here in a big field of more than 180 riders. A lot of cobblestone sections are looking down there. You can see all these guys trying to stay at the front end of the main field. We're looking to see if we can spot uh, Fabian Cancellara, the man who uh, last year finished in fourth place. He wears number 11. That's what the road looks like. Those are the cobblestones that would have earned themselves over the last few years and over 103 editions of this event as the hell of the north. They are unbelievable roads, which, uh, in fact, for the majority of their life, are only used as farm tracks. Well, nervous moments now for the field as they go over the sector of cobblestones and we're looking now at the head of the field. So we're just seeing now riders from France here and we will show you the leaders when we can get to them but I think quite rightly now our French producer is keeping his cameras on the peloton just to see what sort of a ride they've got. I'll quickly give you the names in the breakaway. Sebastian Lang of Gerolsteiner, Carlos Barredo, Liberty Seguros, Arnold Coyo of Cofidis, David Herrero of Uscatel, Sebastian Chavanel of uh, Boyge Telecom, 
Uh, Francis Brad of Agri Turbo with his teammate Stefan Burgess and the Belgian rider in the breakaway is Erwin Tice of MrBookmaker.com. That's the leading group of eight. They've been out most of the day. They pushed the lead out to 11 and a quarter minutes. It's back to inside 11 just as we speak. And here they are now with Burrito, who was in a little bit of trouble at the first sector. We're now on the second sector for this group at uh, Vieli and it's an 1800 metre section he looks as though he might have uh, recovered from the earlier shock I think Paul he seems to be okay this time these riders now just getting themselves into a rhythm oh, but this that, is what, the first crash this is where I expected there to be a problem which when they came over just a few moments ago there's a little bit of wetness a little bit of humidity on here and somebody's gone straight into the ditch Ouch. and in this is bike. why this is exactly why Phil you have to ride in the first 14 or 15 places this guy here at the back is certainly not going to see very much more of the race he rides for the Air IGT team Ludovic Martin and uh, the trouble is time. what we've had you see we had quite heavy rain the last couple of days although the weather today is cold and threatening uh, there is rain uh, just a little bit of light rain at the finishing line they're expected to ride through the forecast is heavy rain uh, this afternoon all over France it hasn't come yet uh, but you see they've hit the mud stretch and riders started to fall off ironically it's a teammate of Martin who's setting the pace now at the front well, this is why you really do in these first sections of cobblestones have to find yourself at the front of the main field. T-Mobile are doing a great job there. They've got three riders pretty much up to the front end. Eric Zabel is there. Stefan Weissemann is also lit it looking pretty good. In around about eighth or ninth position, I can also see the lime green jersey of Maggie Backstead, the big Swedish rider. And I think not too far away there, uh, Henk Vogels is riding pretty well for Australia. A little bit of dust storm blowing up as well now. Remember that out is the Forest of Arnberg and in are some extremely cruel sections of the course which includes drags and a small hill, something that's never been in Paris Bay in all of its history since 1896. And uh, we're waiting for that stretch of cobbles with great interest because the road is all so narrow. Telecom definitely coming here to try and put matters to rights, the boys in the mauve jerseys, perhaps in favour of Vesseman or Zabel. Looking at the leaders again now, and Burrido has gone up one place to the front now, so he's beginning to settle in a little bit now, because the rider here on the back is MrBookmaker.com, Erwin Tice. He's a good rider and he's got good form. This is the second sector of Pave for the leaders, then the banner indicates they are leaving the sector special points there is a special prize for the king of the cobblestones uh, but basically it uh, doesn't bother to um, carry a great deal of interest everybody wants to just know who's going to win the battle of the hell of the north meanwhile life here for Nicola uh, Reno I don't think he was the rider well he wasn't the rider who fell but I, I was just saying uh, where is he on the course now he's right at the tail of the peloton which seems to have split up under the pressure of that uh, that shunt we had down at the start this race will be split up into a number of groups right now and many of these riders at the back will have a hard time actually ever seeing the front end of the peloton again before they get down to the finish Domino Vacanzi at the back here they've come off that first section of cobblestones at Troisville but very shortly and they don't have to cover very many kilometres before they get to the next section which is 25 sections to go to the finish at Vieli and that's a 1.8 kilometre section. This is the mayhem that is created by the first section of cobblestones. The main field is very much split up. Very much. We've just passed poor old Ludovic Martin, who's the victim of that crash. He's now way at the back there. Our camera moto is trying to get through to the main pack, but you can see the chaos that these cobblestones leave behind them. It also blocks the race cars, of course, so if the big boys at the front, important riders, have flat tyres, they've got no cars to give them wheels, and these riders at the back, likely is the fact they will not rejoin this peloton because the wind is quite strong today, and it will rip them apart, they're wasting energy now. It's going to be a very difficult Paris Bay. One has had that feeling all week, and the rides themselves are predicting it. You can just see little channels of water on the right there because we have had some quite heavy rain. That's going to be very dangerous when the main field comes in because everybody's battling to get up to the front. This is the third section of cobblestones for the leaders. It's a four-star section. The easiest section is a one-star. The most difficult section is a five-star section. And this section of cobblestones is 3.7 kilometres long or almost two and a half miles. Just to explain how difficult these cobblestones are, it's not so hard when you're riding it, but the following day when you get yourself off the bed yeah. after Pairu Bay, the joints of your fingers are actually sore, something that never happens in any other bike race in the world. And the a lot of the riders do uh, put amendments on the bicycle. Tom Bona, for example, his bicycle is approximately three centimetres longer than normal to allow for the passage of the mud between the wheels and the frame. 
and uh, they use padding on the handlebars etc now there's the chaos at the back here now as the echelons form these diagonal lines that indicate the direction of wind as the riders lean on the wind and they try to work on the lee side of it they're bringing some of the cars through now to try and get the services up towards the front bunch but I'm not too sure it might not be a bit early it it'll help these riders back for sure I think that is a little bit early the race referees over the last couple of events have made some rather strange decisions and I think that one to get into that gap quite that quickly could actually fa falsify the race a little bit but the team managers are pushing all the time behind the referees because they want to get behind their leading group of riders as soon as possible just in case somebody has a mechanical incident so there are actually two races here there's the race of the riders and there's also the race of the team managers who want to be as close as possible to their best riders well these riders now at the front are going to find that their 11 minute lead will come down rather quickly now because they can't hold back the cavalry charge anymore these cobblestones coming now thick and fast the riders will work flat out if they can to keep the pace high to try and stay at the front as long as they can they can they can can once they get onto the cobblestones, uh, one rider is actually just setting the pace at the front end of the main group. As we get confirmation of that group again, Lang is up here. That's him on the right-hand side for Gerald Steiner. Herrero, Chavanel, who's the brother of Sylvain Chavanel, who just recently, in fact, won himself the circuit of the Saar. They're at 151 kilometres to go, but look how that time gap has now plummeted down by a couple of minutes to 8 minutes and 46 seconds. 151 kilometers left that's about 90 miles in old money and the breakaway now uh, it's every man for himself he's just got to try and uh, master the pace of the leader of the group you've got to ride these cobbles fast you tend to ride them on a fairly high gear and you've got to try and miss the big holes that lie between the stones because that's where you get the flat tires and it just smashes the rim is this rider got a flat tire as well Paul no no we're actually just looking at the, no, the gear the ratio there top. in fact a very special gear ratio adopted for Pay Roubaix normally the inside chain ring is around about a 39 tooth sprocket but here at Pay Roubaix you have two fairly large chain rings so that you can actually flick down onto the smaller chain ring on the inclines of these uh, cobblestone hills that have been introduced into Pay Roubaix this year they're talking of uh, 15 16 tooth back sprockets up for the climb today We'll see. Of course, if you get stopped on them, then you need a lower one to get going again. And that inside sprocket, in fact, uh, the inside chain ring at the front will be a 46th tooth. So the difference between the two is really not very much. That's the 25th section of cobblestones to go for the main field. 1.8 kilometres. They seem to be fairly calm here, but they won't be when they get to the next section. And that says, I think, once again, where we'll see the main field start to split. Uh, Oscar Tell rider here certainly not enjoying Hello. this section of cobblestones, and I think fairly shortly he'll be back in the main field. Uh, the Basque rider from northern Spain. He's not used to these roads. They have much better services on the roads in France, I think, and it looks as though he's being slipped away from the from the breakaway here. Try as he might, he's being ridden off by the vibrations, I suspect. One of the six men. And sitting here near the back also in the danger seat now is Arnold uh, Cuyo, the other young rider on the Cofferdis team. He'll be thinking more about Stuart O'Grady. I think O'Grady looked pretty fit yesterday when he came to sign in. And uh, he certainly is one of those riders who has a special motivation for this event. And for the people who are interested in the technical side of the broadcast, in fact, the motorbikes that the race the race uh, television uses on a day like this are completely different to the big motorbikes that are normally used they're much more of a, a cross-country type motorbike and that's definitely very much required on some of these cobblestone sections it's quite a long stretch too. this one that they're on the moment only three star there's the peloton they just clattered the way over their second sector looks as though they're regrouping a little bit at the moment as they head up towards uh, the nasty portion which now is only about 30 kilometers ahead of them Riders here, the boys at the front are the lucky ones, but they've had to work so hard to claim these first positions and see the cobblestones because they can keep out of trouble. The stones, as you can see, are still dry, a little bit dusty. Just in itself uh, can be an absolute nightmare because it flies into the eyes, causes conjunctivitis um, and can be very, very nasty. But the field, unusually so, extremely compact here. Although, having seen a rider just jump a cobblestone then, I wasn't sure he was falling off. Well, there's one or two riders still will be trying to get back in but this is a, a lot of cobblestones in a space of around about 20 kilometers you can see the race referees car is right behind there that red car but uh, the most sensible place to try and ride here is at the front of the race because you've got that 
much more chance of picking a smoother section of cobblestones if you can and the safest place to ride as every old professional will tell you is right in the middle there because there's less chance of the race being split up and there's less chance of the cobblestones being demolished this is the, the back end of the race, the Arrière de la Course, and you can see here one or two riders now really starting to suffer. This is Ivan Santos at the back there for Liberty Seguros. As we uh, have a look here at the Tête de la Course, you can see the rider here from Uscatel is having a very difficult time trying to get himself back onto the group, but he has actually recovered having been over that cobblestone section. So he's rejoined, that still makes eight riders at the front end of the event. We're looking now at 148 kilometers to go to the finish and another 23 sections of cobblestone. So look at the way he's moving his hands there. What he's trying to do here is just to loosen them up a little bit. It is very cold as we look down at the main field. You can see the expansion at the front end of that group there. That was where everybody is battling to be. That is the safest place to be. And while at the back you can see Ivan Santos here is not very happy at all with his incursion into the cobblestones. Yes, now it's hard riding at the front that causes elimination from the back. Pave sector 24 now. This is for the main field. We're looking at the head of the main field now. They're on sector 24, which is the third section for the pack. The eight riders are still clear, although we've seen they are in trouble. One or two of the riders has tailed off. The Uscatel rider, David Herrero, has been dropped by the leading group. And that the sectors of delays on the first section of cobbles at 12 Eel has caused quite a severe fl uh, split in the peloton, Paul. And we, we can't get close. Well, we see surveys can have in this front group. We can't get close enough to ascertain if anybody of importance has been left behind yet. There's George Incapi as well. That's a good sign. Roger Hammond is also right. That's Tor Hushoff in the white jersey. Sorry, who's there as well. Well, it's good to see Hincapi riding up to the front, but I'd also notice that uh, one or two riders are taking a very serious ride to the front end of the peloton, and Stefan Wesserman already there in the pink jersey of T-Mobile. He's already riding right at the front end of the pack. These guys want to get into the difficult section of cobblestones in the first three or four places. That way they can see where the danger is, they can see where the pitfalls are, and with a bit of luck on their sides, they can avoid going down in some of the nasty accidents which normally happen at the back end of the group. But it's good news for the moment for the race because although the clouds are heavy the rain is staying away and it has been forecast all afternoon here in France and uh, the narrow sectors of the new sectors are to come and that is going to provide us with a real insight as to who the strong men are. A lot of work has been done by the uh, Fasa Bortolo team, by the T-Mobile team. They've been working extremely hard at the front. Uh, they've all got their own agendas today, of course, as we're looking out across these bleak fields here in northern France and when the wind sweeps across there with rain. And would you believe we had even flakes of snow here in France yesterday morning as well. This is the rider who has been dropped by the breakaway, leaving seven men up front now. This is David Herrero of the Uscatel team. As we're now uh, a few segments down the road now. And as we look here now, it's been a tough start to the day, not just for the riders up front, Bob, but look at the chaos at the back of the race here. From the very first section of cobbles, absolute pandemonium breaking out in the peloton. Huge gaps because of a big crash in the field. Riders struggling to get back. This is the war of attrition that Perry Roubaix is all about. Yes, and that's why the public are here, because they're able to move on to the next segments of cobblestones after the race passes through. They know this route better than most. They know all the back roads to how to reach other sectors of the cobblestones. Good to see George Hincapie riding very much to the front. Maggie Baxter very omnipresent at the front end of this group and very much supported by the rest of his team. This is Stefan Weissemann. Looks nice and comfortable. Pulled out of Tour of Flanders just seven days ago with a stomach infection, but he seems to have bounced back. And he will be very motivated at this race. He's finished second in it in the past. There's a little slowing down, I think. There's Roger Hammond. Now, this is really pretty amazing to realise that this man is riding Paris-Roubaix with a cracked left thumb. And whatever anti-inflammatories he could take or whatever painkillers he could take that pain is still going to be going right through his body oh, he's a tough boy i mean he's been a former world junior cyclocross champion this is about as close as a road cyclist will get to racing across fields and mud in the cyclocross sport and he loves this race and he's, as he said after the accident he said unfortunately for me there's only one paddy roubaix a year so he's had to give it a go and i think his team uh, uh, the discovery team of 
have really done well to put him in and take a chance with him. He's riding extremely well. Tactically, he's just about perfect right now. Perfectly placed right there at the front of the peloton. George Hincapie tucked in just behind. And the Discovery Channel, so far, they're trying to reverse the bad luck from last week, uh, excuse me, last Wednesday in Gent Wavelgum, and they're doing a great Perry Bay so far. Yes, only one rider finished from the team there, and that was uh, Tony Cruz. This is Andrea Taffy at the back wearing number Former 81. Winner. Now, Arrière de la Course is not a good sign for Andrea Taffy, who says here that he's actually trying to ride his last Paris-Roubaix. He said, I want to ride very fast if I can, but a lot of riders will be riding fast. And if you just check him out here, you can see that he's actually overtaking a lot of riders on this cobblestone section, so he's moving up through the field. Difficult in situations like this to know just exactly where he is, but when you get a caption that says Arrière de la Course back of the bike race, it's oh. not good news for Andrea Taffy. Yeah, and don't forget, we're following the last Italian to win Paris-Roubaix. Andrea did it in 99. He's certainly riding his last one because I think at the end of this year he will finally uh, call it quits. He's wears number 51, which as many of us know, number 81. It, it is in fact on the, on the screen there but he's coming back you know he's obviously got delayed on the one or two sections of cobbles and he's fighting his way back in that's uh, hats off to him eh good courageous ride the, the riders in Perubay talk about two things the courage to come back into the front and the bad luck that gets you off the back in the first place of course Andrea Taffy has both of those things it, it, uh, at this point in the bike race and he's putting up his hand for another uh, maybe word or uh, some bike change perhaps so it's not a flat tire I'm not sure what it is, but the problem is with Andrea Taffy, just looking at his jersey there, there was no dirt on it. It doesn't look as if he went down. I think he was probably stopped by one of the accidents just a little bit earlier on, but he will have to do something very special to pull himself back into the race. Now he's slowing down a fraction. Riders are starting to come by him. If we could just tilt down, we get a chance to see if he has got a mechanical problem. But the way he's riding, the bike is still staying fairly straight, and that's probably just the back end of that group that he needs to make contact with. Hard to say whether his tyre is flat or not there, but anyway, he's getting back into the tail of the peloton. He'll live to fight another stretch of cobblestones at least, as this is now the rear of the main pack. There's a rider on the right from Fasa Bortolo with a flat tyre, and he's going to have a long way to don't know who it was. Well, what's nice to know about Andrea Taffy, I was talking to him just yesterday, by the way, Phil, and this is definitely going to be his last Paris-Roubaix, but not his last race. He's actually said that he's going to go to the United States after this and ride the Tour of Georgia, which will probably begin this farewell tour. I tell you what, a lot of good riders are going there too. Robbie Hunter said he's going there too from the Phonak team. Robbie today amongst the favourites here. If things go well, there's the banner indicating the end of this sector of cobblestones. Good news uh, for Andrea Taffy. He's still got a bit of racing to do to get back in the action, but the peloton for him is just around the corner. This is the front of the peloton here now. Everybody... Just look at this now, 47 kilometres of Parve for the peloton still to go. That's 23 sections of the 26 still to come. Nasty, nasty. A lot of cobblestone sections and some of the worst ones still to come. And we still have to get a chance to see that new climb that's been brought into Paris-Roubaix. Some of the Flemish riders compare it to the Eichenberger, one of the very difficult climbs of the Tour of Flanders. You can see here, we're just moving up to the front to uh, Discovery Channel, trying to pace George Hincapie into the next section in a nice position. Hincapie in about third position there, just behind his teammate Roger Hammond. Hammond's ride in Paris-Roubaix this year, Phil, is going to be slightly different to the ride of last year because he's now a man who has a ticket on his back. They know that he rides the cobblestones well, and here they are on the next section. Hincapie getting into that section in third position. Nicely placed. saint Piton now for these riders. 1,500 metres, zone 23. The leaders are through. Remember, they've reduced in number, and so too as their lead now is down to less than eight minutes. It was 11 and a quarter. But this fast tempo riding by the strong men at the front now, Hammond off to the left of our picture, having done a brilliant start. The man with the broken thumb, and it's not just his broken thumb, but he has um, a very painful side and knee as well from the crash. He, he hit a post in Ghent Wevelgum, where there's a spectator standing in front of him, he suddenly moved out of the way, and there it was, he couldn't avoid it. Here comes Andrea Taffy. And he's just about going to claw his way onto the bunch here. He rides these cobbles, unlike most Italians, very, very well indeed. But I think the important thing about riding the cobblestones as well is it's very important to have a specific position on the bike, to have your centre of gravity nicely distributed. And that's why the bigger riders actually tend to do well in a race like this, as long as they've got the suppleness of their pedalling action. Because if you can ride fast and strong over the cobblestones, you actually glide over the top of them. Just looking here now at the field. There's our cameraman. They're as brave as the riders, those boys on the camera motos today. 
uh, because they not only uh, have to rely 100% on their driver, they have to look through a little camera and keep these boys on shot. It's a big bunch that's rattling through this 1500 meter stretch of cobblestones as well. And Taffy should now be tacked on just at the tail of them. He's recovered well. I think he was forced to stop there and he's had to fight his way back. I don't think he fell. I think you're absolutely right, Paul. But he was delayed by a situation. Little Thomas Vockler just at the back end of the group as well. And uh, not really a rider very much suited to this kind of event. But he said, as the fresh na French national champion, I, re I believe I have to participate in the biggest and the best events in the world. He's taken a battering over the last week or so in races like the Tour of Flanders and Gent Wavel game. But he's been there. He's participated and it's actually starting to look a little bit nasty at the finish line here as we see Ikea Flores there uh, probably doing a bit of training for the Tour de France when it comes over the cobblestone sections in a, a couple of years to come but it's a fine misty rain that started the fall the finishing line now and it's just what the riders don't want because it just dampens everything on the surface I can't see them escaping the day without rain to the spectator of course they'll be delighted but to the riders it just highlights the dangers of Paris-Roubaix this big field here coming now towards the end of the saint piton stretch which takes us to 111 kilometers done of the schedule 259. Mathieu Criquillon at the back here from the Lambeau Credit team. I wonder if he's any relative to the team manager, Claudie Criquillon. And uh, we get a chance to see here uh, Edgy Tuar moving to the front. This is the worst possible kind of rain I think that we could have at Paris-Roubaix because it's a very misty fine rain which will put a, a real coat of humidity on the surface of the cobblestones and that will make them very nasty indeed. And the wind is coming with the rain as well so that doesn't uh, promise for a great finale for the riders but it probably makes for a very exciting finale for the viewer. Well they've entered the fifth sector here, sector 22, Escalmer. 1500 meters and looks as though they're quite happy to just ride together here sensibly so at the moment they'll know exactly what the chaos is behind and how the race will be attempting now to bring them back they don't have a lot of firepower i can actually see the difference in speed with these guys going over the cobblestones and the main field behind the main field really whips it up once it comes to the cobbles and they're going over them at around about 45 kilometers an hour and it does feel believe it or not just that little bit more comfortable when you go over the cobbles at high speed got themselves organized on the front and uh, this is the next section it's a uh, again a fairly long section of cobbles but we are really waiting to see what the the main field is going to do when they get to the cobblestone section at Bua, which is section number 20 to go to the finish because a lot of the riders have said that is a scary piece of road this is uh Brad on the front for agri turbo at the moment he's got a teammate here stefan Berg, yes also there he is stefan as the riders come through, former stage winner, the Jacobs Creek Tour Down Under, one of his only wins of his career, in fact, after a long, long breakaway on the stage down in uh, South Australia. Arno Coyot on the back here for Team Cofidis. All he will be doing is just to trying to survive because all of these riders now, Phil, I think, realise that the main field is going to pull them back. But what it does to a team, if you have a man in the breakaway, once the group catches you, you've given yourself a little bit of an advantage now this is at the back of the group again it looks as if uh, Tor Hussoff might have had a problem but he has reintegrated the peloton he's the best place rider actually I think in the the pro tour he's in uh, fifth place in the overall standings he and Tom Boone are very close together yeah now it looks as though we're charging up towards where that beautiful smooth piece of road is about to disintegrate. Henk Vogel setting the pace, the Aussie from Perth, now racing back in Europe again for Robin McEwen's lotto team. McEwen's been a bit sick and hasn't uh, yet come out of, uh, of uh, the sick period he's been riding in, so he's not here. Well, McEwen, uh, I would think we'll get back into form in the latter part of the season. He started the year off very well, very dominant in the tour down under you can see Vogels just putting his earpiece in there Vogels has a two-pronged attack I think here this afternoon because not only will they be looking after Peter van Pietigem who we haven't yet seen anywhere near the front end of no. this bike race and he'll also be looking after Nico Martin the recent winner of the Ghent Wevel game one day classic this is the next sector of cobblestones for this will be here I think this will probably be Escalmain for the riders in the peloton now as they're heading up towards it and Henk relaxing on the front because he's got them nailed down now. It is in fact Escalmain. This is 1500 kilometres. Uh, 1500 metres, no shocks boys. Sorry, 1500 metres of cobblestones. Uh, meanwhile, back up with the break. They're heading up to Vertin now. 
and very soon they're going to see the climb first. They're well clear of trouble. Oh. And there's been a bit of a shunt here at the back now. Rider shot off uh, to the left of the field here now. And that rider is Ludo Dierksen's lying. The oldest man in the race at over 40. The champion of Belgium, Tom Steeles, has gone down. This is claiming some big names this time. Credi Agrico rider on the right as well. That's pretty sad for uh, Ludo Dierksen's because this is the last time he'll be participating in Paris-Roubaix. He's been a great battler over the past in races like the Tour of Flanders and this is a very slow remounting here. I think he must have pretty hurt, pretty much hurt himself going down in a crash like that. It really goes to show why the riders battle all of the time to ride onto these cobblestone sections in the first 10 or 15 places because these guys here, Phil, probably don't even know there's been a crash at the back. No, Dirksen's 40 years of age now and uh, almost certainly his final season. Professional riders don't, simply don't go on till they're 40 years of age, but Dirksen's is such a popular guy. He started quite late in life as a professional and that's probably the reason for his longevity. There's another rider who's got a lot of bother now as well. Flat tie for him. I've got a feeling that's uh, uh, Roman Luhoiv, Luhovi, a rider from the RAGT team. Oh no, it's not, it's his teammates. Martin again. Well, that's bad luck. That's his second stop, and he's getting a bit fed up with this now. Looks over his shoulder, no sign of the cars. Well, this is a professional cyclist lot here. If you have bad luck, uh, there really isn't much you can do but hang about and hope you can race back. That's the tough thing about it, really, you know, if you have the puncture at the wrong time, you can be waiting at the side of the row for two or three minutes for the team cars to come alongside, and your Paris-Roubaix basically can finish there, and uh, probably will finish for him when he gets to the next uh, feeding station on the road. He'll take a shortcut back to the finishing line and to try and get himself an early shower. Dovitamont Lotto on the front here, looking nice and controlled. They've got the racer uh, exactly where they want to have it. Stuart O'Grady is not too far away, but look at the time gap. It's coming down consistently. 130 kilometres to go to the finish. That time gap now down from the maximum of almost 12 minutes down to just seven. It's a long way to go, isn't it? 130 kilometres, and they know that the worst cobble is still to come. Looking at the peloton now, they're saying goodbye to the cobbles of Escalmont, which means that they have uh, only uh, 21 more sectors to go, 130 kilometres still to ride, and this breakaway of eight is hanging on, but clearly coming back. The lead now just seven minutes. These are the leaders now. As we see, the seven riders, they got away early on today. They went in two groups of four. They formed. They've had a lead of 11 minutes and 17 seconds. That lead is now down to seven seconds. In the distance, you can see they're heading towards the rain now, which is already coming to the stadium at Roubaix. We've seen out with a crash, uh, Dierksen's, Tom Steele's delay, the champion of Belgium, other riders too. Uh, but the gap uh, coming down regularly at uh, seven minutes. Well, if you get a chance to see the flags here, you get an indication of just how difficult the wind is here in the north of France at the moment. It really is a tough cross headwind, which is why I think we'll see a lot of riders uh, getting tailed off on the latter sections of cobblestones, because when you hit those sections of cobblestones uh, with that very strong cross wind, you, there's no way you can hide, there's no way you can get shelter, and you just get popped off the wheel in front of you. This is Erwin Tice, number 236, and then uh, Stefan Burgess just ahead of him, the Agri Turbo boy, moving off Sebastian Lang. These are the breakaways. Here's the main field. So as the main field are now heading, uh, they still have ahead of them now all of the major sectors of cobblestones. The early action has claimed uh, Dirksons and Steels, and we've also had the group have now closed down what was a gap of 11 minutes 17 to just seven. Those eight riders getting together very early on, and the problems are continuing here now as the grit works its way through these small tyres uh, as they hit over the cobblestones. Poor old Jimmy Angouvon is now the rider from Cofidis who takes the problem in hand, got a good wheel change, he was lucky for the car was on hand there. Very lucky, that's the important thing, you have to have a little bit of good luck in a race like this if you're going to keep yourself uh, in with a chance of getting the wind down towards the end, and his car was there very quickly indeed. That's Vesselman off to the right, George Hincapi bobbing in and out to the left of our picture, Hincapi motivated, it's good to see, Ekimov is right alongside him, you can't have a better man to help you out uh, than Vatishav uh, Ekimov there in the centre, Tony Cruz is here as well, these boys are beginning to look pretty sharp. 
Absolutely. They're looking great so far today in Paris Bay. George Hincapie, very motivated for this race. He's done it for 10 years. He's always right, been right in there. He's been so close to the podium in two occasions, getting fourth place twice. And uh, even his very first Paris Bay, he finished near the top 20. So he's a great talent, and this is the perfect race for him. Let's see how big George, if he can finally take out this great classic. I think what's also very interesting there is the fact that uh, the whole of the team, you could see almost into the depths of their eyes there. They were very concentrated, very alert. They wanted to make sure. Oh. Look at the chaos here. Everybody's trying to take a shortcut to get around that corner. In fact, uh, sorry about that, boys, but there's a, a little <laughs> rope there that you might not have figured into your equation. That wasn't the way to go. Indeed, it wasn't. Uh, sector 21, it is nearly two kilometres long, this. The reason Hincapi and the boys from the Discovery Channel have got near the front is because they know now they're not far away from the new sections of cobblestone which includes the climb and they want to keep out of trouble they certainly want to keep out of trouble but Stefan Weissemann has been very much present at the front end of this peloton but we're now getting into these sections which are new sections of cobbles many of the riders say they are even harder than the old forest of Arenberg which may well be brought back into Paris-Roubaix in the future once it's been renovated but I've heard uh, something like around about $500,000 is required to renovate this small two-kilometer section of road which goes back to the Napoleonic times. Well, it's a beautiful stretch of road, and during any day except Paris Bay Day, uh, it's not open to the cars at all. It's only the public to walk in the tranquil pleasures of the forest there. Looking back down, they've started to calm down again. There was the big battle to get into the cobblestone section. Just see there, Stephen Weissemann in the pink jersey of T-Mobile, looking nice and relaxed. He's uh, keeping his gears fairly low down, just tickling them over the top of the cobblestones as we get a, a chance to look back and see just exactly what has happened. Somebody else, there's another crash right in the middle. These are bad cobblestones. That's a massive crash that was. Bike shot everywhere. And there's a massive pileup of riders here. This has disrupted the whole field at the rear, and we can't see anybody of note, but look at the riders at the back dismounting getting round it quickly I'm not sure that's not Roger Hamlin in the white running through there you see the dampness there that was what uh, caused the crash uh, somebody obviously just uh, slipped a little bit look at these guys doing cyclocross over on the right hand side straight off uh, Tom Steele's again down and out that's because he's riding too far to the back end of the group somebody's very seriously injured there I think just over to the right hand side of the road that's one of the riders from Liberty Seguros one of the Spanish riders has gone down very hard and uh, Steele's uh, obviously having a hard time with his uh, Paris-Roubaix here this afternoon. Well, that's, there's the problem, you see. And the rider from Liberty Seguros there looks to me as though it is Alan Davis. And that is a terrible shame, because Alan I would have put amongst guys for a hot finish here. But it looks as though Davis is the worst injured there of that big shunt from Australia. There it is again in retrospect. And it's all happened, as you say, Paul, on that little muddy corner there. And then the ricochet effect. Look at that bike in the middle of the area as it uh, takes its while to even come down. Yeah, what happens there is uh, once there's a crash over on one side of the road, the guys behind, then all of a sudden they panic. They hear the noise of the crash first. And Peter Van Peter Pietergum. Van Pietergum. Now, where is he? He's looking for a bike. I think this might be the end for him. He's hurt his right arm. Well, this is bad news for Belgium, bad news for Peter Van Pietergum. He was one of my big favourites for the, the win here this afternoon. He's not panicking, he's not giving up just yet. He's waiting to see if his uh, team car is going to come. And a lot of the team manager, actually, over the last couple of weeks have been complaining a lot about the World Pro Tour rankings because they're actually it's the rankings of the individual place riders that gives you your ranking in the team convoy. And a lot of these teams have got their cars a long way further back than they would have if it was the old World Cup standings. Uh, there's a lot of things to be sorted with the Pro Tour right now. There's the quick-step car of Tom Bonin. But we need the lotto car of Van Petergum. He's got a bike, he's gone, he's gone on his way. Uh, so he's got a change. I think it came from neutral people in the end, but he's looking a little bit stiff and sore there, and that really is sad. A very early victim of the crashes there, and that's bad news. Uh, Bert Roosems is the Belgian rider with him, just here. They're good mates, they're on opposite teams, they might try and help each other, but a lot of work required. Well, the big problem here, Phil, is in fact uh, he's lost himself at least one and a half minutes on a group that's charging over the cobblestones. And you see that crash has had a very big effect on the group because it's actually split the main field. There's this little group there just about to make the contact, but this is a long section of cobblestones, and that crash has really had a serious effect on the race oh. here. It's split into a number of different groups. Well, they're professionals, they will get themselves together and work as a group to catch the next group, but 
it's such a lot of energy they're wasting now and, and Peter Gum is right out of the convoy here but that is a serious problem for Peter and I think it'll probably in the end will probably uh, mean he won't win this race today So the crash to Peter Van Petergum in a massive pile-up. He wasn't the only one that's gone down. Alan Davis, the right at the bottom of the pile in the blue jersey. He's from Liberty Seguros. And Tom Steele's a second fall for him today. And so they are three big names, I think, now. Probably out of the hunt for this year's race. There's Van Petergum. Now trying to get himself organised, his teammate alongside him, Bert Rusums, will give all now to try and put him back into the uh, winning situation. There's a lot of riders ahead, they won't be trying to race away from him, they're just getting on with their race to survive, he's just got to race up to them. Yeah, but he's hurting, he's actually in I a bit of is. pain here, he went down very hard. And the funny thing is, even though uh, that tarmac is a hard surface, it seems that the cobblestones are that much harder when you actually drop onto them. And this man here is in agony, and uh, I think it's his right wrist there which uh, seems Might to be, be hurting quite ball. a bit and that is uh, rather a shame because he's a great bike rider and a specialist at this kind of event maybe he was taking the risk of sitting at the back allowing everybody else to fight and hoping that there weren't going to be any accidents five minutes 59 seconds 123 kilometers to run the peloton at the moment a very small group indeed uh, trying to contact those eight leaders they're now heading towards Vertin with no sorry they're off Vertin now they're heading towards the Bouet which is where the leaders must be very close to we're now into the sectors uh, which are all new to Paris-Roubaix this year and they say they are very tortuous cobbled and hilly and narrow we're going to find out soon the only thing really that Peter Van Petergem can hope for is that in fact as they start to get into that next cobblestone section just before Bois there, there's a, a general slowing down because I think that's the only way he can reintegrate. He's got a couple of teammates up with him there because Tom Steeles is in that group with him as well and that may well be a, a big indication. You can see the rider from Cofidis there also went down very hard. I think that's Staff Shearlinks. And you can see there uh, just the blood on his elbow and it really is a, a battle of courage here at Paris-Roubaix. This is what it's all about. It's going down, getting back up, trying to get yourself into the event. But Peter Van Pietigam there, the man who was one of the big pre-race favourites along with Tom Boone and going down in a nasty crash. And there it uh, looks as if that's uh, one of the riders from Liberty Seguros. I wonder if it's Alan Davis who's got himself back up. No, it's not Davis. It's not Davis, I'm sorry to say, because Alan's a good sprinter and this race really should suit him. Then I tell you one thing as they go into this section now, I'm surprised that the cobblestone section of Bois has only been given a three-star rating but it is as most of the riders say very important to be in the first 10 or 15 places because although this is not a major climb it's the first time we've had anything resembling a climb of the Flandrian mountains in a race like Paris-Roubaix this is the back group Arrière de la Course this is the chase of Peter van Pietergem and I remember one magical comeback a few years ago when Fons de Wolf was one of the big favorites to win this race he had a lot of bad luck and he fought himself way back from around about 35th place on the road to come into the finishing line in fourth and that was incredible and maybe that's something we might witness with Peter van Pietigam here this afternoon but he does look as if he's riding in a lot of pain I think he is Tom Steeles is there valuable ally but Peter not doing a lot of work now back to the leaders here Dubois and uh, these are the riders you say only a three star course it looks a bit bad down there for three stars the worst has five stars the Fasa Bortolo riders have two big fighters in this squad and I think they're both here in Cancellara and Fletcher. Fletcher's proving to be a man of the classics. He only narrowly got beat in Gent Wevelgum on Wednesday and he's here in this leading group again along with uh, Gianluca Bortolami is here, uh, Salvatore Camesso is here but I'm still looking to see how many of Discovery are here. Stefan Wesserman is here as well. Uh, but it's going to be, you know, I've, I'm just wondering what's happened to George right now. Well, we can't actually get in there to get all of the information to hand. Uh, Weisserman and Eric Zabel riding very strong. Look at that bit of grass growing down the middle of the road here. That's probably what, if you were in Ireland, you'd call a dual cabbageway. Yes, you would indeed. Both the two top boys from T-Mobile. Unbelievably, this team has not won a race this year when they normally dominate the early season. But we're looking now at the two riders from Telecom. We do believe that George Hincapi has had a flat tyre and we don't know where and we haven't seen him yet. So I've got a feeling he might well be in the second group on the road. 
That would be bad luck for Hincapi, where he's got a chance here to see what the race situation is at 119 kilometers to go. There are a leading group of eight riders with an advantage of around about five minutes over this group and uh, another group uh, two minutes further back, and I presume that must be the group that contains Peter Van Pietigem. So he's still got a good chance of pulling himself back into this race because the impetus, Phil, seems to have gone out of that little cluster of riders there. They just seem anxious to hold the positions once they get to the front. But that is the stretch of Boua. We're moving on to Presso and then Olnoa, and it's an Olnoa where we get the big climb, and it's a five-star rating. It's not far away now. These are uh, new roads for the Paris-Roubaix. They're all up and down as well, which surprised the riders. And they we're looking now at the main field here. News reaching us as Alan Davis, in fact, has now been taken away to hospital. I hope he's not too seriously hurt, uh, but he really came off the worst of that massive crash at uh, Vertin. Peter Van Petergum here. Tom Steeles is not liking the climb either as they slowly but surely crawling back into this group here. Not sure if it's actually the main peloton, but he's trying to come up and let's hope he can. Well, Van Pietigam is uh, trying to get back onto the end of that group, but you can see the pain written all over his face here as he just tries to keep in contact with the group. But you know, when you're riding over these roads, any little pain or any little problem that you've got is absolutely and utterly exaggerated and gets amplified right through your body. The crowd there shouting this man on, a man who in the past was one of those very rare riders to have won not only the Tour of Flanders, but also Paris-Roubaix in the same year. His teammate, Rusum, looking over his shoulder, trying to encourage him. He will just uh, utter one or two words of encouragement here to try and keep his morale high, try and get him back into the race. But, you know, it's a very difficult thing to do. Well, Van Pietergum, as you pick through riders, you look ahead and you've still got more ground to make up. You can't make up a lot of ground on the cobblestones. You fight and hold your position and wait desperately for the cobbles to end and then try and move quickly forward as best you can. Uh, just now, though, this is uh, Staff Shearlink. He had a nasty fall. He's passed through and gone to the back and he's getting a lot of help here from Bert Rusums, his teammate trying to pace him up to that group. They're getting there slowly, but it's not the front of the race. That's the problem. He just needs a few deep breaths and he's got to keep on pushing on to try and catch up with that leading peloton who are not driving quickly. They're just letting it come routinely at them, fighting to hold their position in that front peloton at this stage of the race. There is still an awful long way to go. More trouble here as a rider from Credit Agricole and I think Agri Turbo, but I'm not sure anymore because they're covered in mud down there uh, trying to get going again. Big huge chase being put in by the Lotto de Vitamon riders because their man, Peter von Petehem, who's won this race in the past, won Tour of Flanders in the past in the same seven days of time a couple of years ago. A great bike racer, had some horrible luck to be caught in one of the big crashes very close to the front of the peloton. These are the leaders back with them now as they're heading up towards the climb of the day. This, they'll be on the section of uh, Preso two kilometers and they've done pretty well here I didn't catch the orange jersey there Buscatel he may have been at the back but uh, we'll see if we can see him Herrero he was in trouble early on let's have a look at the breakaway now Erwin Tice on the front setting the cobblestone se sections and uh, not surprisingly because Tice is a very experienced bike rider there's the Uscatel rider just tacked on the back there starting to ride himself into some kind of form on, the, on these cobbles as these riders now are on the next section. This is uh, the section of uh, Presso. Still 115 kilometers to go to the finish. That's around about 70 miles of racing and still an awful lot more cobblestones before they get down to the end and the finishing line here in the Roubaix Stadium. Well, they've done very, very well so far. It was the early break. They haven't surrendered by any manner or means and they might well be improving their lead over that front bunch just now chance to see the two front chain wings there which are very closely matched 46 47 52 53 probably uh, this is the main field now getting bigger and bigger after that crash so with a little bit of luck now van petergen might get back into this race but of course he is nursing either a wrist or an elbow which is causing a little bit of pain but they're stopping the cars that's a good sign that's an indication that they are starting to eat into the difference between themselves and the front end of the main field you've got to take your hat off to peter van petergen because looking at his face a few moments ago you could almost read the pain that he was going through but this is his race he mm. has lived this race for the last couple of years and he's wanted 
to do well here. He is a specialist at riding on cobblestones, and a little bang on the arm is not going to stop him from coming out here and racing to his maximum. Look at that, that's the group there just coming through this, the outskirts of this town, right into the back end of the convoy. Referees stopping one or two of the cars there to give them safe passage around that corner. It's only 40 or 50 metres, Van Pietergem is back, but how hurt is he? Atra is where we are, and just as they hook up, we are going into one of the most difficult sections of the course so far. So there's going to be no respite for them, they've just got to get through. It's very, very narrow, but our boy got through with the motorbike camera as well, as they now are on the back of the field. Well, they're back in the fight, and that's fantastic. Just got to hope that there's no big split in this uh, group on the cobblestone section now because he's not going to have any chance at all to move to the front end of the peloton. He's riding himself back into this race. Uh, there he is, number 21, Peter van Pittigem, de Vitamon Lotto, a former winner of this race, a former winner of the Tour of Flanders. But look at his face. He is in actual agony here. He is suffering to get himself into the event. And what bad luck, really, just to make the contact with the group as they start another section of cobbles. And Rusums is the man just in front of him who stayed with him throughout and has brought him up to the rear of the bunch. Just in time to hit the cobble sections again, so he's now going to have to work his way through when he can. This is such a cruel face, this race, though. There could be a crash at any moment and he could be put back into the same chase situation. T-Mobile have been very attentive at the front end of the race here this afternoon. There's Tom Bonin over to the left-hand side. I'm still looking to see whether or not George Hincapie has got himself back into this event. This is Ivanov on the front. A lot of Discovery Channel jerseys there, but I still haven't I definitely identified Hincapi. But I, I must feel that if Peter van Pietergam has got himself back into the, in, into the event, then George Hincapi must have done too. It's a big bunch, so we can only hope. And our cameras obviously can't get down to check now, uh, because this is a nasty section of very narrow road indeed. As the field now taking the chance, ride the rough on the left and right, but make progress. Uh, Magnus Baxter also pushing himself. Rabobank looking, there's a lot of Discovery guys down midfield. I think George is there, so too Hammond. And I think Michael Barry was still there, Tony Cruz. That's a good group, still there. Just caught a glimpse of George Hincap. He was riding in around about 25th place, so he's back comfortably at the front end of the peloton. And he still does have a lot of teammates there to help him down towards the end. This is the sharp left turn, this is the next sector. Sector 19, this at a five star, very, very nasty section with the drag on it. This is going to be a tough one as they start up the climb here now and wait till the peloton gets here. Look how narrow it is here, the crowd wisely standing up in the fields. They better watch out, one or two riders might join them up there shortly. This is a hard section, this is why a lot of the riders have actually opted to put a large inside chain ring on so they can actually flip off from the 53 cha tooth chainring on the outside down into the, the inside chainring of 46. The Dutch there, you can see the Dutch flag flying very high there and uh, gives an indication that this is a very complicated race because the road zigzags along. In one section you'll have a, a wind coming from the left, another section you'll have a wind coming from the right, other sections you'll have a headwind as we zigzag around the north of France, not too far away from the Belgian borders, looking for these treacherous roads that have been around for more than 100 years. 2.6 kilometres is this stretch a little bit of uh, reasonable road surface there 108 to go 520 the gap on 545 i think glenn dollander is likely to be brought back very shortly in the melee as they race for this narrow stretch he might just about get here ahead of that main group which now contains george hincapi peter van petergum tom bonan eric zardel big favorites before the race started the crosswind showing there it's quite strong slight downhill and then we kick up the climb these boys will have no problems with it but what about the back group well they reckon it's chaos you have to really be in a good position here because if you're not in a good position on the slight downhill section you actually have to slow down and start getting the gears going again once the road starts to kick upwards well you know you're in trouble when they start putting barriers up to keep the crowd back and that's what they've done just there flag of the USA flying alongside the flag of Flanders which is the black line on the yellow background now it does look like there might be a hill haunting the area now because there's the other side of the valley and these remember this is a virgin territory for Paris-Roubaix we've normally shot off through the forest of Arenberg not today we're just south of Valenciennes right now Forest of Arenberg just on the other side of Valenciennes, but there's been a lot more cobblestones thrown into this section of race here before we even get to Valenciennes. These riders now will be going downhill in a few moments' time before the race then kicks up 
to what, uh, as one or two of the riders have said, a climb which resembles very much the Eichenberg of uh, the Tour of Flanders just seven days ago. Very long section here, and the steepest part of the climb coming at the very end of it, almost three kilometer section of cobbles. It's given the highest rating as being probably one of the most difficult stretches in the whole of Perry Roubaix, right here, right now. And you can see the breakaway trying to get themselves across this long section of cobbles and they're going to get up to a climb here in a little bit a little bit of a descent it's incredibly narrow so you can imagine what kind of pandemonium is going to break loose when the whole of the field gets into this little bit of gaps there the Yuska tell you skating rider Eredo doing a good job to stay on uh, he's been having some very hard times in the breakaway on the cobbled section he's doing a lot better on the on the uh, regular tarmac out on the road but uh, he's not going to have a chance to get back on that for another kilometer and a half after a tough little climb best place for these guys to be is at the front end of their race but when the main field comes in a few moments time I wonder if Peter van Pietigen will have had the chance to get to the front end of the main field because I think he needs to be there if he's going to stay in Paris-Roubaix today look at the face now as they grit their teeth this is the little drag up it doesn't look much through the trees but believe me it will hurt the legs of the riders the breakaway having the best shot at it of course all eight men still together still hanging on by his uh, shirt tails is uh, David Herrero of Uscatel in that orange jersey the others have a little bit more of an advantage the black and white flag of northern France the Breton flag in fact also flying here now this is the first big challenge of the day as they now race towards the summit of the climb and onward. Five star as they continue to push on. The difficult thing for me about this section is a problem there over to the right hand side. Somebody was just pulling off there. The difficult part about this section, of course, here, Phil, is not just that we've got this long 2.6 kilometer section. We've actually got, in the space of about eight kilometers, five kilometers of cobblestones. And uh, Herrero here not feeling very comfortable at all. And even though this is a new section of cobblestones, you can see the crowd have certainly found it quite easily. They uh, exactly knew where it was here. We can hardly pick the rides out. It's almost got the scene of the Forest of Arlenberg there with all of those people. And stopping on the other side of the road there, it looks to me as though it is uh, Seb Chavanel who's gone. Yeah, he's broken his saddle actually, and that's a bit of bad luck for him. And there's a rider down here, and this is a Phonak rider who's gone down, and this doesn't look too good at all. This is Martin Elmiger. He's also, so just as they've entered the stretch of cobblestones here, which will lead them to the climb, Martin Elmiger has gone down on the corner. And the chain, they had a hard time getting his chain back on there, the Swiss rider from Team Phonak. A lot of help coming from the spectators at the side of the road as they push him off, and he's now going to be in the chaos of the team cars. On this slightly uphill part of these cobbles, it's very difficult to actually get the bike going again because you have to pick up speed quite quickly, and he's not too happy there. He's got a problem. He actually can't get his foot back in, and that's because he's got a, a pair of socks over the outside of his shoes just to try and keep his feet warm. Well, it is cold enough today. This is the rider detached from the lead. We should have now uh, six riders up front because we've lost uh, Sebastian Chavanel with a broken saddle. Herrero has been dropped. These are the front runners now, remember, with just on five minutes lead. We're at Olney Le Valenciennes. It's a 2.6 kilometre stretch. It's five stars. The leaders are heading on towards the next sector at Fama. Uh, we've been over the hill with the leaders. We're waiting for the main field to get there. It is such a narrow road now we've seen it. Um, there is going to be a little bit of chaos to say the least. And the riders know it because virtually all of them rode it in the week. Well, if you have a mechanical problem in this section here, I think you could be damned to be out of the race completely because there are three sections very close together. Lang, Baredo, Coyote, Bra and Berges are still in the leading group there, as well as Erwin Tice has still managed to stay in contact with this small group now, which has been reduced to six riders. But there's a lot of cobblestones here with not very much tarmac in between them. This is a big battle now, six riders left to the front, a couple in between, five minutes the gap, and they're closing it down. And they're just over 100 kilometres now from the finish. Lotto are riding now because Van Pietigam has got back after an incredible chase to bridge a minute and a half from his accident back into the bunch. And now they're free to ride again for their captain. It's 
what this bike race is all about. Having the courage to have bad luck, to pull yourself back into the race, never to give up, never to surrender. Always to think about the fact that the race could slow down a fraction in front and you could pull yourself back into the fold. And that's exactly what Peter Van Pietergam has done. And also George Hincapie, who had himself that little mechanical incident, a quick change. Maybe he was even passed a wheel across by one of his teammates because I have a feeling I haven't noticed Michael Barry in this group anymore. And he made a, may have made the big sacrifice of passing a wheel over to Hincapie. Anything is possible in Pirate Bay. This is the eighth section of cobbles of the day now, section 19 of 26. There's still an awful lot of hard rocks ahead of these riders, but this was always noted as one of the crucial parts of the course. The strong men need to get here now and show they can ride this race from the front. And Hincapie has recovered from his bad luck and he's got himself to the front. Well, as I said earlier, you could be looking down at the Forest of Arenberg here at the end of it. The crowd have just changed allegiance now and moved across to this only climb, the first ever climb we've had in Paris-Roubaix. It is a battling sight, and even for these riders at the back, there's still a hope. This really is the one that breaks the camel's back for these riders here. Many of these riders will have been absolutely on the rivet, and that's an expression that comes from sitting on the front end of the saddle, which in the old days were held together by brass rivets. And when you're really under pressure, you find yourself moving much further forward on the saddle, and that's a sign that you're about to crack, and many of these guys here have cracked. And that's the saddle adjustment being done of Sebastian Chavanel there. That's his bike, and this is him. He's uh, looking as though he's on a strange bike, trying to get his other ready. The mechanic's working on it. He's to be twixt bunch and brake just now, trying to wait for what will be a bicycle change when they fix it. This is the remnants of the breakaway now. They were eight, they're down to six. The two that have gone, Chavanel we've just seen, and the other rider who's gone is David Herrero of Uscatel. These boys still hanging on to a five-minute advantage over the main field, and we think the main field now more or less all together with George Hincapie in there very definitely. Unbelievable, these cobblestones that they've managed to find. It is regarded as the disappearing roads of the north of France, but the race organisers always somehow manage to come up with something, something special as we go a little bit further back, and this is... Uh, Poor old Chavanel here trying to keep himself in contact. He's on a strange bike, strange machine, and all he can hope is that his team manager can get some kind of information fed back to him from the race radio and try and get up here with a, a normal bike because he must uh, be hurting quite a bit there having to use those pedals from a different era. He's taking a look here at the bike. The change is vibrating on those cobblestones. They don't look much on television, but boy, if you ride them, they'll shake your false teeth out. This is the main field now, the Swedish flag flying there, no doubt for Magnus Bagstead, he's the only Swede in the race, last year's winner. And uh, talking of him, Paul, I haven't seen him for a while, but surely he's got to be in this front group, we haven't seen any of him. Let's just have a look here, this is Lotto, this is Nico Martin, very close to the front, looking over his shoulder, Leon van Bonn in there as well, they're looking to see whether or not their big man, Peter van Pietigem, has recovered, and I would think that he has. Everyone's uh, just trying to take uh, an idea on exactly who has managed to get themselves back into the restoration. And I've got a funny feeling I just caught a glimpse there of Baden Cook as well. Uh, Cookie, by the way, despite the fact that he's been a professional for quite a number of years, is participating in Paris Roubaix for the first time. I find that amazing, and that's what he told us yesterday. Yeah. There's the long line of a very angry peloton now, trying to recover from the bashing they just had over the climb. There's more to come now when they enter Falmar. 1.2 kilometers of it. Again, the general regrouping at the back. They live to fight another day as they get back up to the heart of the peloton. It's been a real tough race this last hour or so, and we've seen one or two riders uh, suffer badly. Alan Davis, uh, the Australian, gone to hospital. We don't think seriously injured, uh, but certainly gone a possible broken bone or two. Van Pietergum has come back despite a heavy crash. Tom Steeles has come back despite falling twice so far. He's riding like the true champion of Belgium. He is, and talk of him, there he is now, having a chat with Peter Van Pietergum. Van Pietergum doesn't look very comfortable, though, because this is at the back end of the group, and I wonder if uh, Van Pietergum, in fact, has been dropped again, because these guys are not going very fast at all. They're having a little chat. Van Pietergum sitting up there. I think he may well be pulling out here, because they're so. not in contact with that peloton anymore, and that is rather a sad day. You can see him bowing his head down. That's almost a, a sign that he's uh, about to give up, and uh, a sad day for the Flemish, because uh, he was a massive big pre-race favourite.
But I think you're right. I think he's hurt his arm, uh, although he got back into the group, and Tom Steele surprisingly has gone with him. So they've both given up on the climb itself and decided to call it quits. And it's it's a sad sight. Two big names from Belgium are going out here for sure. And that uh, really is rather sad. There's another crash on the left-hand side. Somebody went down there rather yeah, that rapidly. That was Van Dijk, Stefan Van Dijk of Holland, MrBookmaker.com. And he's a promising rider, but he's had a nasty tumble there. You see, in Belgium and France, rather, the police are even helping out here to get him back on the road again. But he's not looking as though he's too frisky right now. He's just checking the bike, checking to make sure everything's OK. And he, uh, again, he's had a problem. I'm not sure what that was all about, but he's uh, trying to get his bike onto the large chain ring. He's obviously hurt as well as the main field, don't know anything about this. And you see how they've taken either side of the road. They're looking for the smoothest part of the cobbles if they can as they charge away down this very long section of stones. We're on Farmar now, which is 1.2 kilometres. And uh, out one or two big names there. Stefan van Dijk is also a very good rider at this type of event. The specialist for the Paris Nubay uh, course. And just look at the way that the rider's a bit low down there, dodging now, looking for the smoother cobbles, trying to get in the corner, keep out of the way, see where they're going, which is imperative. Otherwise, they place all of their faith in the rider in front of them. This is section number 17A. There's uh, two sections here. There's a lot of cobblestones in this part of the world, and this section is actually the section of Atre à Kernang, followed by a short bit of respite when they go on to the next section, which is at Kernang to Mang. And these two have been brought together. This is Peter van Pietergem's group. The cars are all going by him. So this is the end of Paris Bay this year for Peter van Pietergem, yep. who at 33 years of age must be wondering whether he'll have another chance to come back and try and get himself the victory one more time. He's had a win. He's had a second. He was uh, fifth, I think it was, last year in this event. But this year, not to be for him. He's had that sort of season so far, Peter van Pietergem. He did have one good ride, though, in the Tour de Flanders. And that's been a favourite race of his as well. But it looks as though he's just looking for the chance to turn off the route or get a lift in one of the cars behind because he's in quite bad pain here. And I think he's hurt his elbow myself. Yeah, he went down very hard and uh, I think Bob will agree with me. The cobblestones, when you fall on the cobblestones, they don't give any mercy at all. They just seem to be just that bit much harder than anything else you can fall onto. It's like a meat grinder chewing you up, and Peter von Pedham, no exception to the rule that you mustn't never fall on the cobbles unless you want to get seriously injured. I think that he's uh, uh, put paid to his chances in this year's Pay Roubaix. He will be back in this event. He loves it so much, but for uh, this year, and it was very close to the front of the group where he did crash. It's a place where you expect to stay out of trouble, but there was a puddle on the course, and it was very slick and down went one of our big pre-race favorites and we see all of the rest of them still in the front but racing very quickly now and a quick step at the front T-Mobile look at Vesemann right there right in the front of your picture Tor Hushov is there of course George Hincapie just behind them and riding a great Perry Roubaix so far even despite a little bit of bad luck for George with a flat tire Lars Mikkelsen there for CSC as well. Another Scandinavian rider who fancies out. There's Magnus Bagstead in the lime green colours, just popping in and out of our picture on the left as we look. And this is a very, very interesting group. Somebody from Rabobank stopped there with a problem you may have seen uh, left on the corner. Meanwhile, back up with the leaders here. And this is uh, Carlos Burrido, who had a brilliant uh, Grand Prix Pina of Shirami the other day. Finished third in the end. He led for virtually the whole race, and he got caught by a couple of riders just before the finish. Very bad luck, but he did stay up there for third. These guys are doing fairly well to hold on to their advantage. Uh, they are riding at a fairly steady pace all of the time. That's the cobblestones. That's the hell of the north. That's what this bike, is, bike race and is all Sebastian about. that's Sebastian Chavanel. Still, still trying to get back. Still trying to get back. This poor guy is caught in absolute and utter no man's land at 99 kilometers to go to the finish and it's a minute and 23 seconds his gap there back to the group and this is the abandon here of Peter van Pietergem I think he's going to pull off and I think uh, sad day for Belgium as he takes uh, an exit off to the right hand side so Peter van Pietergem uh, abandons the race he raced back up to the leaders and he couldn't hold his position we think He's got a damaged right arm, possibly an elbow. He'll be off to hospital as soon as the race finishes. He's on the right, going with Just look at the chaos here. Now, there's the car for him. 
time to leave the course but it's absolute traffic block here but he's turned off the road here that's his dad just over there on the left hand side so he must have known there you can see once he's actually getting off the bike you get an indication of just how badly hurt this man was he fought well to get himself back into the main field but I think now he'll have to uh, move away from here and come back and fight another day but what a battle it was to get himself back into the race and rather a sad day for Belgium Yes, it is, and uh, poor old Tom Steele's fell twice. Meanwhile, back with the race, that peloton is still large, isn't it? It's slowly been recharged by Ryder Teen at Kerang. Two and a half uh, uh, kilometres long, and uh, it's a question of how long can they keep going before they too have a problem. This is ranked as a, a three-star event, uh, the most difficult to Vita Monlotto, a team which has almost been decapitated, really, with the loss of their leader. The man who uh, many expected would take the try and ride for himself. The, the Lion of Flanders flag is there and it used to fly for Johan Museo, but there's a new Lion of Flanders now. His name is Tom Bonin. And Bonin has been riding very much to the front end of the main field, well protected by his team. And so far, he hasn't had very much of bad luck at all, Bob. Tom Bonin riding a great Paris-Roubaix after a fabulous victory last weekend in the Tour of Flanders. The two races that most Belgian riders would most love to win coming within one week's time here in the very early parts of the season and Tom Boonen is the big star now of Belgian cycling and it's a long tradition of great champions in the in the event per Rume. we mentioned uh, Roger de Vlaminck the uh, the gypsy as he was called in his day Eddie Merckx was great Rick von Steenbergen and of course the most recent one multi winner from Belgium was uh, Johan Museu Museo, the king of the cobblestone classics, the king of the Tour of Flanders, and the man who very much loved this bike race as well. But I do have to feel a little bit sorry for Chavanel here because he's having a hard time on a bike which is not his own bike at all. And it is very, very difficult to go back to these old clip and strap type pedals for this man. And very shortly, I hope that his team car can get up to him to get him a new bike and to get him a bike with the correct pedal combination on there. At the back here, you can see the, the rider here from Liberty Seguros is doing a pretty good job staying in contact. This is uh, Barredo. He's uh, probably very happy to be in this situation. We've got a situation now where there are six leaders in this bike race. Chavanel is at around about one and a half minutes, and it's four and a half minutes back to the main field. Yes, I don't think Chavanel will rejoin the leaders now. He's had a bit of bad luck, and he's paid the price in full there, uh, despite the efforts by the neutral service mechanic to arrange his bike for him. Uh, Barredo rejoins here, coming off the sector 16 at Monchos uh, a Caillon. As we now continue on towards uh, 15 zones are still left here. And uh, these boys are still holding on to the lead, which I would think is about four and a quarter minutes now. But the last check we got was five minutes. There's one of the helicopters that checks out where the riders are and uh, gives us a good shot. It's a police helicopter, I think, as they just look for the riders here. But... This has been a very difficult opening part to Paris de Bay. Look at the size of the peloton. It's really got itself back into the action here. That's a very angry main field. They certainly are not slowing down at all. They're um, trying to set themselves up for the next section of cobblestones and everybody battling to get onto them in the first 10 or 15 places because the accidents normally happen around about 30th place and that's just exactly where Peter Van Pietigam and Tom Steele's were a few sections of cobblestones ago. See the Discovery Channel riders, there's still quite a lot of Discovery Channel riders up to the front as they start section number 16 to go as well. They move on to this section of cobblestones here at Monchot sur Ecaillon. Hicapi getting back into the group after a flat tyre and it's good to see that he's still got a lot of teammates up alongside him. This section of cobblestones ranked a three-star section. The gap now between the peloton being charged up by the T-Mobile riders and the six leaders is just two and a half kilometres now. So they have started to close it down. Remember the leaders are now clear of this sector of cobblestones. They're about to reach Havlui, which is a 2.4 kilometre section. The riders from T-Mobile still smarting over no wins at all this year, trying to put matters to right. They're riding a very good race, and look at the men they've got up here, including their top two riders, Eric Zabel and Stefan Wesserman, both up here in the thick of the action. And that's uh, Comesso just gone through behind, and there's Torhoshoft in the champion of Norway's jersey. Looking down the line here too, we've also got uh, Tom Bonan, he's just passed through with his team, George Hincapie, 
little bit far down the line, but he's not very far behind Tom Bonus, so I put, suppose that's a bonus. Roger Hammond in the white jersey, champion of Great Britain, still riding with his broken thumb. Unbelievable, he must be in pain. He can't even open the hotel room uh, with his hand, and yet he's hanging onto the handlebars in Paris Roubaix with it. It'll be sore, it'll be very sore tomorrow because he actually didn't ride on the cobblestones like a lot of his teammates did between his crash in Ghent Wevelgem and the race today because he was hoping that it would start to heal up just a fraction. But you know, the vibrations will be going right up his arm and he will have to be clenching his teeth to take the pain. But when you love a bike race like he certainly loves Paris Roubaix, it doesn't matter that much. You only get one chance in the year, you've got to go for it, haven't you? Speaking with uh, Roger Hammond yesterday before the state, before today's race, uh, he said just about no matter what happened to him, he'd be on the start line of Prairie Bay. It's his favorite race, and I think he had the ride of his life uh, last year's event when he finished on the podium. He was on a different team, but Discovery brought him over to help George Hincappy be shepherded through this, and look how slick that is going to be. Here is the T-Mobile squad leading the peloton. They're having a great Perry Bay so far. So is the Discovery Channel team, and there is Stefan Vestman. Look how comfortable he seems on his bicycle on this very tough section of Pave. Well, this man is a specialist when it comes to riding on the cobblestones. He was the, the dominator of a race that used to exist in the Eastern Bloc countries called the Peace Race, and there were a lot of cobbles in that, and he has learned how to ride them perfectly. 38 there, Eric Zabel. He's my outside tip for today because Eric Zabel has got some of the best form of his career, although he's not sprinting as he used to. Well, just looking down the line there, our Cameron getting very brave, getting so close to the rider. Zabel had a bit of a wheel slip there, but he survived. And this is the man of the week, I think, on T-Mobile, Marcus Berkhout of Germany. We've never seen him until this year, and he's ridden three classic races in the last seven days, and he's always been in our camera lens. He's riding superbly. Somebody's got a hand up down in the field there. It might be just a warning to make this right-hand turn. All is well. So they're off that sector at Monchot now, heading towards Havlui, and that'll be 2.4 kilometres. That's where the leaders should be arriving very shortly. This is one of them, Sebastian Lang of Gerolsteiner. They're not showing really any signs of tiring, these boys, and they're holding their own just now. Well, they're working well. They're doing what in uh, cycling jargon is called bit and bit. Everybody does a bit of a turn at the front, then swings off to get into the slipstream of the other riders because by getting that slipstream, you can actually save up to around about 30% of your energy. And that's how these riders are able to pick the pace up to around about 42 or 43 kilometers an hour. Sebastian Lang concentrating. They've got through another nasty section. They've got 15 sections to go. Same as the uh, chasing group behind. A bit of a no man's land crossing here between the next two sectors. About 12 kilometres between these two sectors. And those are the sectors when you get a chance to just recuperate, take on board some drinks. It's important in between the section of cobblestones not to forget to eat and drink because that's a very important thing in a race like this. 260 kilometres, you've got to be taking on board food and energy all of the time. Sebastian Chavanel here has given up the chase now. He's cruising across the gap, waiting for the arrival of the peloton. No point in expending any more energy. See what he can get out of this race yet. And he's still riding on that spur bicycle as well, the all-yellow neutral bike from Mavic, as he now waits the arrival of the uh, T-Mobile boys. And, of course, the main field, and, of course, his own service vehicle, and he should then be able to get a wheel passed up uh, very sad for him because he was very comfortable in that leading group of riders and I'm actually a little bit surprised the team manager on this tarmac smooth section of racing hasn't been able to get past the main field to come up here and hand a bike up to him. It shows you just how long it takes to get through the field on these very narrow roads. The peloton of riders spread all across northern France, but the team cars that will have to service the riders, finding it very difficult to get up into the front to service theirs. And Chavanel, very bad luck to uh, have a broken saddle when he did have, and his team car still hasn't made it around this peloton. And you can see they're spread right across the road. It's almost impossible to pass for anybody. Bad luck for the uh, Boigi Telecom rider. Sebastian Chavanel. I'll tell you what, Paul Lamprey have got an awful lot of riders in this group, which is very surprising, but they got a result. And the one man who gave them the result, Alessandro Balan, he is uh, something of a star coming out of Italy. He loves the Belgian classics, not many Italians do. He's been up near the front all day so far. Yeah, he was a big dominator of the first stage of the three days of La Panna, and in fact, he held the lead in that race right up until the final time trial when Stein de Volder of Discovery Channel took the victory away from him right at the very last moment. There's Vesemont, 
tough man from Germany, keeping uh, himself topped up with lots of energy. Bortolami also moving up there for Lamprey, looking very comfortable. There's Hinkapi just over on the right-hand side. He's up at the front, keeping himself nice and uh, out of danger. He's got a very interesting teammate to look after him towards the latter part of the race, Yatislav Ekimov. And it's good, of course, to see Jean-Marie Leblanc there, who's uh, up alongside the leading group of riders. Jean-Marie Leblanc, probably the director of the Tour de France for maybe one more year before he hands that across to a man by the name of Christian Prudhomme, who had his uh, baptism of fire this year, I suppose, when he had to look after Paris-Nice, and they were shortening every stage because of snow. Yes, and it's still chilly here in northern France, very unspring-like, I have to say. It's just on uh, slight, about 48 degrees Fahrenheit just now, as the riders race towards the stadium in Roubaix, where the local amateur race just arrived here. But these riders now just concentrating on eating for what is the remaining 90 kilometres or so to the finish. They're facing another two hours in the saddle yet, at least, and they've done pretty well, these six riders. They've got rid of two men only, so they've got plenty of firepower here. They're all looking strong. They seem to be meshing together extremely well, and they're not afraid of what's to come. They're looking now for Havlui, which will take us to 172 kilometres covered, and this sector of cobbles is 2.4 kilometres. Long section of cobblestones, a very nasty section of cobblestones around the outskirts of the small town of Dunet. And this man here, Chavanel, is waiting for the team car. He may well be in communication with them right now, saying, look, guys, I was in the leading break, I did my job, and unfortunately the bike gave out on a situation like this. And what a place to road test machines, because if a bike can get through Paris-Roubaix without falling apart, it's got to be a pretty good one. What do you reckon, Bob? Absolutely. If a bike can get through this bike race, then uh, you could ride it probably for the rest of your life on normal roads. There is Thomas Vogler, the revelation of last year's tour, having the yellow jersey for a number of days, not just on the flat stages, but also through the first set of mountains in the Pyrenees. He's become a huge star in French cycling. He's a very solid bike racer, and he's come to Paris-Roubaix to give it a try, and uh, put, taking his arm warmers back to the team car, and uh, they're the Discovery team, driven by Dirk de Mol, he will have won this race way back in 1988 after a very long breakaway with none other than Tommy the Tank Wigmuller. <laughs> yeah, he yes. must be pretty nervous there because I noticed he was uh, in short sleeves. He must be a bit excited about the race today. It's amazing how even the team managers get excitement for races like Paris-Roubaix. Thomas Vukler talking to the team manager there up alongside the team car. And he certainly has become a great star, not only in France, though, with his ride in the Tour de France. And that uh, makes me feel a little bit scared there going through that gap, Bob. Yes, well, he's won eight races last season, so he's uh, he's a boy in his own right now as a top bike rider. We'll see what he does in the Tour again this time around. Still the champion of France until that uh, title is defended in June. Looks like might have Andrea Taffy down there at the moment, got himself back into the group. That's a good ride, Bob. That's a great ride. He was off the back with the mechanical, and he's fought his way back into the front, and he's got a number of Sonia Duval teammates with him, one of the smaller teams on the Pro Tour, but Andrea Taffy, one of the great champions of all the classics. He's won a number of them, including Paris-Roubaix just a few years ago. Let's just look at this traffic jam. Who'd be a team car driver in any bike race? But in this particular bike race, it calls for enormous skill. The, ca the cars often come out slightly differently, different shapes to what they went in because everybody anxious to see their riders are kept in this bike race which can change so quickly it's been a consolidation now and is that uh, that's in fact is uh, Sebastian Chavanel waiting but he's, he's been on the radio so I suspect we're going to see the arrival of his new bike now I think pretty sensible stopping there because actually he could create some serious injuries riding along with that different pedaling style and that could cause a, a yeah. tendonitis for the rest of his season so he stopped at the side of the road thanks very much to the neutral service uh, provided by the company called Mavic but uh, I think I'll leave your bike at the side of the road I'll go back to one of my own Oh, 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 hang on, we're having a two-way conversation for the moment. This is it now, that's the bike, no panic. Top professional, don't panic. They just let the mechanics do the work and he's getting back into the race at a time when he shouldn't have too much trouble to rejoin that peloton because they're getting themselves a little bit of respite here before they get on to the next sector of cobbles. There's no, there's no reason to panic when you're a professional bike rider because there's only two solutions. You either get back into the race or you don't. Well, you go home and have a nice wash and a warm shower, Bob. And you don't make as much money that way. So <laughs> a good point. It behooves you to get back into the front whenever you can. And there's big George Himcapi, Fabio Baldato of the Fossa Bortolo squad. Great job being done so far in this race. Very attentive. T-Mobile all over the front. There's Rolf Al 
wild egg. 15 times he's done Perry roubaix and uh, this is his 15th attempt. He'll be trying to help Stefan Vesselman across the cobbles, and we'll get closer towards the velodrome finish in Roubaix. T-Mobile on the front, right with the team of George Hincapie, the Discover Channel team. Great job by both of those. They've had uh, T-Mobile especially not very much success so far in this year, this season, and they would dearly love to get a big win here, and they have one of the main men to do that, Stefan Vesselman. Well, the first 11 sectors are now behind the riders, and really, as there's such a big group back at the front, all it's done is eliminate from the race Tom Steeles, Peter Van Pietigam, Alan Davis, uh, and uh, Ludo Dierksen, as the names we know of, because there's an awful lot of riders now got themselves back into this race, and so they're going to have to go through it all again as they move on to the next sector of cobblestones. There's Anthony Cruz taking a drink, and just behind him is Stuart O'Grady, former Australian champion and a highly medal man on the track at Olympic and World and Commonwealth Games track championships. But this is the race he'd love to do well in today. Uh, but there's so many guys who will feel they can win this race again now. Maggie Backstead looking solid. Tom Boonen right up there in the front, quick step. And it's nice to see Tony Cruz at the front of the bike race doing his turn to help George Hincapie from the Discovery Channel team get to the next section of Pave in good shape. Riding across the stones in northern France, it's a very special technique. Some riders dedicate their whole season to just this one day of racing, including Stefan Vesman. And I think it's the race George Hincapie most capable of and would most dearly love to win. We're still on the approach to Valenciennes here before we swing away from the town. Slightly downhill, there's Anthony Cruz off on his shoulder to the right. Left as we look is Bortolami. Behind him is George. Hincapi, of course. Stuart O'Grady in the cofferdish white colours there. The Lotto boys a little bit headless now, unfortunately, with the loss of their captain, but they've still got a lot of riders in this big bunch as they all breathe in for the right-hand turn. It is a massive bunch, and one or two got squeezed out of that one, and they've had to go the long way round. But they're safe as the line stretches and now continues on. It is uh, still a lot of men down there who could win this race now, and they've got themselves back in because the gas has been turned off as the riders now reassess the situation. Still a lot of cobblestones to go before the finish, but I think once we get into the last 40 or 50 kilometers, they'll certainly start to turn up the gas quite a bit. This is Tony Cruz on the front here for Discovery Channel. He's looking after the interests of George Hincapie. Hincapie, I think, today has got a very good chance of getting himself the win here in Paris-Roubaix as we rejoin the leaders here as they're on to the next section of cobblestones, the Tête de la Course, and look at those flags, an indication of just how difficult this race is being this afternoon with the wind coming across. This section at Havlui is a four-star section, 2.4 kilometres in length, and it's still section number 15 to go to the finish. These guys, I think, right now must be thinking to themselves, I wonder when the main field is going to catch us. Well, it's so amazing that they've already done an incredible amount of kilometres on the stones, and they still have 15 s sections to go. Gap going up a little bit now, five minutes, 26 seconds to the front of the bike race, and that's because uh, the peloton has slowed down just a little bit. Uh, general regrouping behind. It's a big group now, probably around about 100 riders, uh, but still 100 riders already out of the bike race. A lot of riders already been eliminated, and some big names, names like Peter Van Pietigam. Such a shame for the Flemish, who thought he was going to win the day. But in fact, they will now have to move their allegiance across, I, I suppose. They will move that allegiance across to the shoulders of Tom Boone and the man who are there now dubbing as the new Lion of Flanders. This leading group pulling out their advantage again to around about five and a half minutes. That's because the gas has been turned off at the front end of the main field. This section of cobblestones here, section number 15 to go in Avlui, and it's not too far away from Denali. This is the reason why that gap has gone up so dramatically, because the main field is spread across. There's Magnus Baxter. I saw Baden Cook still at the front end of the main field, and uh, he could be a big surprise a little bit later on. He rode himself a very good Ghent Wevel game just the other day, finished in sixth place there, when at one stage he looked as if he might be getting himself a podium finish. This is a, a nervous moment now. These guys are uh, getting themselves ready to warm up for the next section of cobblestones. And that'll be a very long section of uh, around about 2.4 kilometers, given a five-star rating as they move around this little traffic circle, which uh, 
we are at 87 kilometers to go and that's for the leading group of riders and they're still holding on to five minutes and 21 seconds but uh, chaos here as everybody looks for their teammates to try and get themselves organized for the next lead out to the next section of cobbles well, I have to say that's a very good time gap and uh, there's been a quite a recession in the fame field but now it's changing George Hincapie pushing through a little bit here shows Tom Bonin as well in the middle there he's got his teammates up alongside him you can almost feel the nervousness now as they come up to the next section it's a five star section the next section these riders will come up to it's uh, 2.4 kilometers in length there's Bonin going through there feels that he's a lot better suited physically to Paris-Roubaix than the race he won last week, the Tour of Flanders. Stephen de Jong here, also a strong man for the occasion in the rubber bank colours of orange and blue. <laughs> Nico Matin. Calling it to all slow down, piano, piano, because Nico Matin was a terrific winner of Gent-Wevergum. There was a lot of accusation on Wednesday that he slipped in behind the cars approaching the finish. Uh, they certainly were in the wrong position, but he didn't put them there, and I think he merited his victory. But even so, as we're looking now at the next sector of cobblestone at Havlui, 2.4 kilometers. That'll put 172 kilometers under the wheels of the bike riders today. And they're all getting a little bit frisky again now. The nerves are beginning to set in once again. They've had a slight respite for 20 minutes or so as they've crossed over on lovely smooth roads. But now it's time to get down to business again. Here we are in Havlua. Havlui. Havlui, I beg your Havlui as they move up and they're not too far away now from getting into that cobblestone section. And you can see people taking the risks around the left and right hand side of the main field to get their team leaders up to the front end of the peloton. The leading group of six riders is on the section of cobblestones at Havlui. This is Erwin Tais of MrBookmaker.com getting himself and his team an awful lot of publicity here this afternoon. But the team who've done actually very well in placing two riders in the leading group is Agri Tubel, the new French team. And they've managed to put two riders, Stefan Berges and Florent Bra, into this group. And that's good for them because they're one of the smaller teams, a team that was brought in on the wild card. All the top 20 teams in the New World Pro Tour have actually been uh, officially selected. That leaves place for five teams to come in through the wild card selection. And Agri Tubela was one of those teams. Organising themselves here. They're off the cobblestones now, but uh, not too far away from starting that cobblestone section of Avlui is the front end of the main field and you could almost feel everybody starting to get just that little bit nervous because there's only about six kilometers in between the section of Avlui and the section of Orna which in itself is also a very nasty section well these boys you have to say have put up a great race today they're not panicking at all they're hanging on to five minutes plus of the lead as it has been for a long way but now here comes the main field they've now established themselves on the next sector of cobblestones this is sector number 15 and 12 still to ride have the 2.4 kilometers all of the main field here except the six riders at the front Sebastian Chavanel who had a saddle problem at the front has awaited the peloton he's back in this group he's changed his bike but these boys now again being driven on by the T-Mobile riders and in particular this one man Marcus Burkhout who really is turning out to be a strong boy George Hincapie is in here as is Roger Hammond and as of course is Tom Bonin there's Tom Bonin in third place right on his wheel was Cerves Carnarvon I think Cerves Carnarvon's job there was just to keep as close as possible there to Tom Bonin because if Bonin has an incident at this point then his teammate Cerves Carnarvon can pass over the wheel well we can see the stronger teams especially for this particular event you don't see a lot of the Euskatel Euskadi team riders up in the front you don't see a lot of the Spaniards but you do see all of the Belgian riders and uh, a, a bunch of American guys too so it's, it's quite nice to see Tony Cruz doing great and of course George Hincapie still right where he needs to be he had a little bit of bad luck earlier on the day but Discovery riding a great race Ekimov is still up in the front as well staying the Volder is there but Cerves Canavan just he'll be just in front of Tom Boonen and uh, on the shoulder of Stefan Vesselman, another big star of this particular event and they give everything of the whole year for these few sections of cobblestones and uh, this is where it gets really tricky. Tour Hushov at the top of your screen there in perfect position. The riders from T-Mobile having a great race so far and showing their real strength as a team in Peru Bay.
Matty Heyman also riding to the front there for Team Rabobank. He's a rider who, in fact, has ridden pretty well over the last week or so in races like the Tour of Flanders and Ghent Wevel game. This is the Arrière de la Corsa at the back end of the bike race. This is Francisco Ventoso of Sonia Duval. And it was interesting to see just a few moments ago that Andrea Taffy, riding his last Paris-Roubaix, was riding very close to the front end of the peloton. He's got himself back in, fought himself back in, as have a lot of riders here now as they all believe they can still produce something on Paris-Roubaix at the moment. Backstead, so not Backstead, rather Buchhardt is still the big man from T-Mobile setting the pace here, knowing his two top men are with him in Stefan Wesselman and in Eric Zabel. There's still a lot of riders think they can win this now. It's far from over for any of them as a big peloton, one of the biggest I can recall actually getting together at this stage of a Paris-Roubaix and somebody's gone off into the field there one of the Bianchi riders and in fact that looks as though it's Mauro Girosa of Italy the leaky gas rider it is so he's oh. had a crash as a Mr Tony Bookmaker Cruz. down is it Tony Cruz? Tony Cruz has gone down pretty hard as well there and he was at well, the front end of sad. the main field that is sad we didn't see that happen it's happened right at the back of that big field as they go on this stretch well Tony Cruz has been riding superbly Bob that's a big loss to George that's a terrible bad luck that shows you just how tricky this race is one minute you're at the front doing the teamwork for your captain the next minute you're on the ground and uh, very tough luck for Tony Cruz he's gonna have to fight hard to get back in the front of the bike race getting help from a, a spectator from the side of the road. It's amazing when a rider has an accident or an incident out on the road like this. The spectators will help absolutely everybody. The front end of the race is at still at 82 kilometers to go and uh, Tony Cruz has in fact got a mechanical there. He's waiting for the team car to come up alongside him, whereas in the main field, the pressure is still very much on. Yes, well, everybody, you fight for yourself here. You're, you're in a big bunch of riders, but you are riding as an individual. It's every man for himself now. Try and see the cobblestones, pick your way through them. Check who's riding around you. They are off that 2.4 kilometre section now, and have we heading on towards Unang and on towards Orshi soon. And this here looks like it, we may have a problem here with Seb Lang because he was in the he's, breakaway. Yeah, he was in the breakaway. He's calling past the team cars, everybody to leave him. It may well be that he's just popped because it doesn't look like he's got a mechanical problem there. The neutral service motorbike has gone by and left him all on his own, and he too, I think, will probably be waiting for the main field to come up to him. This, as always, the early morning breakaway is starting to fall apart as we get to the tougher part of the course. Sebastian Lang having two flats simultaneously, not to his tires, but to his legs. Seems as if he's run out of energy. He's calling for the cars to pass him, the TV motorbike even. His day is done. But these are our leaders. They've been out for most of the bike race, and it's down to a very select group now of just five guys. So five riders stay in the lead in Paris Bay. The main field with George Hacken Hincapi still in it are at five minutes. Well, there's the breakaway. As I say, now Burrito is still there as we head on to the next sector here. And this is now the sector to Onang. That's a pretty ropey old sector. How many stars for this one, Paul? This is a four-star section, three-star section, 3.7 kilometres. a long one. I don't think it should have been given just uh, three stars because this is one of the longest sections. Goes past the two water towers you can see there, and it actually gets to those water towers. You turn to the right, and it's a big, long section where in the past we've seen pressure being put on the front end of the main field, and it could be, well be that if the peloton attacks this at full speed, we'll see a splitting in the peloton here. This is actually the section which in the old days would be the second section after the old forest of Arenberg. And it was usually here where the riders were all chasing to regroup after Arenberg, and many of them didn't, of course. It looks as though Burrito there is having a, a little trouble with his bike as well. He's having a problem with his hand. He's, yeah. he's been uh, clenching his fist for the last 15 or 20 kilometres as if those cobblestones are really sending a lot of vibrations right the way up through his bike. Pushoft uh, in the red jersey there and red shorts at the front is riding a very good race. He's not got too many teammates around him anymore, but he seems to be keeping himself out of any danger. Well, it's continuing to drizzle out on course and at the finishing line. 81 kilometres to go, the gap's down to 441. Reaction coming on the Pave again. And sadly, that Pave has claimed now uh, Antonio Cruz from Discovery. And we don't know his whereabouts as yet, but let's hope he can get back. Certainly Hincapi would have appreciated him because Cruz is riding well today. 
He was riding very well, and he looked injured when he went off to the left-hand side of the road, but I think compounded on top of that when he had to call for the new, a, a new bike or a new machine of some kind that was going to make it very difficult for him to get back into the peloton and look after his team leader. There, That was just giving you an indication. If you look at the angle here, it gives you an indication of just how fast these riders are going over the cobblestones. They're riding at around about 45, 46 kilometres an hour. This is Erwin Tice here. Now he's coming into his own. The Belgian's a great bike rider on cobbles. He's now having to take on the role as leader of the breakaway now. Most experienced man in it. I'm surprised we saw Seb Lang drop back from this. We presume it was just the legs that went, uh, but he certainly uh, fell back quite quickly. As, I think uh, he was uh, in a situation there where he said bridge to engine room, more power, and there wasn't any more power, so he just had to sadly. pull over to one side. That's the way it hits you sometimes. If you're not attentive, if you're not sensible and keep taking on board food, just eating a little bit every 10 or 15 minutes or so, as the main field now takes the left-hand turn, they're not very far away from starting that difficult section at Hornay themselves. Well, condition is getting worse at the finishing line. Pity the poor commentators, because we're sat in the open here as the rain starts to come down. All our computers have had to be shut down. The television has been put... A plastic bag has been put over the television by the organisation. And... Um, it's a very upmarket plastic bag, though. Oh, it's, it's true. It's quality <laughs> plastic. That's quite right. And the riders here are racing towards this rain. They don't appear to have it just yet. They're around about uh, 80 kilometres, just inside now from the finishing line and Quickstep are now looking to look as though they're trying desperately to take control. Jans Kort's doing a good ride for Cofferdies there. Doing a good ride, he'll be looking after uh, Stuart O'Grady a little bit later on. Now Quickstep here obviously I think thinking about trying to turn up the gas, there's Maggie Backstead and just at the back of this group uh, Bob, I'm amazed over the last week how mature the young man by the name of Tom Boonen has become, just 24 years of age, all of a sudden from being a sprinter, he's a classics leader. Well, when you go the last 10 kilometers by yourself in the Tour of Flanders, you are one of the big stars of the sports. Tom Boonen did that one week ago. Um, he didn't have a great Gent Wavelgum in the meantime, but I think he's back on form for Perry Roubaix. He's riding great so far. Interviewed him in the uh, at the uh, sign-on yesterday afternoon and uh, definitely looks straight into uh, your eyes and it's quite a fearful sight when Tom Bowman is staring you down, telling him his agenda for today's race, and that's to win. And that's him just there, Whoa. just uh, coming straight across there, wants to be right at the front of this section of cobblestones as he comes in here. He wants to make sure that there's going to be no problem at all. This is section 14 to go to the finish, 3.7 kilometres, two and a half miles of cobblestones, and these are not the smoothest cobblestones in the world. So these are the riders now on section 14 and this is the main field eating into the lead of the breakaways as they're down to five now and the gap is less than five minutes and it looks as though Tom Bonin has decided right now it's the time to be seen at the front here and get out of trouble. He's forced the pace to move right up to the head of the field which is still a very large field. It's a very large field. I thought it was starting to rain out on the course, but it's actually little spots of water on this television screen in front <laughs> of us. But I'm sure before they get down towards the end, they will have some damp sections of cobblestones, and that could be rather nasty because they won't have the big storm that come and wash all the mud and slime off. It'll just be a nice little coating, enough to make it dangerous. Now, this looks like Kretzkins who's doing the driving now for the Quickstep team. As down there, the peloton stringing out once again. Look right around the horseshoe bend there as they stretch out. Everybody anxious now to try and get to the front if they've got the legs because it's not just the cobblestones now, it's the hours they've been in the saddle. Oh, there's another and there's another to the and that doesn't look, I'm, I'm not too sure whether that wasn't Baden Cook who went down there. Went down pretty hard. It's the same colour hair as Baden Cook. And that was a very nasty crash and it is an indication now these guys are really starting to push this race forward. Well, there's still no indication as to who that rider is, but I think it was Frederick Gaydon, is it? It looks like it might be Gaydon. No, it's Christophe de Tiu who's gone down. I thought it was 121, 124. Well, he went down pretty hard right at the side of the road. That's an indication to me that they're actually putting the pressure on, on this section of cobblestones. It is a long section of cobblestones, and if they go at it as they seem to be at full bore, and this is full bore, they're opening up the gap. This, this is, is a quick huge step effort now. now. Huge effort now. Quick step are deciding this is the time to make one decision. There's their man in second wheel. This is the most interesting ride, and I think the CSC rider there might well have been Lars Mikkelsen who's got in there. It is. He's also a man for the cobbles. This is time now. Hinkab is 
he's got to move up. It looks like they could be moving up. Inkepi was in that group. He was just on the back of the group, actually. He was nicely placed there. You can see the reaction now coming from Fasa Bortolo and Fabian Cantillara. He, too, has been caught out by that acceleration. This is a very long, difficult section of cobblestones. One man caught out there, Tor Hushoff. He's trying to pull himself back into the event, and they really have now on this section, 3.7 kilometres in length, opened up the gas. There's desperation in the wheels now as the riders just grab anything they can to try and hold position. This is the push that's been causing the trouble. And tucked in there is Hincapi, second from the back. He's done well. Mikkelsen has got in there too, another strong man. 4.15 the gap. This is a great move being put in by the Quick Step team. Tom Bonin feeling very strong, telling his teammates. First, it was Pipo Pozzato that made the big move, made the big acceleration. Maggie Backstead right on the wheel of George Hincapi. These are the big stars, the big pre-race favorites, and they are all together in the front. A couple of guys missing out, and uh, including Vesemon and including Tor Hushov are now in a desperate struggle to get back on terms with our leading group from the peloton chasing the breakaway. Five riders here, Paul, and there's another crash at the back here now because this rider also gone down to Groot. Tilly de Groot, another little shunt on the dikes. And somebody else just ahead of him there too, and I think the other rider there has gone down with him is Gilles Canouet. This is because of the pressure. This is the first time that they've really hit a section of cobblestones hard, and everybody has been on the rivet of their saddles trying to stay in contact. Look at this, you've got two riders here from Fasa Bortolo trying to make the junction. This is obviously going to be Fabian Cantillara, and I think Pozzato has just got popped off the back of that group. He was the man who made the big pressure on the front to try and split the field, but then all of a sudden he was <gasps> looking for air. That was a big effort to get Bonin out. It was almost as if Bonin said, look, this is the section of cobbles we're going on, and we need to drive, because we saw how he came over the grass on the edge to get himself in position. Now he's got himself on the front here, Meagleton on his back wheel. Hincapi has read it right this time so far. He's read it right, he's been very attentive, he's been looking to see when the move would come. Former teammate of his on the front here, Tom Bonin, what confidence this young man has got. He's actually isolating himself, but you can see the main field now starting to recover a fraction moving forward. I think that's Leon van Bonn over to the left-hand side, Davito Monlotto. He can ride a free ride now because most of his top men have been pulled out of the race. Tom Steeles and, of course, the abandon of Peter van Pietigem. Very Fletcher very and Cancellata from the Fossa Bortolo teams trying to struggle back to the leaders, making a big team effort there. The two of them relaying each other. I think Pipo Pozzato, who used to be on their team last year, who's now on Quick Step, who opened up this acceleration, is on their wheel. And look at that chasing Peloton in a big, long line. Pretty desperate situation right now for T-Mobile. They'll have to put in a big chase. You have four of our big pre-race favorites right in the front together, including Maggie Backstead, the last year's winner of this race, and big George Hincapi. There's Lars Michelson making good tempo with Tom Bonin on the front. George has ridden a Perfect Perry Roubaix so far. Well, this is a superb piece of performance by Hincapi and by Bagstedt as well because he got over the place he didn't like, which was the climb, and he's put himself into a good position. They're all looking at Tom Bone and the man to beat. They've marked him well, they've not let him slide away. As riders on the corner waving wheels for Discovery Channel, but they're not needed, thankfully, as the race continues. The gap is opening a little bit now over the main field. And when you get these big riders getting clear, who's going to chase? Well, that's what they're going to try and figure out who has missed out. The one team that has to organize the chase immediately has got to be T-Mobile. They were omnipresent in the early part of the race on the front of this group, and right now they're very noticeable by their absence. Here's Andrea Taffey, he's on the cobblestone, so he's obviously lost again a fraction of time because he's off at the back end of the race, Arrière de la Peloton. Yep. Andrea came back well, but it looks as though when the hammer's gone down, he's lost a little bit of ground there. He might get back, but at the moment, Boone and Hincapi, Backstead, Van Bon, Mikkelsen are out there driving at the front. They are big names in this sort of a race, and with all on different teams, there aren't a lot of teams left to chase. And again, Paul, despite showing so well, T-Mobile have missed out. I don't know why they've missed out, because they were right at the front when they needed to be. They were doing a good job, but I think they caught out by the acceleration. So we're looking at Andrea Taffy now trying to get back into this race, or at least the peloton, because the attackers come from Tom Bone and George Hincapi, Magnus Bagstead, Van Bonn and Mars Mikkelsen are the men setting up the chase now after the five leaders. 
That's a nice tight shot on the uh, concentration there of Andrea Taffy, former winner, last Italian in fact to win this race, as we rejoin the Premier Chase Group here now. 74 kilometres to go, and the action now suddenly has opened up. And the question is, who will chase these riders down? It has to fall to T-Mobile, Stefan Wesselman and Eric Zabel. These are the leaders on the next section of cobblestones. There are four stars for this section from Warline Briant, 2.4 kilometres in length, and it's section number 13A to go to the finish. This is section again, two sections very close together. And uh, you can now start to see that little film of humidity coming onto the surface. It's going to make it very precarious, especially for riders who are starting to get tired. This has still been a great attack by this breakaway, I have to say. They're still there uh, riding very, very well indeed. Will they have the legs, though, to hook up with the express train when it gets across here? Because it will come across in the next 20 minutes or so, I suspect. Uh, there's the leaders as they bounce the way. Five of them left of the original eight. Weather's starting to change now. You can see the weather starting to appear onto the lens of the camera. And you can also see the slimy surface starting to appear on these cobblestones. Paris-Roubaix, I think, in the last couple of moments, has just really turned into its nickname, the Hell of the North. It's going to get very unpleasant, Bob. And when they get down to the finishing line at Roubaix, they're going to find the velodrome is now very, very wet. And the banked velodrome will not be for the nervous in the, any sprint finish that may ensue. I think it's possible that the Quickstep team got the report from out on the course that the rain had started to fall on the cobbles. Tom Boone and having people put Sato, his teammate, go to the front and make a huge tempo. You have got to be in the front because inevitably on these cobbles, once they start to get wet, they are absolutely slick as anything you can imagine. It's like marbles on top of linoleum. If you put one pedal stroke wrong, you can go down so quickly. Tom Bone and taking no chances. George Kincappy saw it unfolding, got right on the wheel, and that's a great move, and they have put T-Mobile into serious difficulty behind. An important thing in a situation like this and a race like this is also to make sure that you've got the tyre pressures right. If you think it's going to be dry, you might put your tyre pressures just up a fraction so you've got a very hard wheel. But what's happened now, if you don't have the right tyre pressure, the hard tyre pressure will actually force the back end of the bike to slip and slide around, and that's something you certainly don't want. Well, the pressure should be about eight bars if they've got it just right today. These are the chasers. It's getting a little bit bigger down there now. Three, six, and nine of them. And here they are. Cancellara, fourth last year, has joined Fletcher, who got second in the week in almost one. Gemp Wavelgum is there as well. Van Bon, always a solid, reliable man from Holland. Lars Mikkelsen, a former winner of Gent Wavelgum. Tom Bonin, winner only seven days ago of the Tour de Flanders. Pazato, who has been threatening to do something all week is it in the break and Sebastian Lang I can't believe he'll stay here for long no but you get a chance to see the heads of state of a race like Paris Roubaix there's Tom Bonin and certainly I think Bob could be very right this was a clever move by team Quickstep. they knew that the weather conditions were about to change they knew the surface the road was about to change put the hammer down because when we come into this section of cobblestones we won't have to battle quite so much now they're on to the next section of cobbles. This is a long section, 13A to go to the finish. This is the section of Wallin to Briand. A long section, dangerous section. And as you can see there, it's uh, a very long way in this four-star section. Now, this is where they've got to be very careful now. The, cut the, the surface of the roads now are treacherous. And these boys are still well out of trouble here. One of the erstwhile breakaway partners, Sebastian Lang, is now back in the group. 3.13 is the gap, and 3.43 on the next group. 72 kilometres still to ride. We're looking down on the leaders now. They've got a lead of just over three minutes on the field as we go back to the peloton, who is in all sorts of bother again. It's caused by the rain now. These are glacial. It looks like uh, Zabel is going through. He was caught out in the big split caused by Tom Bonin. And the ride is now being left to shout for wheels. Salvatore Comesso, former Italian national champion, stopped in the middle of the road there. This is why I think Quickstep went out and laid the hammer down. They knew there was going to be chaos because of the fact that the weather conditions have changed dramatically out on the course. 
That's the second group. That is the group there with Georgie Hincapie in it. And I think uh, this is going to be rather interesting to see over the next few kilometres because there's another section of cobblestones coming up very rapidly. Seven riders now trying to get on turns with those five leaders. But this is a decisive group now. It contains Cancellara, who finished fourth last year, Lars Mikkelsen, Leon van Bon, uh, Pizzato is also in this group. And George Hincapi should be in the group, but I haven't caught sight of him. I'm just wondering, he's still there. He's still there, just ahead of Magnus Baxter at the rear, so he's still there. Looks very comfortable for the moment. This is an ideal situation for George Hincapi, but it's also an ideal situation for Tom Boonen. Obviously, the reason they went out there was because they knew it was going to get pretty precarious over the next two sections of cobblestones, the section of Wallin to Briand, and, of course, the section of Tilois to saint et rosiers the five leaders now are starting to get themselves organised, but they know the race is unfolding behind them. The race is starting to get that little bit more difficult. We mustn't forget that these guys have actually been leading the race for around about uh, 150 kilometres. Yes, and I, I think the riding is superb. They're not showing any real signs of uh, being tired by the distance so far. It's five chased by seven just now. There's number one, the man that won it last year, Magnus Baxter, and he's rising to the occasion. He said his form, if anything, is better than one year ago. He really fancies his chances to win again. He's reading it just right. It's on rather nasty stretch of cobblestones, this, and they're slipping and sliding on it. Remember that Hincapi is just ahead of Baxter in this group. Very surprised to see T-Mobile missing out on this group, and they are a long way down. Juan Antonio Fletcher, Fabian Cancellara saw it going up the road. They made the juncture across, working together. Pipo Pozzato, who did the damage, was able to get in there. Very tough chase now being put in. Leon von Bahn did a great ride. His team leader, Peter von Pedehem, went down earlier in the race, was knocked out of Paris Roubaix, so he's representing the Team Wild. There was Vesemon just coming in. Tor Hushov also having a very hard time and uh, it's an incredible breakaway and George Hincapi is right in there he hasn't contributed too much to the success of this breakaway so far and that's a great position to be in he's sitting on the back there's two quick step riders there's two Fossa Bortolo riders it will be their responsibility to do most of the work in the breakaway and George in the perfect position along with Magnus Bechtel but a very treacherous out on the roads of Peru Bay right now we're now on the zone 13B at Tilwa here where the cobbles get bad again as we head towards Orshi this is the group now who are trying to get on terms with the leaders. There are five riders up front. These are the leaders here. The five survivors of the all-day breakaway of originally of eight men. We still have here Beredo, uh, Coyo, uh, also Brad, Burgess and Tice. They are the leaders, but the cavalry are coming. And in this group is George Hincapie, the big favourite Tom Bonin, last year's winner Magnus Baxted. All the big guns are beginning to fire. The big losers at the moment are T mobile both of their men not in the hunt it's amazing to think that the big names uh, like Tom Bone and George Hincapie and the rest have actually attacked at such a long distance to go to the finish this is going to be an incredible showdown these guys all know that they're the big pre-race favorites last year's winner look at that Magnus Baxter riding up there talking to everybody probably a word of advice come on guys we've got a very good situation here let's not start to hold back we'll all work together let's all share the pacemaking and see if we can put a big gap between ourselves and the rest of the peloton that's what they should do now because the big boys of the week are here now. Juan Antonio Fletcher, second in Ghent Wevergum, should have won it, many will say. Tom Bonham, winner of the Tour of Flanders. George Hincapie, seventh in Flanders, missed out in Ghent Wevergum but on good form. Lars Miegelsen, a former winner of Ghent Wevergum, is here. And the winner of the event a year ago, Baxted also here. Cancellara, fourth in this event last year, here. These are the riders now who could shake this race out, but what Paul Sherwin said is true. They've gone an awful long way out. It's quite a long way out. There'll be a desperate chase from behind. And these are our big race favorites. Spaniards not usually as comfortable on the stone roads of northern Europe as that man at the front, Juan Antonio Fletcher, having a great pair Roubaix, bridged up to the breakaway, being led at the moment by Tom Boonen, and that was an incredible ride. So Fossa Bortolo with Cancellata and Fletcher very well represented. George Hincapie, now this is the best he's ever ridden pair Roubaix. He hasn't made a single mistake. He had a little bit of bad luck. His team was 
brought him to the front, and he was right there at the right time when the breakaway went. Now it's up to T-Mobile and the other teams that have missed out to do a huge chase. I think there might be some regrouping because, like you said, Paul, it's such a long ways to the finish line to go, but they nobody is wasting any time. They're all contributing to the pace making at the front of the breakaway. Big Maggie Backstead there on the liquid gas team doing his share at the front, and when he starts motoring across the flat roads in the wind, it is a fearsome sight indeed. Currently, tactically, two teams have got a very strong position. You've got Quick Step there with two riders in this group, and of course, Fasa Bortolo also looking very strong. But actually, just looking down the group there, it looks as if uh, Posato might have disappeared from the group. You've got on the front there Leon van Bon, followed by George Hincapie, followed by Tom Boone and Backstead, the two Fasa riders as well. So, uh, this is looking like uh, going to be a real battle of attrition here on the run down towards the finish. And a lot of these riders now, with still around about 70 kilometers to the go, very isolated. I don't remember, Phil, seeing a Paris Roubaix like this with a big group going so far out. It's changed its whole character, it, it, taking out the forest of Arnberg and bringing in those stretches around Valenciennes. The riser approached it far differently. And you're right about Pizzato. I think he fell back with Seb Lang and that left just the others up here. Uh, but the right men are in the group as far as the big teams are concerned. And as I say, T-Mobile annoyed at missing out. They're going to have to drive this group at the front now and see what they can do. Is that Volkler in Four. trouble? It looks like it might be. He's just trying to stay at the back end of the group, try and stay in contact. He's doing a brave ride because he's definitely not, Bob, I would say, a man built for the cobblestones, but he's riding on guts and courage. He most certainly loves this race. He feels an obligation to it. And uh, the big star of last year's Tour de France, Thomas Volkler, giving it a shot. We saw him in a lot of difficulty in Milan San Remo. It's his first chance to do some of these big, long, very difficult classics. He's given it his best shot, but he's a long ways off the pace right now. Well, cameras are also reacting to the cobblestones, I'm afraid. That's the reason for the picture breakup. but we're keeping on these pictures. And we are seeing some tremendous hard riding done by these great riders now. That was the rear of Kevin Holtzman there, who's seen his teammate Tom Bonin uh, get into the front chase group. It's not the lead group yet, but it's going to be a tough one. It'll be a big tough one because these guys will not give up. Once they get off this section here, the section of Tilwa, they've got a long, smooth bit of road for around about 10 kilometres before they get into the town of Orshi, and then a real nasty section known as the section of the Road of Prayers, and there'll be a few riders praying that it's dried out by the time they get there because uh, these cobblestones now are turning out to be very treacherous indeed. One of them most certainly praying right now is the man on the front of the chase, Stefan Vestman, without any teammates teammates should still be with you with 70 k's to go if you want to have a chance at winning Pay Roubaix unless you're in if you're not in the front Vesemon being uh, obliged to chase but just this one man from Rabobank so very tough position now for T-Mobile they haven't won a race so far this year and the chances continue to diminish here in Pay Roubaix tough luck for T-Mobile here's back to the chasers that are just behind probably the leader and Tom Boone and right on the front Magnus Backstead on his wheel Vesemon I would say around about 30-35 five seconds behind this group and chasing flat out with just one other guy. Tour Hushov is in there, but they're having a tough time closing this gap and this group working very well together. Well, this is a chase group now of 18 riders trying to sort themselves out, but of course a lot of them have teammates up front. Lotto have got Leon Van Bon, they're not going to give it too much uh, uh, pressure, they're just trying to keep the pace uh, going okay. Uh, but the breakaway's got no Rebobank rider in it, but it looks like we've only got one here. It's probably Stefan de Jong from Rebobank, uh, the survivor. I think uh, Zabel has not recovered from that crash. He was cut off by it. And I don't know whether he's even got into this group of 18 men. We'll have a look. There's surveys Canavan going through. Pizzato is back here, is he? I'm just looking down to the left. I don't see Zabel in this group. I think Zabel may well have had a pretty hard time trying to get himself back into contact. Looks like... Uh Discovery Channel have got one or two riders in this group as well. The uh, quick step riders keeping themselves uh, in contention at the moment, but I think they're quite happy to ride a defensive role, as you can see here. They're moving to the back end of the group. There's the French national champ. There's Henk Vogels for David He's, had a, He's had a great week, actually, for a man who uh, a couple of years ago had a very nasty crash in a race in the United States where he actually fractured one of the vertebrae in his neck. And many people thought not only would he not walk again, but certainly never thought he would ride a bike. Now, let's have a look what's going on here. We're back up with the leader here, Barredo, getting instructions from the team. Just uh, looking as though he's on his little two-way radio. 
It's into the second feed now. This is uh, usually the doomsday feed for many of the riders at the back of the race at Berry La Forêt. Uh, this is where, if you're out of the hunt, you just say, well, that's enough for today, head for the showers. Uh, but not this group that we've got. Remember the situation at the moment is we've got five leaders, a couple of minutes back to these uh, seven big chasers. Uh, the clock counting here at the moment. And then further back, we're looking at the main field of 18 riders, and then everybody else seems to be out of it at the moment. The situation, though, is the riders now going through the field and enjoying uh, what is going to be, I think, shortly, big company at the front. Well, they're on the flatter section now. They're around about four kilometres to the next section at Orshi, which is an unbelievable difficult section. It's uh, split into two parts. The first part is called the Road of Prayers, and the second part, if you're uh, a little bit worried, is known as the Road of the Abattoir. Ah. I think they're going to make mince meat out of that. <laughs> Touche. Over to you, Bob. <laughs> very, very <laughs> tough. I can remember distinctly having suffered through many, many kilometers of cobbles at this point and going over one of the hardest sections just after the second feed. And uh, at that point in the bike race, you can barely hang on to the handlebars. And it's to do everything you can do when it's slick like it's going to be just to stay on the bicycle, let alone race it at the high speeds. The breakaway's been in the front for a long time, but just behind them now will be an incredible chase being put in by uh, the group of chasers, including George Hincapie. The gap is a minute and 37, 38, minute 40, and still continuing to go. And uh, when the, 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 leader, the second group on the road gets to the feed zone, we'll see what time the time gap is. Yeah, it'll be somewhere down by, uh, it'll be just over two minutes, I think, now, because they are closing in quite quickly on this breakaway. Lars Mikkelsen off to the right of our picture, Cancellara, Fletcher, George Hincapie tucking into the tuck bag there for the last time, just loading up for what he knows is going to be a big finale for him here. He's again in the decisive move of a Paris-Roubaix. He's twice finished fourth, twice been sixth. This is his race to lose, I think, today, George Hincapie. This is the man who won it last year, living up two to his form. He's promised us all week he's shown good form he says his form is better than ever and here he is right in the move Magnus Bagstead looking on the good defense of his championship right now this is a great group that's formed here as a, a counter-attack to try and get across that leading group of five riders Fasa Bortolo there are in a very strong position with two of their pre-race favorites and two of the men who are riding very well this season Cancellara and Fletcher are riding exceptionally to be in a group like this they will be able to play tactical games down towards the end of the race while the other guys now are all isolated Boonen is alone Hincapie is alone Magnus Baxter alone and Lars Mikkelsen but it really is still an awful long way to go and an awful lot more very precarious cobblestones to try and negotiate well, 131 is the gap now, and that uh, it seems a bit tight to me, but that means they're running down those leaders pretty quickly right now. And I just wonder how much speed is left in that front group and whether they can hang on. They're pulling away from this chasing group of some 18 riders. There they are. There's only a couple of teams willing to work now. The rest are passengers. A lot of passengers starting to appear, but you know these guys have got to do something special. This is Wim de Vogt in the group. They've got Nico Martin in this group as well, and uh, not to forget Hank Vogels, who's moved to the front. Vogels is having a great ride. Let's not forget a couple of years ago, Hank Vogels was second in the Gent Wevelgem race, and you can also see the gap is not really all that much. It's uh, around about 35 seconds between that group of very, very big names and the rest of the main field, or what remains of the main field. I suppose I have to say. Yes, yeah, nice to see Matty Heyman riding well there for Rabobank at the front of this group of 18. There's Tor Hushoft, one of only two riders taking part in the top 10 in the Pro Tour series just now and set to lose that position. I think if Boonham were to win today, he would actually become the Pro Tour leader at least for today. Goodness knows what happens next week uh, because uh, the Pro Tour races will be on all around the world again. They will. This is the leading group of five, and I think they're about to get caught, Phil, once we get into the section of cobblestones known as the section of uh, prayers. They don't seem to have the, the energy in their pedalling style as the riders who are coming up behind them have, and I think having led the race for such a long time, they're about to get uh, reinforcements from the rear quite rapidly. They've got to have been in the lead now for around about 160 kilometres. That is an awful long way in a Paris-Roubaix. And so they've got to be tired now. Koyo is the guy just slipping off from Kofidis. He looks pretty tired just now. And the other riders casually coming through. 
The big question though is when those uh, six riders come up, can they hold on? Here they come and they are driving now. This is Tom Bonham being marked uh, by Magnus Baxter, who in turn is followed through there is George Incapi, then Lars Mikkelsen, and the two riders behind from Fasa Bortolo, Fletcher and Cancellara. This is a talented move. This is a strong move. These are all strong boys in the sport of professional cycling in this group. And it was not easy the way they rode off the front because they certainly just turned up the gas and blew the race apart. I mean, that's, uh, that Baxter there just pushing Hincapi onto the wheel of Fletcher who's going to move forward and do his pacemaking at the front and if we look back through the history of this race I don't think a Spanish rider has ever crossed the line in first place at Roubaix well, what a start not. he we've would be if he came here to win two second places in years gone by by Spanish riders but we've never had a Spanish winner of this race at the last place by any Spanish rider Paul was Hugo Poble in 1958 when he got second I tell you what, the Spanish have got a great classics rider now, a man by the name of Juan Antonio Fletcher. We first saw him come to the fore in the Tour de France when he got himself a stage victory just in the outskirts of Toulouse and he crossed the line making the signs of a bow. This is the Chemin de Prière, the cobblestones just outside of Orsi. This is the leading group of five. They must now know that not too far behind some of the biggest names in the sport are gunning them down. But look at this section here. Yeah. Look at the dampness to the left-hand side of the road. This is where we had the rain earlier indeed. It's cleared away again. Well, the heavy rain forecast at least hasn't arrived in this part of France, which is something of a relief to the riders. But this is a very, very nasty section, even though they only give it three stars, which always amazes me. We're very close here uh, to the main Paris-Brussels auto route. Uh, just off to the shoulder of the riders 58 kilometers to go about an hour and 20 minutes maybe a little more racing left and these boys have been out front virtually from the flag today and they're going to feel very tired right now and Bob you can see can't you now that the, the impetus is going out these guys are actually bouncing over the cobblestones the secret about the cobblestones is to ride them hard and fast and with a big gear because then you glide not like these men no they're not they are crawling across the cobbles at the moment but you can't blame them after being out in the front of the bike race for so many kilometers they've done a great job they've got a lot of publicity for their team but their uh, moment is just about up the gap at one minute and five seconds the chase has now gone up a little little bit to just about 45 seconds 57.5 kilometers to the finish about 32 miles left to go and look at the exhaustion on the face of the riders in the breakaway right now it's been an exceptional ride by them and uh, broad and also his teammate uh, Burgess have really done well for the new team agro turbo there he is on the front at the moment that's broad he's a very good time trial rider and just behind him, I think the rider behind him, Arno Cuyo, he really is desperately tired right now. Here comes on the same sector of cobblestones now, Lars Mikkelsen leading the charge. They'll just drive across this very nasty stretch of cobbles and try and bridge that one minute gap. You don't want to have a mechanical incident now if you're in this chase group of the big heads of state because if you do, it's going to be very difficult to reintegrate. Even though, as you can see, the uh, road is fairly dry, if you have a mechanical at this point, it really will be difficult to come back, although the team cars, I did notice, have moved up behind them. Well, it's a crosswind, and the team cars might prove the downfall of this group because, in fact, the chase behind has pulled back some seven or eight seconds in the last couple of kilometres, and if th they get on the tail of those cars then they'll be up with these and this hard-working breakaway will be ruined and they'll have to make other plans but at the moment they're still clear just look at the faces on the crowd the delight on the crowd's faces they see the riders in Paris-Roubaix twist the way through Orchy this is a town which is developed on the side of the motorway as the riders now Leon Van Bom fell back from that breakaway and this might be him here caught betwixt the chase and the next group now if the timing the next group on Leon Van Bon, then it would take on a different appearance. Well, they're not too far behind him. He's really hammered out. You see the way he slipped oh, there? He almost Good correction. Went. Excellent correction Was. there because that section of cobblestones is very greasy just on the surface, but he is flying over this section. The leading group now has gone on to the next section, which is known as the, the road of the abattoir, and I think these guys are on the same section. They're very, very close, and Tom Bonin looking solid. What a lovely stylist this man is. 24 years of age, Johan Brunil certainly didn't want him to leave what was the US postal team a couple of years ago, but Boonen wanted to go over to Johan Museu. It was a Belgian setup and he refused to stay and he broke his contract, in fact, to go across uh, to the team is with now Quick Step. Now, Leon Van Bonn. Yeah, so Leon Van Bonn, if they're timing the second group on this man, then it takes on a very different appearance this race because, in fact, it might be further back uh, to the group of 18. 
Well, just looking up the road there, you can see the little bit of confusion in front of him. That is probably the team cars behind that group that he's trying to make contact with. But I thought I could just see the front end of the peloton not too far behind him, but Van Bon is riding a very good race here, and he's just getting off the cobblestone section known as the Abattoir Road, and uh, he may well make the junction with the front, but he will do an incredible ride if he does, because Tom Bonham would... Oh, now, this is why... More yeah. crashes. This is why you have to be very careful. They've stopped the cars there. And uh, this is a, a second or third group on the road. That's the left-hand turn at the end of the uh, road of prayers. And that's the left-hand turn into the Abattoir Street. That was Matthew Heyman with a problem, but he's got it going again at the head of that group. Uh, 55.5, 42 seconds now before they bridge. And then 59 uh, to the third, second group on the road. And we're not sure whether it's Leon Van Bon or, in fact, the chasing bunch of riders of 18. We're going to know all of the answers very soon anyway. There's neutral service now trying to move out of the way. They're trying to empty that gap a little bit while they can because these are the leaders and it means that the breakaway is coming up to them very quickly. So the referee is just leaving one car in now to keep control of things. These riders will know now that they are about to get company, but what company? Just about the best bike riders in the race are coming up. It's a big blow to the morale that when they start to pull the cars out because all of a sudden you know the gap is no longer one minute. The gap is probably less than 30 seconds and you know that the big boys and the big guns are about to turn up to the party. Especially when you turn around and you can see Tom Boone and Magnus Baxter, Lars Michelson and big George Hincapi chasing you down. It's a sinking feeling you get but they've done a great job so far in this race. Fletch is still in there with his teammate Conchalata. Fossa Bortolo looking very good. Quick step. It's a little bit of a precarious situation for George, Maggie, as well as Tom Boonen. If they did have a mechanical right now, the team cars haven't been allowed to come through. It would be a long time before they could get a wheel change. They have no teammates there, so Fossa Bortolo sitting pretty right now with two very strong guys, Conchalata and Fletcher. But Backstead, Hincapi, and Boone and looming large in Paris-Roubaix this year. This is the probably the chase group behind George Hincapi's group containing Stefan Wesselman. They've missed out, and that's quite a big little gap there. These are a couple of riders in between, I think. And uh, Paris-Roubaix is full on right now. This is the race we've been waiting for. That looks like perhaps Wesselman and P Pozzato yeah. caught in between in no man's land, desperately trying to get across the gap. That's Servius Canavan there yeah. on, the on the wheel of Stefan Wesselman. Uh, Hultzman's, excuse me, and he's realizing now that if he does not get across to the gap to our leaders, George Hincapi's group, excuse me, he is not going to make it. So now Vesemann having to put in the maximum effort all by himself. He's got to do it now because coming up are two very nasty sections of cobblestones. The cobblestone section at Bercy, which is a long section, but the one that I think a lot of riders are fearing this year, the section at mont saint which is a very long, difficult section of cobblestones, which they've pulled back in in this last uh, 12 months or so, which many of the riders believe could be the turning point. Stefan Weissermann has to make the contact with that group before the cobblestone section, otherwise he's going to be chasing them all the way down to Roubaix. Well, these boys will get company soon. In fact, there were 16 riders in the peloton, so those two riders getting away on the last sector of cobblestones and now trying to bridge their own. And that would put the curtains on the race for everybody left behind. If a T-Mobile rider did contact the front runners, then there really are no teams left to chase down the breakaway and it would all work out in their favour. But uh, Vesseman, the only man left uh, of T-Mobile of note back there, knows he's got to bridge the gap. 53.5 kilometres, 25 seconds. That's all it is now and Vesseman go back about a minute and then you'll find him here under escort from Holtzmans Holtzmans is not going to help him because he wouldn't take Vesseman up to his man Tom Bonin because this man is a serious contender best placed German since 1896 a couple of years ago when he finished second He's a great bike rider, he loves the cobblestones and now he knows he won't get any help here from Kevin Hulsmans. In fact, he won't even ask him to help because he understands the tactics of the race. Hulsmans in the blue jersey there knows that he has to defend the position of Tom Boonen who's in the group up the road. And also they may well join Leon Van Bon who's caught in no man's land. And it's a, a very important moment, Bob, here for Stefan Weissermann because he could see Paris-Roubaix disappearing away from him when he's in good form. 
It's a very tough situation, and I'm very surprised that he missed out on the breakaway. He was well placed across the section a few a few a uh, few sectors ago, and the uh, the acceleration coming from the quick step team Vesemann missed out on it, but George Hincapi, Magnus Backstead, and Juan Antonio Fletcher and Fabian Cancellara saw that happening, bridged across, and uh, it's Vesemann that's missed out. He will get no help from Hulsmans, whose teammate Tom Boonen is in the second group on the road, and it's going to be a very tough chase. He'll have to have some great form to close this gap. And there we see Leon Von Bahn, who got dropped from the leading group with Pipo Pozzato, not having a great day. He was in there. He saw the move, but didn't have the legs to cover it. And I think momentarily we'll see Stefan Wesselman and Hulsman making a big effort now to get back into the front. Very, very good move. 20 seconds, 30 seconds to these boys. There's a chance they could do it. If they pick up Van Bonn, I know Leon Van Bonn pretty well, Paul. He'll know they're coming. He's no, he's waiting for a company here before he, and he might work, work his way back up with them. He's a clever bike rider, Leon Van Bonn. He's been around for a couple of years. He's been the Dutch national champion and he will have looked over his shoulder and seen what's going on here. He'll probably sit up and wait. And let's not forget that most of the team managers are also watching this race live. They've got a television in the car and they will be able to radio information up to their riders so Van Bonn has probably got that news now and he will sit up and wait for Stefan Weisemann to try and make contact and then I think they've got a very good chance of catching up with the, the group of the heads of state so Kevin Holtzman's here who is not a big rider as far as wins go he's only ever won three races in his life and his career started uh, back in the year 2000 but he is a tremendous workhorse for Tom Bonin it's just annoying Stefan Wesselman now. Wesselman is a winner, and Van Bonn has seen them coming. He will have to work with Wesselman. I think he's got the legs. I don't know why he got dropped by the breakaway. We didn't see, uh, but he's going to try and get back up to that breakaway now, and he's got some strong men coming. Well, he won't get any help from Hulsman, no. but he will get a lot of help from number 31, Stefan Weisemann, who is in great form. A little bit upset, I think, last week to have that uh, rather strange sickness uh, just before the Tour of Flanders and actually pulling out after 100 kilometres of that race because before the start of the race, he looked uh, very comfortable, very confident last weekend, but he seems to have recovered completely as we look now at the leading group of five. They are now onto the cobblestone section of Berse. That's 11 sections of cobblestones to go to the finish, and these guys if they could look over their shoulders now I would feel would be almost certainly able to see the return of the big men they're coming <laughs> mustn't look over the shoulders because here they are these are the names in the world of classic bike racing at the moment and we are having now a joining of the leaders for the first time this day looking down on the cobblestones now as the champions of past Paris-Roubaix are coming up now to catch the heroes of this year's Paris-Roubaix. The five men who have survived the breakaway all day about to be caught by six chasers. We will have 11 leaders while Stefan Wesselman, Kevin Holtzman, Leon Van Bon are also likely to bridge the gap. And then I think everybody else is out of this year's race. I tell you what, we'll have 11 leaders but I'm not sure how long we'll have 11 leaders because almost as soon soon as they make the junction they go into the cobblestones of the Mont saint pével and I think one or two of these riders from the leading group of five Bob are going to be put under a spot of pressure that would be very tough uh, very tall order to stay in the in the lead group once they get caught and uh, I would be very surprised if any of the guys from the race long breakaway will be able to do that over the next couple of section of cobbles but you never know one rider might be incredibly strong that we don't know about in the front group and uh, could perhaps make uh, make uh, the the uh, stay in there and uh, Barredo it looks like is being dropped there yep. across this very tough section and right there Cancellata on the front George Hincapi on his wheel on his shoulder Magnus Backstead and uh, Lars Michelson just tacked onto the back of the what will be the second group on the road but only for a few more moments well, what an amazing race this is going to be now. George Hincapi has put himself in a position here from which he could become the first American to win Paddy Roubaix. Magnus Bagstead was the first Swede to win it last year, could go back to back, and that would be another first, of course, for Sweden. Here's the coming together now of the six champions uh, catching up with the men who have tried to run away with this race. Five of them ridden brilliantly today. We're now going to have 11 leaders, and I think it might swell to possibly four. Well, I tell you what, they're about uh, four or five kilometres away from the section known as Mont Saint-Pevel, and that's a three-kilometre section. It really is an unbelievably bad section of cobblestones, and they're about to make the junction. The five leaders are just there because it looks as if Peredo actually managed to just get back onto that leading group of four. 
Looking up there, we can't be too far away from Lille Lesquin, the airport in the north of France here, not too far away from the border with Belgium, but most of the men we're looking at are the planes and the flying machines of the Paris-Roubaix here this afternoon. This is the man who was in the Herido. early morning breakaway, Herredo, he's uh, lost and on his own now, a lonely ride to the finish for him, but what a great story he'll be able to tell the folks back at home in Spain. You're looking at a rider of real quality, he's only a youngster, and he's going to be a superb bike rider in the next couple of years. He's not afraid of attacking. He did it in the Grand Prix Pino Chirami on Thursday, and he finished third after a breakaway of over 180 kilometres, and he's gone again today in Paris-Roubaix. He's going to be a good star for the future. Well, this is a problem here at the back, and I wonder if this is a psychological problem. He may well be uh, trying to adjust something there to make sure that he doesn't do too many turns. It's an adjustment to the brakes, and this is a pretty precarious thing to do here. The brakes were obviously uh, getting stuck, and in fact, Bob, just looking at those brakes there, it looks to me as if he's got cyclocross brakes on. The old-fashioned cantilever cyclocross yep. brakes being used in Perry roubaix as a prevention of mud getting stuck, and it looks like ha excuse me, Fletch is having a little bit of trouble with that, or perhaps he's just using that as a ploy to catch his breath for a moment. And, oh, uh, they wouldn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't do that. <laughs> then again, I didn't have very good tactics as a bike racer. <laughs> I don't know, you were pretty good on the streets of Cardiff when you got yourself second place <laughs> on the stage of the Tour of Britain. Oh, with no chain either. <laughs> no chain, no chain. Not even pedalling and still managed to finish second. Well done. I think he'll be moving to the back here. He's going to have to be very careful. I still have a funny feeling that wouldn't it be ironic if George Hincapie made his move on the section of cobbles where he crashed out when he was on the wheel of Tom Boonen a couple of years ago when Boonen ended up getting himself third place on the day. Tom Boonen in his debut at this great bike race, and it's incredible. Usually you need years and years of experience to be able to stay in the front, know when the cobble sections are coming, know how to ride the cobbles, and then have the day of your life. And that's where Boonen finds himself that year that Boonen got third, George didn't have the great form, and I think that George is on a very special day today. Here's the chasers, Cancelada von Baum, Vesterman, Pulsmans, and Cleo from the early breakaway, and uh, good ride being done by Brard and Taze to still be in there, but Vesterman, it's up to him to try to close the gap, and it's starting to go up now, the gap, and Vesterman has lost the plot a little bit on today's Perry roubaix He'll have to come back again. He's been one of the stalwarts of this race for the last seven or eight seasons, but this is not being his day today, and he had a very hard time in the race he won a year ago, just one week ago, in the Tour of Flanders. They pulled it back a little bit, four to five seconds. That's nothing really at 35 kilometers to go. 22 miles or so to the finish now. The sun is out, the sky is blue. All we've got to do is get the big man over the line first in George Hincapi or even Magnus Baxter because he lives in Wales now with his, uh, with his Welsh wife and the trains in the Welsh mountains. And so uh, we might even claim him as being British if he wins again. Well, Maggie Backstead will really be doing something very special if he can win that back-to-back Paris-Roubaix. Uh, he must have been a little worried when he crashed on Wednesday in Gent Wevel game in rather a silly crash with Filippo Posato at round about five kilometres to go to the end of that race. But he seems to have bounced back. He seems to be motivated. And uh, rather, <coughs> rather sad to see the numbers starting to come off there. This is Bonin looking for some action, looking for everybody else in this group to come forward and work. Hincapie, to me, Bob, looks very comfortable. He doesn't look under any pressure at all, looking across at the other riders, trying to read the expressions on their faces. Uh, Magnus looked as though he was actually talking there. Maybe he's talking on his two-way radio to the team car behind. Uh, they have these little radio systems in their ears, so they can actually talk to the sports director if he's in radio contact, of course. That's another question. 34 and a half kilometers left to ride now, 56 seconds in the holding. The peloton at two minutes, three quarters. Uh, they're not going to get back now. These boys have got the race in the bag. One of them should win, but they can't ever say that in Paris Roubaix. Not with the cobbles, which are still left to come. Vesemann, Van Bon, Cancellara seem to be the only riders really forcing the pace in this chase. The others are tired, or in the case of Holtzmans, they've got a teammate up front and won't help. But just looking at the pedaling style there, they don't have the energy in their pedaling action at the moment I think they're starting to become demoralized by the fact that they're not really closing down the gap at one stage they were within 30 seconds of that leading group of riders but now it's stretching out it's locked in at around about the one minute mark Stefan Vesemann looking over his shoulder here he's not going to get a lot of help from Cancellara because basically Cancellara had popped and you don't ride yourself back into form in a race like Paris-Roubaix once you've been through that amount of hell 
unless he knows that Fletcher I think he's getting tired up front I'm not too sure he's going to get the result that the Fasa Bortolo team will want. They are the team leaders in the Pro Tour competition as well, which counts on the first three riders are finished. Obviously, they've got an advantage getting two of them here. They've also got two quick step, of course, with Holtzmans. And, of course, they lead the Pro Tour as well with Alessandro Pataki, which is why they're very luckily here in Paris Bay riding with car number one in the convoy, which I think on a number of occasions has been a real bonus. This is the small town of Tompleuve, which means we're coming up to another couple of sections That'll be the section uh, 7A and 7B, which is the section of Epinet and the section of Moulin de Verta. So this is the group now, still being led by Tom Bonin. If he wins, he will be the new leader in the Pro Tour. As five riders hang on to a 56 seconds advantage as they run into the last 20 miles of the race today. George Hincapie still very much in with a chance of winning Paris-Roubaix. You know, Hincapie could win Paris-Roubaix because I'm just thinking about his approach to the event here. You know, he had a, a rather bad bronchial infection leading up to the start of these classics, and that may well have brought him into Paris-Roubaix just that little bit more rested than he has been in the past. Not uh, making the front split in ghent wavel game forced him to abandon the race. Maybe that also took a little bit of pressure off the stress that his body's gone through over the last couple of days, and he could be right now in the best condition of his life. After all, he won himself kern brussels Kern at the start of what we could say is the classic assault of the Belgian races. This a mere 500 metres, three stars for the Pave here at Tompleuve. The names of the French towns now resembling more the Flemish names because we're very close to the Belgian borders and these towns pass in and out of different ownership over history. With the French at the moment, that's a very slippery right-hand bend, but they're off the cobbles and onto the smoother road. Next destination now, we're heading up to Bourgel, and that'll be 1.4 kilometres uh, round past the Moulin de Bertin there, which we saw working. And this next sector, Paul, might be a bit harder. Sizouin is a nasty section of cobbles. I remember a couple of years ago when Johan Museo decided he was going to try out a double suspension bike. Uh, by his sponsor and he actually got to within 10 meters of Andre Schmiel on what was a very dirty wet and muddy Paris-Roubaix and he popped just at the point and Andre Schmiel went on to get the win and uh, I think if you can remember Bob but Yuan Museo on that day he threw that bike into the gutter at one stage not very happy with the suspension <laughs> also the pedals I think were malfunctioning a little bit for uh, Museo that day and he couldn't clip in or out after he got a flat tire and uh, very tough um, a lot of equipment being used differently in Paris-Roubaix than the rest of the season. Some suspension on the bikes, much fatter tires, a little bit longer wheelbase and wider chain stays to, accom uh, to accommodate the larger tire. And the longer wheelbase gives the riders a little bit smoother ride on the bicycle for these very tough cobble sections. These are still some of the riders from the early breakaway in the second group on the road being led by Stefan Vesemann, Leon von Bonn. And Fabian Cancellata, interestingly enough, has had to do a little bit of work in this chase group because I don't think they're too confident in Juan Antonio's Fletcher ability to win this race. So Fossa Bortolo looked to be sitting pretty just a few kilometers ago, and now an absolute disaster for them because Cancellata was dropped while his own teammate made the tempo at the front. Yeah, Looking down the second group here, and they're losing ground now, and I think they've gone out to over a minute. Most of the work being done by Vesterman, but I think the spirit has been broken of this chase group now. It seems to have been broken. They're riding through and off, but they're not riding through and off with big energy to try and eat into the advantage that those five men have. The five men at the front of the race now have to try and get it into their minds how are they going to win this race. The man who looks the most confident is Tom Boone, and he's already had the big classic win that he wanted the Tour of Flanders and he's been very confident in his whole approach to the race here it was he and his team that blew this race apart on the cobbled stone section about 50 kilometers ago but since then he's never missed a turn he's never looked under pressure at all I have to say Bob looking at these for five men I would still give four of them a very good chance of winning, and especially number 71 here, George Hincapie. George is just sitting perfectly where he needs to be. He looks to be in no trouble whatsoever. He's able to rotate through. He's been riding perfectly on the cobbles, very smooth, just the right position in each section. His teammates helped him so very well early in the bike race, and now he has made the right move. 
recognizing the acceleration from quick step. Tom Bonin also riding very strong, but look at George Hincapie having the best Perry Roubaix of his whole career. He's been very close on a number of occasions. This is his best chance yet to take out the great classic, the queen of the classics, the most beautiful and epic one day race of the year, Perry Roubaix. Well, Tom Bonin here, he's looking extremely confident. But this could go either way now because there's a, such a mixture of riders here. They all have great reputations built over years of hard work, not just in Paris Bay but in professional racing around the world. We know that Hincapie has a love affair with this race. It is his day and it has been on many occasions his to lose and so far he's always lost it. But he's had two thirds, he's had uh, two fourths rather and he's had two six places and he's finished others in the top ten. Today he has the real chance now uh, to be a podium finisher and that would be a great result for the United States. I don't think he wants a podium finish here. I think he wants to win this bike race but to do it he's going to have to do something very special. I have a, a gut feeling that the best place to move if you want to to win this race is on the cobblestones after this section here at Cizouan, the section that goes over Bourguel, and that's the section where he crashed a few years ago while riding in the slipstream of the man who was his rival today, the man just at the back there in the blue and grey jersey of Quickstep, Tom Bonin. No American has ever podiumed in Paris-Roubaix. It'd be nice to start at the top, wouldn't it, George, as he starts to lead them through here. Fletcher, I'm a little bit worried about. I think he's feeling the pace most of all of these five leaders. Bagstead, I'm not so sure whether he's not the strongest of this group and he's keeping it a big secret. Well, he is a strong bike rider and he will be motivated. You know, if you've won a race in the past, you have that added motivation because you know, been there, done it, and I'm sure I can do it again. And he really looks in good form. He looked great last week in the Tour of Flanders. He was very good in Ghent Wevelgem, although a little bit unlucky in the last four or five kilometers. But he will have the confidence of knowing he knows how to win a sprint on this little ring here in the outskirts of Roubaix because at the end of the day, it's a very difficult sprint finish. And I wonder if George has the track knowledge to come down and leave it to a sprint at the end. Well, the only good news is the sun has now come out over the stadium at Roubaix. There's a massive crowd here waiting for the arrival of the leaders and the tarmac on the velodrome is now dry. So they'll be pleased about that. But from this bunch coming onto the track, surely Bagstead advantage if it comes to a track sprint here. I couldn't really fancy Fletcher. I wouldn't mind Tom Bonham because he does a lot of riding on the Ghent track during the winter months as training and a lot of those Belgian riders when the weather gets too bad in Belgium they go to the Ghent track which is only 165 meters around but it's important to know exactly how to handle yourself coming out of the last bend and I'm sure that's going through their minds they must realize that to win the best way to win is the way Tom Bonham won Tour of Flanders last week because then there is no risk when you come onto the stadium alone you don't have to worry about placing yourself in the right position or onto the right wheel for the final sprint of the day. Sprinting on the track, very different from sprinting out on the open road. You have to use the uh, the banking on the track to accelerate into the straightaways. Magnus Backset has done a lot of track racing, very good at that. George Hincap, he's done a fair amount himself, Tom Bonin, of course, and uh, it's anybody's ball game, especially at the end of nearly 300 kilometers of very tough racing. And, uh, and there's going to be attacks to come out of this group. You can bet your bottom dollar on that. None of these riders want to go to the finish line with anybody else. There's too much respect for uh, each, each one another. And uh, George Hincapie looks to be in the best position there of his career to finally win. I think the race that he likes the most, and he's probably the best at Perry Roubaix. You've got to figure out now how these riders know each other as well, what alliances might be formed. There's got to be a friendship between George Hincapie and Maggie Baxter because they're, I suppose, we could count them as part of the Anglophones of the peloton. And, of course, there mustn't be too much animosity between Tom Bonin and George Hincapie because they raced together on the same team, US Postal, for quite a number of years. The odd man out, I suppose, must be Lars Mikkelsen uh, because he's... Uh, on the CSC team, a team which uh, seems to have built a little bit of animosity with the rest of the peloton over the last couple of seasons. Now, the odd man out has got to be Fletcher. He's the only one that doesn't speak English. Uh, well, he speaks good Italian and Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> well, the back group is losing now. They've dropped to over one and a half minutes back. Uh, they finished for the day. They haven't even got rid of the riders in the early morning breakaway, which is a good indication they can't lift it anymore. The Van Bon not looking at all clever. Holtzman's very happy with the way it's going. His man is up front. That's all his job is now, is to sit here. Cancelon and Vestman seem to be the only two workhorses just now. And they are going backwards. 
They're probably still pulling away from the main field, mind you, but they're going to fight out now uh, for the sixth place finish, I'm pretty sure of that. The Cobblestones may yet have another word or two to say because they usually do at this stage of the race. We're heading up now to the next one, which will take us into Siswang and then on to a very nasty section just to relieve the town. Yeah, that's a section where life last year, I think it was Leif Hoster, got a, a wheel, a, a, a flag, a Flandrian flag, actually caught in his wheel, and I've, I've absolutely no idea how he didn't deck it, but he kept it upright and managed to keep it up going. And have the, uh, the Flemish flags are kept under control here this afternoon because not one of these riders deserves now to have a mechanical problem or an incident out on the course as they head through the town of Suzuan and onto this section of cobbles. On to the next section of cobbles now. This is Pave number six, four stars uh, at Siswang Bourgel, 1400 metres. And they haven't done anything to attack one another yet, but they're running out of opportunities. Tom Bonan is riding superbly. Magnus Bagstead, a little bit suspect Fletcher. George Hincapie looks absolutely great. And we're all worried about uh, Lars Mikkelsen because he could be the big joker in this pack. 25 kilometres to go. I'm amazed at how confident Tom Bonin is there riding on the front. He has not asked anybody on any of these sections of cobblestones to come forward. He feels like a man possessed. He feels like a man who can walk away with this race any time he wants to. Bob, this is a young man of just 24 years of age, but over this last week, he's no longer a boy. He's a man. When you break away in the finale of a World Cup Classic like he did one week ago, then you are a full-grown man in the peloton. Tom Bonin saying to me yesterday before the state for before today's race, no one wants to go to the finish with a sprinter such as himself. And he's won big field sprints in the Tour de France. So no knee sprinter. So he knew he had to win on his own. No one would cooperate with him. So far, this group has worked very well together. So Tom Bonin will feel comfortable that if it does come down to a sprint, he's perhaps the fastest man in this breakaway. In three years of racing, he's won 26 races already in his fourth season. This year, he can add on another six victories. He's a remarkable man, uh, but is he riding too confidently? He's clearly advertising now just how good he is. He's opening a gap. He's making them grab his wheel. This is important, but look at Bagstead. That was Fletcher. Fletcher was the one who was letting the gap go there. Tom Boonen swinging off as they get off the first part of the section of cobblestones here at Sizuan. But uh, you know what? That was an indication that Fletcher is the weakest man in this leading group. This is a section where we had the little incident with Leif Hoster last year, another section of cobblestones before they move out onto the smooth road once again. And George Hincapie, for me, was in the wrong place there. He should have been just that little bit closer to the front and Baxter's wheel. I think he's got to watch out riding close to Fletcher right now because he could get blocked if Boonen does decide to go. I just got a feeling that the first man to attack might be Lars Mikkelsen here. He's a wily old bike rider from Denmark. He's won Gent Wavergum. He is a guy we've known a long time. This is the second group now. Time slipping away for them. And I don't think they're going to catch up. Those are the cobblestones uh, that make the stories of the hell of the north and have made this race earn its nickname as the Queen of the Classics. Hincapie must have been listening to a little <laughs> bit of advice there because he's gone to the front and decided he is going to take, take control of the pacemaking. Getting down to the last part of Paris-Roubaix now, it is probably more important to dictate the pace that you feel comfortable with on the cobblestones. They're off this section now of Cizouan. They've got a little bit of uh, respite before they go down towards uh, Bourguel. And then after that, the very difficult section, the section which George Hincapie, I'm sure, will be thinking about as we go down now to five sections to go, the section of Canfin en Pevel. And it's on that section that two years ago, George Hincapie hit the deck. Well, let's hope that isn't the case today, but we're all getting quite nervous here now because time running out for the riders. You can see the threatening rain ahead, and you can also see the sun reflected on the road surface here. This is very typically April spring showers. Boon and number one. Yes, we saw that sign on the very first stretch of cobblestone, so that gentleman's made the switch very quickly, and he's still in a chance of being number one today. This is the second group. Familiar tale now. Vesterman warning of the turn, grabbing the bottle. And Van Bon and uh, uh, Cancelar are the only three workers in this group. I take my hat off, though, to the boys at the back there. Those three riders at the back were in the breakaway, and they're still in the second group on the road. Is this the face of the winner? We're going to know pretty soon. Well, 
He doesn't look too tired, but you can never tell these guys are aces at poker as well. They're all trying to hide their feelings right now. They're all trying to hide any telltale signs of fatigue, like Bonin and Hincapi will know each other pretty well, having ridden on the same team for a number of years as US Postal Service. Sometimes it's a, a little flick of the knee that indicates uh, that's where the fatigue starts to come in. Some riders, the way they hold their head will be an indication that they're starting to, to go through a bad patch. And I wonder if that's what Hincapi is thinking now, wondering, looking at these other riders, have I got the strength to ride alone to the finish? Takes a brave man to make that decision right now, I think. Here he is, George Hincapi flying the new colours of his team, Discovery. And just, I wonder, just what he is thinking right now. He knows how he feels, he knows what's left in the tank. He'll be trying to equate what's in the other riders' tanks as they approach the last sections of this race. They're heading now to Canfan, then they've got the dreaded Carrefour de Labre, and then three more smaller sections as they run into the finish in Roubaix, where the stadium now is absolutely packed with people awaiting the arrival of Paris-Roubaix. 103rd edition. These guys will try to assess each other's strengths, but to us looking in, we've got four strong guys and a slightly weaker man in Fletcher, but he's working. Fletcher's working, he's gone to the front, he's doing his turn, making all the pacemaking in this group. They are all working very well, and still at this stage of the game, you can't put the name of a likely winner at the top because they're all looking good. Nobody's shown any telltale signs, apart from the slight weakness there on that last section to Juan Antonio Fletcher. That's Erwin Tice at the back of the second group. Uh, Coyo is also there. And then we get to the front and find the same man doing all of the work. He got within 30 seconds of that leading group and then faded away. Rambon was with them and whatever happened, he got left behind and he's in this group now. Got caught in no man's land. That's Van Bon there, a minute and 44 seconds. It's going it's, away. It's finished for these men. All they can think about now is sixth place. And they'll just have to keep turning around. And the main field has completely disappeared off the radar. We're about 25 minutes now from the finish. Scheduled finish here in France is 5.30. And uh, they're going to be pretty much on schedule. Might be just a little bit ahead of that as they race up towards the finish. The boys at the front are going to have to think, what are they going to do? They won't want a five-up sprint on the track. That could put it to anybody's uh, chance. So they're going to have to try and attack one another before they get to the finish. These riders are fighting out sixth place, and I think they will now. And the, the early morning breakaway could find themselves still making a top ten finish. Could find themselves making a top ten finish, but they certainly now... If you want to win this race from that leading group of five, the strongest man is going to have to play his cards soon. And is he the strongest man? Tom Bonin. 26 wins in the first three years of being a professional. He's won 32 races. Fletcher has shown us that Spanish riders can ride uh, classic races. He won the championship in Zurich a couple of years ago. That's a one-day race. Uh, but he's shown us he loves racing in Belgium. No Spanish rider has won Paris-Roubaix. He can go back 50 years to the last Spanish man who got on the podium in second place. So looking here now at George Hincapi as he brings them through. Time for a little bit more food. Keep those energy levels high now because George Hincapi is moving into the area of his best shot at a podium finish in Paris-Roubaix. There's five riders here. Only three will be acclaimed at the finishing line. And which three will they be? I have to say, Paul, I have no idea which three it will be. And that's what's great about this race here this afternoon because not one of these riders has shown any telltale signs. They all look strong, they all look comfortable. They are all looking very relaxed when they ride over the cobblestones. I'd like to see George Hincapi win because he's been so close on so many occasions, twice finishing fourth as they go there inside of 20 kilometres to go. The face of Fletcher off to the right now. Then comes George Hincapi. A little bit of a puff and a blow, but he looks good. He's licking his lips in anticipation. This is now Tom Bonin. I wonder if George took a good look at his face. This young man of 24 looks as though he's relishing every pedal rev here. Last year's winner, Magnus Bagstead, still looks extremely good. He'd be a most difficult rider to beat if he's got a chance at winning this for the second time. He only got one win last year. It was Paris Roubaix. George Hincapi is such an experienced bike rider, you know, he turned professional back in 1994. It's hard to believe that he's still only 31 years of age. 
looking at the leaders now of Paris Roubaix. They're into the last 12 miles or 20 kilometers. Forget the chases now. A minute 52 to Vesselman's group. 310 to a huge peloton of riders that have reformed back there. But these riders attacked 70 kilometers from home and they have shaped the race. And George Hincapi, last as we make this turn, he better watch it now because this is a dangerous stretch. This is the Canfin en Pavel and it is a nasty stretch of cobbles. Four star, 1800 meters. Boonen again wants to be first on. Hincapi is in fifth place. That's not the place to be. He needs to move forward. He must cast his mind back to a couple of years ago where he ended up in the gutter at the side of the road here. Boonen, look at that face. He just does not worry about anybody else in this group. This is a long, hard section of cobblestones. It looks as if all of Flanders has moved across here this afternoon as well as we look down at these cobblestones, these sacred cobblestones of the north of France, which today are really setting up what is going to be a magnificent showdown. And you're right, Phil, I still cannot pick a winner from this group. Tom Bonin, who's riding a special bicycle with a frame three centimetres longer than normal. That's just over an inch all because he didn't want to get blocked by the mud. Well, that hasn't been the mud we expected today, but it has been a treacherous Paris Bay in many places. Some of the big names have gone out with crashes, like Van Pietigam, Tom Steeles, Alan Davis of Australia. This little group, though, they are matching each other, pedal rev for pedal rev. Mikkelsen coming to the front for Team CSC. They haven't been a dominant team in the Classics over the last couple of years, but they've had a very good start to this season with Bobby Julik stamping his authority all over Paris-Nice and, of course, the Criterium International as well. But, Bob, I'm just a little bit worried about the fact that Hincap is sitting right at the back of the group. You want to be able to watch the cobbles as they come up to you. In order to do that, it's best to be where Tom Boonen is to have a look at him. Maggie Backnex is able to look over the shoulder of Tom Boonen. Make sure you don't disappear into any holes and you can pick out the best way to get across these cobbles this is a very tough section George Hincapi sitting there in fifth place Fletcher now starting to come through look at Maggie backside very comfortable rides these cobbles so well he is a great star of this event having won last year he loves this bike race as does every single rider in this breakaway Americans having a great spring so far with Bobby Julik already the winner of a couple of stage races Maggie backside now making a big attack that is a good move by the big Swede on the liquid gas team Fletcher trying to close the gap now doesn't seem to have too much trouble closing to the gap back said now throwing down the gauntlet throwing down the gauntlet this is the moment when everybody has to show their cards Hincapi just lying off the back but look at that there Tom Bonin is perfectly placed onto the wheel of Fletcher Fletcher may have well have been hiding his game there Hincapi response comes right round the wheel there of Lars Mikkelsen he's looking comfortable he's responding but Bobby shouldn't be sitting there in fourth or fifth place it's too far back well, that was the point we were making, Bob. He shouldn't have been last man. Now he's got to close because, surprisingly, it was Mikkelsen. Michelson being not quite as strong as the others. George has made the juncture. Mikkelsen followed George back across to our leaders. Big attack by Backstead. Now let's see if the cooperation goes out of the breakaway yeah. and the attacks that are inevitable start to come. Still a long ways to the finish. This is going to be a real strong man's race. Well, the next segment of Cobblestones is the Carrefour de Labre. And that's where Johan Museo has advised Tom Bonin to attack. We'll see. But George Hincapi surely now should be looking for the wheel of Bonin and follow that man in case he does attack. He's got to be very attentive now. Uh, when he gets towards these section of cobblestones, I would have thought the best place is to ride in third, fourth position because right now it's playing out. Looking down at the five leaders now, and they have just four sections of cobbles left. And George Hincapi is still there flying the flag for America, and everybody else is now out of the hunt. This is the second group, Paul, and they've got no chance now. They are a long way behind. They're almost two minutes in arrears of that leading group of five riders. And when that leading group of five formed, I never really believed that they would stamp their authority on this race so far from the finish. That's Leon van Bon, followed by Stefan Weissermann, who must be absolutely kicking himself because he had the form to be in the group, but he was in the wrong place at the wrong time. That's right. That's, they also caught out Eric Zabel right at the back. There was a uh, crash in the peloton, but Weissermann just missed the move and you pay the price it is frustrating it's exasperating but when it happens you have to live to race another day there's van bond doing the pace making they're just doing enough to keep this group clear now and i would expect uh, stefan vesseman to clean up for the sixth place finish he's a good sprinter 
The right of the back here is, Ada is uh, Arno Cuyo from the Cofferdish team. Had a brilliant race today. One of the original eight men, and he's still in with a race for the uh, sixth place on the road. So he's had a wonderful day in Paris Roubaix. He'll be super motivated because his team, Cofferdish, is from not too far away from here in Roubaix as well. And that's probably why he's finding something just a little bit special to stay in contact. Fletcher now goes to the front, turns up the gas. Hincapi obviously heard the advice coming from us here because he's moved up into second place and this is the pavé de l'arbre the famous pavé de l'arbre five stars five stars pavé number four we count down to number one remember which is a mere 300 meters long outside the stadium here in roubaix Hincapi taking second wheel here to Fletcher. Watch out for Bonin. I just don't know whether he's got it or not right now because he's look at that gap he's opening as Fletcher, the man we thought didn't have it, Bob, now seems to be turning the screw. Well, he definitely put the hammer down a few sections ago. He has a free run to look at the, the where he wants to ride. George following him so well there. Fletcher looking quite strong. Backstead having a little bit of trouble having put in the first attack just a little bit ago to stay on the wheel of Tom Boonin. This is a great group of riders all of them very deserving it's kind of too bad that only one man can win this biker psychologically a big blow there I would say for Maggie Baxter because you know he thought he was going to ride away with this race when he attacked on the previous section of cobblestones and now he's taking up position number five Hincapi is actually moving into a very nice position here because very shortly this road will turn to the left and it will kick up and it looks as if Baxter is really suffering there even Bonin over to the left Bonin's in uh, trouble there he's trying to find a little bit of a road this is a huge turn by Fletcher on the front here well this is how he got rid of his own team mate about an hour ago uh, when Cancellola was dispatched off the back now he's found his legs again Juan Antonio Fletcher showing us that Spanish riders can adapt to the tough northern Belgian northern France races here at this time of the year and Bagstead I think is in trouble he might just hang on it's a tough crosswind but the crowd protecting them well, you can see the Scottish flag up to the side there alongside the Belgian flag as we come very much closer to the Pavé de l'Arbre. This is a long section of cobblestones. It starts with the Pavé Beur. There's a bit of a gap there between Baxted and Boonen. And in fact, Mickelson has pulled off. Boom, and he goes out the back. Mickelson's in big trouble. I think the legs just exploded together at 15 kilometres to go. And Baxted needs to grit his teeth now because that gap is opening. Disturbed by the rhythm. I'm not sure whether Malaz has a problem. I don't think so. I think I think he's just cracked big time and now we're down to three and a half three and a half it really is amazing 41 Lars Mikkelsen has gone off the back and when you go on the cobblestones you go just like that as if somebody's turned off the lights we're moving forward here here is the shape of Magnus Baxter has he got another rider in front of him I think not we're Ouch. down to three men because Baxter is going to have to find something very special if he wants to win Paris-Roubaix for a second year in succession he won't give up without a fight he just wants to get off these cobblestones now which are long indeed nearly two kilometers watch out for Bonin who moves to the front this is the big push now they've got to take his wheel now has Fletcher got any legs left this could become one on one Hincapi Bonin now well don't discount Juan Antonio Fletcher because he is still very much there and present and in fact Hincapi now has found himself on the wheel of Tom Bonin that's a good response there but sandwich just in the middle uh -huh. the man from Spain Juan Antonio Fletcher he was very dominant but right now he seems to have ridden himself back into this event Phew, well, we're off the cobbles at last, and there'll be a big sigh of relief. It might see the return of the big man uh, coming back up now. We go sharp left very shortly, and we're back onto zone number three, and this will be Grusson. And this is looks as though this may be the part for Bonin to now really turn this screw and ride away. And it looks as though we might be blocking Boonen here. Our motorbike bit too close as he's gone again, and there's three riders left now. Bonin, George Hincapi, no Americans ever made the podium in Paris in the Paris Bay ever these are the three left it's showdown boys look at the face here on Tom Bonin 24 years of age he is confident he actually doesn't care right now because he reckons if he can get to the finish with this group he can still win it when it comes down to the front he would like to go away and win this race alone look at the confidence looks over his shoulder there at Juan Antonio Fletcher what he wants to do is see the face of Fletcher he wants to know what Fletcher
Fletcher's body is going through. Hinkepi doesn't look too bad at the back there, he's in third position, but what a way to do it, to leave it down to the sprint, the final sprint of the day. Look at Boonen, oh. oh, he's digging deep. This is a huge effort now, this is the last ounce of strength to see just how. Look in the distance, that is Bagstead, he's not done for yet. The big Swede could be back in this fight. This is total commitment now by the best bike riders at Paria Bay. It is how much strength do they have left for the finish. Bonin is testing them to the full. Look at the face of Hincapi. I think he's still cool. He looks good, he looks cool. He doesn't look as if he's under any stress at all. He's got his hands right on the top of the brake levers there, nice and comfortable. Boonen though, he wants this. He is trying to ride this in the manner of Johan Museo. And I wonder at 24 years of age if he can. Maybe at this point, Bob, he is throwing away his Paris Roubaix because he's doing a lot. Very confident. He did put in a huge effort just one week ago in Tour of Flanders, and it worked out well there. But Cancellata and Hincapi matching the acceleration by Boonen. We look down on the three leaders now. They're all in blue jerseys. Hincapi is still there. So too Tom Boonen, so too Juan Antonio. Fletcher and it looks as though Magnus Bagstead has lost his chance now to repeat in Paris-Roubaix. What an incredible race all of a sudden this has been. There is Magnus Bagstead sitting fourth place on the road just off the podium. He looks very very tired but he wants to hang on. It would be a great defence anyway to get fourth but he would have liked to have been top three. Looking down the road, what has happened now to Lars Miegelsen when he hit the wall, he hit it big time. And, and it went. looks as though Lars has gone out of sight completely there. When so Baxter stays in fourth. When he went, he went a long way. He will lose himself a couple of minutes before the end. Hincapi looking calm and collected, looking across here at Boonen. Boonen is giving everything. Boonen is putting a lot of energy into this race here. And I wonder if he's going to be able to just hold something back for the final sprint of the day. They've got two more sections of cobblestones to go. The final section of Hem, which is not that difficult in itself, except that you have to zigzag across it and that section is where Johan Museo had a flat tire last year and that section is where many men have lost it. We are looking at the three men now who are shaping for the podium in Paris Roubaix. No American has ever been in the first three. Hincapi is in that position right now. No Spanish rider has ever won. And that's where Fletcher features just at the moment. While Tom Boonen is looking to become the youngest winner for years and years. And he's riding like a champion. Well, it's going to be a very big showdown. Fletcher looks confident. He went through a bad patch. This was the man who dispatched his own teammate, Cancellara, off the group when he accelerated after the cobbles at Orshi. And now, every time there's been an acceleration, George Hincapi there in second place has been able to respond, able to come back to the wheel of the other riders in the group. I have to believe that Tom Bonin there on the front has put so much energy into this, he can't, he really can't have enough left for the sprint at the end. I think he's still got uh, youthful enthusiasm, that's the problem with Tom. He's got a brilliant mind, he's got a great mentality, uh, but he wants to, he just loves to race and he may be throwing away the vital energy here. I hope George is reading this right today and he could well be, but having counted out Fletcher, I'm going to eat my words because I think <laughs> this man now is going to cause all sorts of problems. Well, never a man from Spain has won Paris-Roubaix and what history that would be for that country. But now that has a man from the United States won Paris-Roubaix either. Hincapi looks good and I wonder if he has got in the back of his mind. Bob, do you remember George Hincapi as a young professional? What was his job? His job was a sprinter. He was a team sprinter. If he can do that today and produce that turn of speed at the end, he can write his name into the history books. And what a season it's been for American cycling. First time ever winning Paris-Nice. And if they can win Paris-Roubaix as well, well, it really would remark be remarkable. After 103 editions, the Queen keeps throwing up the surprises. Now it's Belgium, America and Spain head to head for the victory on this year's Paris-Roubaix. Once we get down to these lovely little villages on the outskirts of Roubaix, the riders know that they're not far to go now. They're running in towards the finish. They've just got uh, the little section of cobbles at Hem, which is 1.4 kilometres, a mere 300 metres down the main street in Roubaix. Then they're into the stadium. Then they'll hear the crowd. It's a massive crowd this year, and they're all watching this on television. And there's still no indication as to who will win. There is no indication. Two men in this group, though, will be having their mentors whispering words of advice into their ears right now. Johan Museo will be trying to encourage 
Tom Bonin to get himself the win, and I am sure that Lance Armstrong would like to see Hincapie finally get the win. We're looking at number 91, Boonen. Number 71 that is George Hincapie. Number 16 is Juan Antonio Fletcher. Harry Roubaix is approaching the finish, but we still don't know which one will take the trophy. Just looking down at these three riders now, nobody's missing a turn. They're too proud and they don't want to give any indication to the others that they are feeling weak. They are doing one by one, bit by bit, and passing no information to either. We have no idea who is feeling what right now. They dare not show any sign of weakness at the moment. In fact, if you feel like you need to breathe that little bit more, Bob, you're probably breathing out of your ears. <laughs> Every single pore of your body screaming out in pain right now in the finale of such a long, tough bike race. Fletcher seems to be grimacing in pain every time he comes to the front. But you know, these are very, very, not only strong, but also quite tactically gifted racers too. They like to put on the mean face to show the other riders in the break that they're a little bit fatigued, and don't have to work quite as much. George Hincapie, stoic as ever, looking fantastic. This is the best chance he's ever had to win Perry Roubaix. It certainly is, George, and he knows it, and there may not be another one. He's always had this wonderful affair with Paddy Roubaix. He's had two fourths and two sixths. He's going to get at least third now, and that's a first for America, but I think he would want to win. We're looking at Magnus Bagstead, the man who took home the big cobblestone trophy as winner last year. He should hang on to a fourth. He's just going to have to keep going now because I think the rest of the race has exploded. But look at that gap now. He has really lost contact with the front runners. He won't be seeing them today till they're in the famous showers of Roubaix Stadium. It's a big gap to Maggie Backstead. The winner is going to come from one of these three riders. They've probably been uh, keeping their fingers crossed for the last couple of kilometres too that they don't have any mechanical incidents. We know George Hincapi had a flat tyre in the early part of the race, but he still looks very calm and very collected. And I think he will go into this finish, Phil, with a fair amount of confidence because, after all, he won himself Kern Brussels Kern at the start of the year, which is one of the very tough Belgian semi-classics. So he's got the win under his belt. He hasn't got the, the pressure of trying to get the first win of the season but this is a big one for him he's chased this for many many years and because of the nature of the finish you come into the stadium with a few twists left and right and then onto the track then you do a lap and a half of the track things can go wrong on the track you only get one shot at winning the sprint you've got to read it absolutely perfectly and professional road racing cyclists don't ride on the track very much the one track rider who was here is now gone Magnus Bagstedt Boonham being a Belgian does ride on the track occasionally in Ghent, uh, but Big George has also ridden on the track. Fletcher, big question mark how he'll handle the track finish. He's a clever bike rider, let's not forget how he won himself a stage in the Tour de France a couple of years ago when he leapt out of the pack, surprising the small breakaway inside the run to the line. This is a very dangerous part of this section of cobblestones here at Hem because even though the cobblestones themselves are very well made and very well laid out and there's a bit of tarmac towards the side of the road, this road twists and turns and it's actually the cutting across the cobblestone section which provokes the problems, provokes punctures and could also provoke somebody to go down. We don't want that to happen now because every one of these three men here deserves his chance of a crack at the victory. We've never seen a man from Spain ride the cobblestones like this ever and the man that got the last podium finish for Spain was in second place was Hugo Poble back in 1958 when he got second and Fletcher has a real chance here at winning this race. He wanted to see the cobbles first, I think, to try and control the driving of Tom Bonin, but Bonin now has been forced into third place, and George Hincapie is the rider now following the wheel very closely. What we don't want to see now is any of these riders have a mechanical problem. We want to see three men attack each other all of the way to Roubaix, because any one of them deserves the victory. Well, it was on this section of cobblestones, too, that Henny Kuiper went in the lead, almost lost his victory there because his back tyre actually popped off just before the edge of this section and he was very lucky that the team manager was able to come up alongside him and give him a brand new bike. These riders are not too far now away from this section of the cobblestones here at Hem and once they leave that section there is only six kilometres left to go down to the finish line. Fletcher is doing a magnificent job on the front here and Hincapi is just sitting there. He looks so calm and collected, Phil. I really wonder if he's got it in those legs of his to win the sprint and beat Tom Bonin, who's beaten him a number of times this year. I felt that he wanted the first position on this stretch of cobblestone to control the pace. There's no finer way to do it than to get to the front and keep the riders behind you. 
Pink Capi now takes up. We're running into six kilometres to go off the end of that sector. We are now all together again at the front. Six kilometres from the finish, three riders still in the reckoning. Off goes the drink now from Fletcher. Lighten the load a little bit, little flick of the right arm from Bonin, saying, your turn to come by. Good look at George Hincapie's face. Quick drink, that'll probably go over the wall shortly. Hincapie looks good, he looks calm and collected. His face looks like the face of a man who is in complete control of the situation. He's not panic-stricken at all. He looks down to see if he can see the shadow of the wheel of Bonin below him, and he just swings across, letting Bonin come up to the front. Look at the way he keeps looking at the riders in this group. This is a big psychological moment here, maybe the last time to get a drink. We are now looking at probably five kilometres to go to the finish. There's one last place in this race where you can attack, and it's the slight incline in the town of Hem, but I wonder if they want to go to the finish together now. Fletcher, he really is dominating the front of this group. He's the man doing the majority of the pacemaking. I know, and I don't know what to think about that. I really don't know what to make of it now. Fletcher on the front from Spain, followed by George Hincapi of the USA, followed by the Belgian favourite Tom Bonin. Well, how much of a favourite is he now? We're into the town of Hem, which leaves us five kilometres to go. Five kilometres to go as we approach Hem now. Three riders still in front and three very lonely men now it's one-on-one -on -one. nobody talking everybody assessing just who is strong enough for the finish i don't think any can drop the other two i think they're all pretty much in the same physical states and i wonder what dirk de in the team car is thinking about george hincapie to the left but trying now to be the first american to win paris roubaix Behind him is Juan Antonio Fletcher trying to become the first Spanish rider to do it. Belgium have done it 30 times before, but Tom Bonin has never done it himself. Tom Bonin has never done it himself. He's finished third here in the past when he was riding in the service of George Hincapie. He was George Hincapie's domestique. He learned a lot from Hincapie, but wanted to change teams to learn for the mar from the master himself, Johan Museo. As we go through the streets of Hem now, three riders continue to forge a lonely furrow. They don't even look at each other anymore. Yes, they do. As George Incapi says, who's going to come and give us a help? Has come through now is Tom Bolan and Juan Antonio Fletcher. I really do not know which rider to say can win this anymore. Every one of these three could do it. Fletcher, I think, is the weakest of the sprinters, but he may well just try and leap away towards the end and try and surprise them. Now here's the left-hand turn there in the outskirts of the town of Hem. They're moving up now to what is going to be the slight incline at the top of this incline. It's three kilometres to go, and then it is downhill towards the stadium. Fletcher. It, sorry, Paul, in that stadium, as I look across from the competitive position, there is a massive crowd watching television, and it's a pity the riders can't see it here because they are just willing them on. This has been a great race amongst these boys. The big favourites taking the race under control as far out as 70 kilometres from the finish, and they've held off everybody. We're getting towards the outskirts of Roubaix now, and it'll be the run down towards the stadium. One little stretch of cobblestones to come, and I don't think any of these three riders had it in the legs to attack each other. It's going to be very difficult. They're all, I think, uh, rarely fluid and lucid at the moment they're waiting for somebody to make the move Hincapi taking up third place there I think Hincapi has got it in his legs to respond to any move here this afternoon look at that right straight to the wheel of Tom Boonin he's nervous he's concentrated he's waiting for something to happen I think he feels confident that he can take this race out in the sprint I think you're right um, Bonin must be beginning to worry a little bit now about the proximity of these two riders he wasn't happy in Ghent in the Tour de Flandres. That's why he broke away to win alone. He hasn't been able to do that this time. He's keeping a particular eye, I think, on George Hincapie. But Fletcher, you know, well, I don't know. Well, I don't know either. I tell you what, though, Hincapie looks good. Hincapie will not let anything move away from him here this afternoon. He's got that very good, supple style of his. He's accelerating. He's actually losing a slightly smaller gear than anybody else, and that's an indication that he's still fresh. He's still got the ability to turn out a good sprint. It's difficult to read the style of Tom Boonin in the first place there because Boonin rocks his body about. That's, I think, because he's a lot younger than the other riders and doesn't have that built-in strength that you get from having had five or six years of career under your belt well you know Fletcher was caught 250 metres from the finish of Gent Webergum and he finished there in second place to Nico Matan he was such a sporting loser he ran straight up and he hugged Matan and congratulated him and said you were the right man 
it makes you wonder now which one of these three will win so we're looking now at George Hincap as he drives the three-man breakaway over the last couple of kilometres of Paris-Roubaix and they're all anxious to prove they have still got something in the legs. This is now Juan Antonio Fletcher, now comes Tom Bonin. I don't know which one to pick. You can't pick any one of these men. It's going to go down to the sprint there, over the top of that false flat on the outskirts of the town of Hem, and not too far away from the town sign that indicates they are into Roubaix. They are around about two and a half kilometres from the finish and around about one and a half kilometres from the final section of cobblestones, albeit a section of cobblestones just 300 metres long and fairly ceremonial. Only Fletcher has not won a race this season and he came close on Wednesday in Gent Wavergum when he was second caught at 250 metres from the finish. There's the stadium, that's for once we are bound now. You might get a, gl a glance of the crowd there. They can't stand in the middle because it's a banking. They've got all built around the sides of this stadium. It's a very old stadium. It's now a protected building, in fact, so they can't make any amendment to it. And these are the three riders racing towards the end of another Paris-Roubaix on that stadium. 2.1 kilometres, 300 metres of hell of the north left. Then they'll swing onto the track with an enormous roar from the crowd. They'll go over the finishing line and then one more lap of the track. And that is going to be a very difficult sprint to judge from these three. It's going to be very difficult. I don't know about you, but I'm actually starting to get just a little bit nervous. The old goosebumps are coming up to the back of the net, wondering which one of these men is going to win one of the great classics of the year, the Paris-Roubaix, the queen of the classics, the most difficult of all the races. 259 kilometres, and it's all now down to the last one and a half. Hincapi taking up third position there. He wants to get the wheel of Tom Bone, and he needs to judge his sprint, I think, on that of Tom Bonin because Fletcher is not really one of the fastest sprinters but he may well take a little bit of uh, action, action from the rivalry between Hincapie and Bonin who used to be teammates. Well gosh what do I know but I just feel Fletcher will try to go here in the last kilometre on his own. I don't think he'll feel confident in the sprint. He does pack a good sprint finish you know but not against Bonin surely and Hincapie but we're going to find out now. We're heading down the long straight which brings us to the stadium. Very shortly the riders will flick over to their left as they go on the final 300 metres of cobblestones. They'll come off those cobblestones, then they'll swing into the stadium and then it's going to be every man for himself on the bank track of this 400 metres old cement bowl here in Roubaix. There's the flick, that's the last 300 metres of cobblestones and they're still together. They're still together, Fletcher in first place, Hincapi in third place, keeping a very close eye on the man in front of him. And looks as though George has moved up to wants to see the stadium first, perhaps. I wouldn't want to be first on the track. This could well slow right down now as the dogfight starts. Under the kilometre to go. That takes us into the stadium now. This is the swing off the... Oh, cobbles are all behind now. Now it's heading up towards the track. Wait till you hear the crowd cheer. Now comes the tactics that we know more of a track cyclist. Looking over to see where the rivals are. Oh, I thought for a moment Fletcher was going to go, but no. George doesn't want this position, Paul. He doesn't want to be first. I would say he really needs to be on the wheel of Tom Bonin because Bonin is the man who must lead out this sprint. They're about to make that sweep, and there they are just on the far side. They're making the sweep into the stadium. Three men together. George Hincapi of the United States, Tom Bonin of Belgium, and Juan Antonio Fletcher of Spain in third spot. Now, it's team. Ta it's a track tactics now. Hincapi's got to have the courage to ride right up against those balustrades there, force the attack through on the inside, right, he's got Fletcher through now, he takes the wheel, this is the bell, Bonin, advantage Bonin at the moment, as the crowd now almost stunned here into silence to watch how this enrolls, now Fletcher gets the bell on the front, top three riders. Hincapi there just checking his gears, he's looking down to make sure he's got the right gear in, Bonin is in the best move, Hincapi looking down to see who's going to move first, they're still hugging the barriers, they're on the far side, they're around about 400 metres to go, still nobody has move, Hincapi is going to have to lead this one out he's going to have Tom Boonen right on his wheel. Now the track goes flat here, then he's going to go up the bank, he 
banking and once they got that banking Boonen I think will dive for the inside now he's getting his speed up now he's gone for the inside and Hinkab is left in late he's going to have to see if he can get over the top of Tom Boonen I don't think he can can he come off the bed where is that final kick from Hinkab it's not going to happen and he becomes the fifth man to win the Tour of Flanders and Paris Roubaix in a matter of eight days Tom Boonen is an absolute powerhouse Hinkab has done a best ever for the United States with second and one Antonio Fletcher second again Wavelgum gets a third here in Roubaix that was an unbelievable move what track skill coming from Tom Bonin he was the man who leapt down through the inside there as we look down here at last year's win in Maggie Backstead he's going to hold on for fourth place he didn't get the double win that he wanted to but Hinkapi could do nothing to this man this is a great one day classic rider now he won himself the Tour of Flanders and now Phil he's got himself the great greatest queen of the classics, Paris-Roubaix. Well, he really has become the superstar of Belgium. The mentality, they say, he has of the great and legendary Eddie Merckx. At 24 years of age, in a matter of eight days, he's won the two biggest one-day classics of this time of the year. And a great defence by Magnus Baxter, absolutely superb. He rode like the winner of last year. He has finished in fourth place. Absolutely no disgrace in that. It was a great performance. George, you, really tired, so. you were so solid the whole day. You were right there. You knew exactly what you needed to do. You lost to perhaps the fastest man in the sport right now, Tom Boonen. But a great job in Perry Rubin. Yeah. Yeah, no, I had good legs all day. And, uh, you know, I really thought I could win the sprint because Perry Rubin is really not at the end of the day it's whoever's got something left and I did my best today and I'm you know happy to be on the podium but I really wish I could have won that was a great effort the team did a great job early on the breakaway went from a long ways out and you had a couple of uh, quick step riders to begin with a couple of fossa guys but a great job <laughs> well yeah no it was the team the team was good today it was a really windy hard day today and um, I knew that as soon as the as soon as the strong guys went that the field would blow up to pieces like it did and uh, you know I had great legs today it's just the finish I just didn't have it you, you let it out from the last section of cobbles it seemed like you got caught in the front of the breakaway just three guys how did the sprint unfold well we were just Fletcher let it out there at the end and um, Tom dove down the track and really I was just hanging on after that it wasn't uh it wasn't much of a sprint there at the end just, just did what I could Boone and one of the best sprinters in the game he got a little bit of a gap but he seemed to be closing it all the way to the line but at the end of the day Boone and just a bit stronger but second place George you have to be very pleased with that yeah I'm pleased with second uh, just gonna make me dream for the win more next year <laughs> all right good job and Thanks, good luck buddy. thank you Magnus, you wanted to come back and win this race for a second time, but you can't be too disappointed with your ride today. Oh, I'm definitely not disappointed. I mean, I've I've been there and thereabouts all day, and um, maybe I did a bit of a bit of a tactical error to try and go on the, the section before the uh, before the careful is out but I thought I was stronger than I was and you know if you never stick your neck out there and try you're never gonna win either and I knew like with Bone in here it was gonna be difficult to ride in here and try and beat him in the sprint and I thought well maybe maybe you know I've got to try something it was difficult with that group for a long time to actually pick a name of anybody who was going to win because you were all big strong men yeah it was uh, it, I mean as far as I was concerned it was the, the the, the four strongest, five strongest riders of the of the day, and um, I mean we rode a terrific race. It's a little bit difficult because you know four leaders of four different teams or five different teams sit, sitting in sitting in the front group alone. Who's going to do the work? Are we all going to do the work? Or are we not going to work? What's going to happen? Because no one had the advantage over the other. And but the scary thing was that that break formed a long, long way from the finish. Yeah, it was a very long way to go, and I was a bit surprised actually that it was it went that early. But um, yeah. You know, I, I did, it didn't bother me. I was there, and, and you know, I wanted to uh, to try and make a difference and do a good race. And 
to be honest with you, I'm really, really happy with the fourth place. I mean, I've shown that last year wasn't that, you know, it wasn't a comet that landed on the on the earth when I won the race, and I've shown that I can be here and, uh, you know, maybe win it this win it another time, you know. So, thank you. Um, Lars, that was a, a very strange move because that breakaway formed an awful long way from the finish today. Yes, uh, well, in a, in a way, uh, it was long from the finish, but again, uh, where we really made the difference and we, we got away is uh, normally the heavy stroke, I think number two after Ironback. And I remember for many years that this one is, is very long and it changed directions in the middle, so the wind is, 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 is nasty there, so you really have to pay attention. And then I could see that the quick step uh, have kind of, yeah, decided themselves that this should be the one that this should be the the one they wanted to make the uh, the big uh, split up and then and, and I move I just move forward I, I could feel it you look comfortable for a long time then all of a sudden it was as if somebody turned out the lights yeah I must say in the end uh, it was the worst uh, scenario for me happening it since uh, I Fletcher takes uh, the lead in Carrefour de Lava and he was definitely the, the strongest and the one with the, the, the most um, speed in the legs when we went on the pavés and uh, then suddenly I was uh, unconcentrated for, for just a split of a second and, and uh, I have to, uh, I, I moved from the center of the pavé to the, the right and I hit a spectator and then, uh, yeah, and I didn't have it, I must, I must be honest, uh, then I didn't have to, to make it up again. What can you say about Tom Bonin though, because uh, 24 years of age, he's ridden this last seven days like a real experienced pro. Yeah, he has a fantastic team and, and uh, it, it's a, a rider who is, uh, well, suited for these this this race in particular. Or now he won also <laughs> the 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 Tour of Flanders, and I mean he's it's a new champion of the, of the era, and I congratulate him because uh, he deserves it. But you and Team CSC did pretty well as well. Yeah, we we, we managed quite well, and uh, I'm sorry I couldn't make a better result, but yeah, that's life. Yeah. Oh, just look at that, that's Johan Museo, the mentor of Tom Bonin, congratulating him. He always said he was going to be a winner of this race, it's come very early in his career. And here is Tom Bonin now, saluting the crowd, just 24 years of age, a magical eight days, and he's won the Tour de Flanders and now Paris-Roubaix. It's always the heaviest trophy, if not the biggest, in the world of cycling. George Hincapi joins him, ex-teammates remember when George was finishing fourth, Bonham was finishing third, now he's still ahead of George Hincapi but they're first and second. And George Hincapi with his, his new addition to the family there with him as well. And that was a great result for George, he's always produced a result in Paris-Roubaix and second is the best ever finished by an American cyclist. Riders still continue to finish here. And now joining them on the podium, there he is on the right, Juan Antonio Fletcher. He's produced the best Spanish finish for the best part of 50 years with his third place. And he rode like a champion today. Three top riders at the end of the Queen of the Classics edition number 103. And this is the result. Tom Bonin getting the victory ahead of the USA's George Hincapie, Juan Antonio Fletcher. He improves from second in the Gemp Wevelgem Semi Classic to third in the Classic of the Year. Magnus Baxter, last year's winner, gets fourth, a great ride by him. Lars Miegelsen gets his best ever finish in fifth. Van Bon leading the chase home for sixth place. Florent Broad taking seventh. He was the man, of course, who was in the early morning breakaway, so that was a great performance by him. And still the riders are coming into the Paris-Roubaix Stadium here and they'll go on for a few more minutes yet. You know, when you get three riders come to the line like that, it's always sad only one of them can take home that large cobblestone. But it's gone to the youngest man in the breakaway, Tom Bonin. What a great week he's had. 
and thank heavens at last George Hincapi has got himself on the podium and proudly flew the American flag. I hope you enjoyed the commentary. I know we enjoy bringing it to you. And until the next time, goodbye.